Chapter 1 London, 1820 Damn! Damn! There it goes, the frigging thing! A stream of curses floated on the gust of wind, shocking the guests at the water party. The yacht was anchored in the middle of the Thames. The guests assembled in honour of King George. So far, the party had been dull but dignified, everyone dutifully complimenting His Majesty's magnificently fitted yacht. With its brocaded furniture, fine mahogany, chandeliers of clustered crystal droplets, gilt sphinxes and carved lions poised in every corner, the yacht was a floating pleasure palace. The guests had all been drinking heavily in order to attain the mild euphoria that would substitute for a real sense of enjoyment. Perhaps the gathering would have been more entertaining had the king's health not been so poor. The recent death of his father and a taxing ordeal with gout had taken their toll, leaving him uncharacteristically morose. Now the king sought the company of people who would provide laughter and amusement to relieve his sense of isolation. That was why, it was said, he had specifically requested the presence of Miss Lily Lawson at the water party. It was only a matter of time, a language young Viscount had been heard to remark, until Miss Lawson would stir things up. As usual, she did not disappoint. Someone get the deuced thing, Lily was heard to shout between lilting bursts of laughter. The waves are moving it away from the boat. Grateful for the reprieve from ennui, the gentlemen rushed in the direction of the commotion. The women protested in annoyance as their escorts disappeared to the bow of the ship, where Lily hung over the railing and stared at some object floating in the water. My favourite chapeau, Lily said in reply to the chorus of questions, indicating it with a sweep of her small hand. The wind blew it right off my head. She turned to her crowd of admirers all of whom were ready to provide consolation. But she didn't want sympathy. She wanted the hat back. Grinning with mischief, she looked from one face to another. Who will play the chivalrous gentleman and retrieve it for me? Lily had tossed the hat overboard on purpose. She could see that some of the gentlemen suspected as much, but that didn't stop the torrent of gallant offers. Allow me, one man cried while another made a show of doffing his own hat and coat. No, I insist that I be afforded the privilege. A rapid debate ensued, for each one of them wished to gain Lily's favour. But the water was rather turbulent today, and cold enough to cause a health-threatening chill. More importantly, it would be the ruination of an expensive, perfectly tailored coat. Lily watched the controversy she had caused, her mouth curving with amusement. Preferring argument to action, the men were all posturing and making gallant statements. If anyone were inclined to rescue her hat, he would have done so by now. What a sight, she said under her breath, staring at the bickering dandies. She would have respected a man who would step forward and tell her to go to hell, that no ridiculous pink hat was worth such a fuss but none of them would dare. If Derek Craven were here, he would have laughed at her, or made a crude gesture that would have sent her into a fit of giggles. He and she both had similar contempt for the indolent, over-perfumed, over-mannered members of the Tong. Sighing, Lily switched her attention to the river, dark grey and choppy underneath the heavy sky. The Thames in springtime was unbearably cold. She lifted her face to the breeze, her eyes slitting, as if she were a cat being stroked. Her hair was temporarily straightened by the wind, and then the shining black curls sprang to their usual buoyant disorder. Absently, Lily pulled off the jewelled ribbon that had been tied around her forehead. Her gaze followed the ridges of waves as they broke against the side of the yacht. Mama, she heard a little voice whisper. Lily shrank from the memory, but it wouldn't disappear. Suddenly, she imagined she felt downy baby arms encircle her neck, delicate hair brush against her face, a child's weight settle in her lap. The Italian sun was hot on the nape of her neck. 
the quack and bustle of a duck procession crossed the glassy surface of the pond. Look, darling, Lily murmured. Look at the ducks. They're coming to visit us. The little girl wriggled in excitement. A chubby hand lifted, and a miniature forefinger extended as the baby pointed to the parade of self-important ducks. Then she looked up at Lily with dark eyes and a grin that revealed two tiny teeth. Da! came the exclamation, and Lily laughed softly. Ducks, my darling, and very handsome ones too. Where did we put the bread to feed them? Dear me, I think I'm sitting on it. Another whisk of wind came, chasing away the pleasurable image. Moisture seeped beneath her lashes, and Lily felt a painful twisting in her chest. Oh, Nicole, she whispered. She tried to breathe away the tightness, willed it to disappear, but it refused to go. Panic built swiftly inside her. Sometimes she could numb it with liquor, or divert her mind with gambling, or gossip, or hunting. But the escape was only temporary. She wanted her child. My baby, where are you? I'll find you. Mama's coming. Don't cry, don't cry. The desperation was like a knife twisting deeper every moment. She had to do something at once, or she would go mad. She startled the men nearby with a high, reckless laugh and kicked off her heeled slippers. The pink plume of her hat was still visible in the water. My poor chapeau's nearly sunk, she cried, and threw her legs over the railing. So much for chivalry. I see I'll have to rescue it myself. Before anyone could stop her, she leapt off the yacht. The river closed over her, a wave smoothing over the place where she had been. Some of the women screamed. Anxiously, the men scanned the rippling water. My God! one of them exclaimed, but the rest were too astonished to speak. Even the king, informed of the goings-on by his grooms-in-waiting, waddled forth to take a look, pressing his massive bulk against the railing. Lady Cunningham, a large, handsome woman of fifty-four, who had become his latest mistress, joined him with an astonished exclamation. You know, I've said it before. That woman is mad. Heaven help us all. Lily stayed underwater a moment longer than was necessary. At first, the coldness was a shock, paralyzing her limbs, making her blood turn to ice. Her skirts turned heavy, pulling her down into the mysterious cold darkness. It wouldn't be difficult to let it happen, she thought numbly. Just drift downward. Let the darkness overtake her. But a pang of fear impelled her hands to make a finning motion, propelling her to the dim light above. On the way up, she grasped the lump of sodden velvet that brushed her wrist. She broke the surface of the water, blinking the stinging salt from her eyes, licking it from her lips. Needles of intense cold stabbed through her. Her teeth chattered violently, and she regarded the shocked assemblage on the yacht with a shivering grin. I've got it, she chirped, and held the hat aloft in triumph. A few minutes later, Lily was pulled from the river by several pairs of willing hands. She emerged with her wet gown clinging to every curve of her body, revealing a slim, delectable figure. A collective gasp went through the crowd on the yacht. Women watched her with a mixture of envy and dislike, for no other female in London was so admired by men. Other women who behaved just as disgracefully were regarded with pity and contempt, whereas Lily... She can do anything, no matter how abominable, and men adore her all the more for it, Lady Cunningham complained out loud. She attracts scandal just as honey draws flies. If she were any other woman, she would have been ruined a dozen times over. Even my darling George won't abide any criticism of her. How does she manage it? It's because she behaves like a man, Lady Wilton replied sourly. Gambling? hunting, swearing, and politicking. They're charmed by the novelty of a woman with such masculine ways. She doesn't look very masculine, Lady Cunningham grumbled, observing the dainty form sheathed in wet fabric. Assured of Lily's safety, the men crowded around her, 
erupted into laughter and applause at her daring. Pushing the sodden curls back from her eyes, Lily grinned and gave a dripping curtsy. Well, it was my favourite hat, she said, regarding the ruined clump of material in her hands. Good gad, one of the observers exclaimed in admiration. You're absolutely fearless, aren't you? Absolutely, she said, causing them to chuckle. Rivulets of water ran down her neck and shoulders. Lily wiped at them with her hands and turned away to shake her wet head vigorously. Would one of you, dear, dear gentlemen, fetch me a length of towel and perhaps a bracing drink before I catch my death of... Her voice trailed away as she caught sight of a still figure through the curtain of wet tendrils. There was movement around her as the men scattered to find towels, hot drinks, anything to serve her comfort. But the one standing several feet away did not move. Slowly, Lily straightened and pushed her hair back, returning his bold stare. He was a stranger. She didn't know why he stared at her that way. She was accustomed to men's admiring gazes. But his eyes were cold, emotionless, and his mouth was taut with contempt. Lily stood without moving, her slender body shivering. She had never seen immaculate, golden blondness combined with such satiric features. The breeze blew the locks of hair back from his forehead, revealing the intriguing point of a widow's peak. His hawk-like, aristocratic face was strikingly hard and stubborn. In his eyes, so brilliantly pale, there was a bleakness that Lily knew would haunt her for a long time afterward. Only someone who had experienced such bitter despair would be able to recognize it in another. Profoundly disturbed by the stranger's gaze, Lily turned her back to him and beamed at her approaching admirers, who were laden with towels, cloaks, and steaming hot drinks. She banished all thoughts of the unknown man from her mind. Who gave a damn about some stuffy aristocrat's opinion of her? Miss Lawson. Lord Bennington remarked with a concerned expression. I'm afraid you'll catch a chill. If you wish, I would be honoured to row you ashore. Discovering that her teeth were chattering against the rim of a glass, making it impossible for her to drink, Lily nodded gratefully. She reached her blue-tinged hand toward his arm and tugged in order to make him lower his head. Her icy lips came near his ear. Hurry, please, she whispered. I think I may have been a little t too impulsive, but don't t tell anyone I s said so. Alex, Lord Rayford, a man known for his self-discipline and remoteness, was battling an inexplicable anger. Ridiculous woman, risking her health, even her life, in order to make a spectacle of herself. She had to be a courtesan one known in a few select circles. No one with a shred of a reputation to preserve would behave like that. Alex unclenched his hands and rubbed his palms on his coat. His chest felt tight and banded. Her high-spirited laughter, her lively gaze, her dark hair. Dear God, she reminded him of Caroline. You've never met her before, have you? He heard a scratchily amused voice nearby. Sir Evelyn Dunshaw, a fine old gentleman who had known his father, was standing nearby. Men always have that look when they see her for the first time. She reminds me of the Marchioness of Salisbury in her day. Magnificent woman. Alex tore his gaze away from the flamboyant creature. I don't find her all that admirable he replied coldly. Dansha chuckled, revealing a carefully constructed set of ivory teeth. If I were a young man, I'd seduce her, he said reflectively. I would indeed. She's the last of her kind, you know. What kind is that? In my day, there were scores of them, Dansha mused with a wistful smile. It took skill and cleverness to tame them. Oh, they required no end of managing. Trouble. Such delightful trouble. Alex looked back at the woman. Such a delicate face she had. 
pale and perfect, with fiery dark eyes. Who was she? he asked, half in a dream. When there was no reply, he turned and realized that Dancha had wandered away. Lily climbed out of the carriage and made her way to the front door of her Grosvenor Square terrace. She had never been so uncomfortable in her life. Serves me right, she muttered to herself, walking up her front steps, while the butler, Burton, watched from the doorway. What an idiotic thing to do! The Thames, in which all of London's refuse was dumped, was not an advisable place to swim. Her leap into the water had left her clothes and her skin tainted with a distinctly unpleasant odour. Her feet squeaked inside her wet slippers. The odd noise, not to mention her appearance, caused Burton's brow to furrow like a millstone. That was unusual for Burton, who usually greeted her calamities without expression. For the past two years, Burton had been the dominant figure in the household, setting the tone for servants and guests alike. When welcoming visitors into her home, Burton's starched manner conveyed that Lily was a person of consequence. He overlooked her follies and adventures as if they didn't exist, treating her as an impeccable lady, although she rarely acted like one. Lily knew full well that she would not be respected by her own servants if it were not for Burton's imposing presence. He was a tall, bearded man with a solid girth, his neat, iron-grey beard framing a stern face. No other butler in England had his precise combination of haughtiness and deference. I trust you enjoyed the water party, miss, he inquired. A smasher, Lily said, trying to sound animated. She handed him a wad of soggy velvet, adorned by a straggling pink feather. He stared blankly at the object. My hat, she explained, and squeaked into the house, leaving a wet path in her wake. Miss Lawson, a guest is awaiting your arrival in the parlour. Lord Stamford. Zachary's here? Lily was delighted by the news. Zachary, Lord Stamford, a sensitive and intelligent young man, had been a dear friend for a long time. He was in love with her younger sister, Penelope. Unfortunately, he was the Marquis of Hartford's third son, which meant that he would never inherit sufficient title or wealth to satisfy the Lawson's ambitious plans. Since it was clear that Lily would never marry, her parents' dreams of social advancement were centred on Penelope. Lily felt sorry for her younger sister, who was betrothed to the Earl of Rayford, a man Penelope reputedly did not even know very well. Zachary had to be suffering. How long has Zachary been here? Lily asked. For three hours, miss. He claimed to be about urgent business. He stated that he would wait as long as necessary in order to see you. Lily's curiosity was awakened. She glanced at the closed door of the salon, positioned between the arms of the double-sided staircase. Urgent, hmm? I'll see him right away. Uh, send him to my upstairs sitting room. I must get out of these wet things. Burton nodded without expression. The sitting room, attached to Lily's bedchamber, via a small anteroom, was reserved for Lily's closest acquaintances. Few were allowed up there, although an untold number had angled for invitations. Yes, Miss Lawson. Zachary had found it no hardship to wait in Lily's parlour. Even in his agitation, he couldn't help noticing that something about number 38 Grosvenor made a man feel extraordinarily comfortable. Perhaps it had something to do with the colour schemes. Most women had their walls done in the fashionable pastel colours, cool blue, icy pink or yellow, ornamented with white friezes and columns. Uncomfortable little gilt chairs with slick cushions were the mode. Those, and sofas with dainty legs that looked incapable of bearing any real weight. But Lily's terrace was decorated in rich, warm colours, with solid furniture that invited a man to put his feet up. The walls were covered with hunting scenes, engravings, and a few tasteful portraits. 
there were frequent gatherings of writers, eccentrics, dandies, and politicians at her home, although Lily's liquor supply was undependable, sometimes abundant, sometimes perplexingly sparse. Apparently, Lily was amply stocked this month, for one of the housemaids brought Zachary a decanter of good brandy and a glass on a silver tray. She also offered him a copy of the Times, ironed flat and stitched down the seam, and a plate of sweetened biscuits. Enjoying a feeling of well-being, Zachary asked for a pot of tea and relaxed with the paper. As he finished the last of the biscuits, Burton opened the door. Has she arrived? Zachary asked eagerly, jumping to his feet. Burton regarded him implacably. Miss Lawson will see you upstairs. If you will allow me to show you the way, Lord Stamford. Zachary followed him up the curving staircase, with its intricately turned balusters and highly polished banister. He entered the sitting room, where a lively blaze cast its light from a small marble fireplace and illuminated the green, bronze, and blue silk wall hangings. After a minute or two, Lily appeared at the doorway that connected to her bedchamber. Zachary! she exclaimed, rushing forward and seizing his hands. Zachary smiled as he bent to brush her soft cheek with a perfunctory kiss. His smile froze as he realized that she was clad in a robe, her bare feet peeking out from beneath the floor-length hem. It was a circumspect robe, heavy and thick, the neck trimmed in swan's down, but it was still a garment in the category of unmentionable. He stepped back in a startled reflex, but not before he noticed that her hair was drying in spiky clumps and she smelled rather peculiar. In spite of that, Lily was still strikingly beautiful. Her eyes were as dark as the centre of a sunflower, shadowed by a thick sweep of lashes. Her skin had a pale, polished glow, and the line of her throat was delicate and pure. When she smiled, as she did now, her lips had a singularly sweet curve, as if she were an angelic little girl. Her innocent appearance was deceptive. Zachary had seen her trade the subtlest of insults with rarefied dandies, then shout vulgarities at a pickpocket who had attempted to rob her. Lily, he asked tentatively, and he couldn't help wrinkling his nose as he got another whiff. She laughed at his expression and waved at the air in front of her. I would have bathed first, but you said your concern was urgent. Pardon me for reeking of eau de boisson. The Thames was rather fishy today. At his uncomprehending stare, she added, My hat was blown into the river by a gust of wind. While you were still wearing it? Zachary asked in confusion. Lily grinned. Not precisely. But let's not talk about it. I'd rather hear about the matter that brought you to town. He gestured to her attire, or rather her lack of it, uncomfortably. Shouldn't you like to dress first? Lily gave him a fond smile. There were some things about Zachary that would never change. His soft brown eyes, his sensitive face, the neatly groomed hair. All of it reminded her of a little boy dressed for church. Oh, don't blush and carry on. I'm perfectly well covered. I wouldn't have expected such modesty of you, Zachary. After all, you did ask me to marry you once. Oh. Yes, well, Zachary frowned. The proposal had been made and rejected so quickly that he had almost forgotten about it. Until that day, Harry was my best friend. When he jilted you in that dastardly manner, I felt the only gentlemanly thing to do was to act as his second. That provoked a snort of laughter. His second? Good gad, Zachary. It was an engagement, not a duel. And you turned down my proposal, he remembered. Dear boy, I would have made you miserable, the same way I made Harry miserable. That was why he left me. That is no excuse for him to have behaved so dishonorably, Zachary said stiffly. But I'm glad he did. If he hadn't, I never would have travelled round the world with my eccentric Aunt Sally, 
and she never would have left me her fortune, and I would be... Lily paused and gave a delicate shudder. Married. She smiled and seated herself before the fire, gesturing for him to do the same. At the time, all I could think about was my broken heart. But I do remember your proposal as one of the nicest things that ever happened to me. One of the few times a man has acted unselfishly on my behalf. The only time, actually. You were prepared to sacrifice your own happiness and marry me, just to save my wounded pride. Is that why you've remained friends with me over the years? Zachary asked with surprise. With all the elegant, accomplished people you know, I've always wondered why you bother with me. Oh, yes, she said dryly. Spendthrifts, wastrels and thieves. Quite an assortment of friends I have. Obviously, I don't exclude royalty and politicians. She smiled at him. You're the only decent man I've ever known. Decency's gotten me far, hasn't it? He said glumly. Lily looked at him in surprise, wondering what had made Zachary, a perennial idealist, look so woebegone. Something must be very wrong indeed. Zack, you have many wonderful qualities. You're attractive. But not handsome, he said. Intelligent. But not clever. Not a wit. Cleverness is usually born of malice, which I'm glad to say you don't have. Now stop obligating me to praise you and tell me why you've come. Her gaze sharpened. It's Penelope, isn't it? Zachary stared into her fire-lit eyes. He frowned and gave a long sigh. Oh, your sister and your parents are staying with Rayford at Rayford Park, making preparations for the wedding. It's only a few weeks away, Lily mused, warming her bare toes before the crackling blaze. I wasn't invited. <laughs> Mother is terrified that I would make some sort of scene. The sound of her laughter was tinged with melancholy. Where would she get such an idea? Your past doesn't quite recommend you, Zachary tried to explain, and she interrupted with amused impatience. Yes, of course I know that. She hadn't been on speaking terms with her family for some time. Those ties had been cut years ago by her own careless hands. She didn't know what had driven her to rebel against the rules of propriety her family held so dear. But it didn't matter now. She had made mistakes, for which she would never be forgiven. The Lawsons had warned her that she would never be able to come back. At the time, Lily had laughed in the face of their disapproval. Now, she was well acquainted with the taste of regret. Ruefully, she smiled at Zachary. Even I wouldn't do something to embarrass Penny. Or, oh, heaven forbid, endanger the prospect of having a wealthy earl in the family. Mother's fondest dream. Lily, have you ever met Penelope's fiancé? Hmm? Not really. Once I caught a glimpse of him in Shropshire, during the opening of grouse season. Tall and taciturn, that's how he appeared. If he marries Penelope, he will make her life hell. Zachary intended the statement to be shocking, dramatic, spurring her into immediate action. Lily was unimpressed. Her dark, slanting brows drew together, and she contemplated him with almost scientific detachment. First of all, Zach, there's no if about it. Penny is going to marry Rayford. She would never disobey my parents' wishes. Second, it's hardly a secret that you're in love with her. And she loves me. And therefore, you may be apt to exaggerate the situation for your own purposes. She raised her eyebrows significantly. Hmm? In this matter, I couldn't exaggerate. Rayford will be cruel to her. He doesn't love her, whereas I would die for her. He was young and melodramatic, but it was clear he was sincere. Oh, Zack. Lily felt a surge of compassion for him. Sooner or later, everyone was driven to love someone they could never have. 
Fortunately, once had been enough for her to learn that particular lesson. You will remember, I advised you long before now to coax Penny to elope with you, she said. Either that, or dishonor her so that my parents would have to consent to the match. But it's too late now. They've found a fatter pigeon than you to pluck. Lord Rayford is no pigeon, Zachary said darkly. He's more like a lion, a cold, savage creature, who will make your sister miserable for the rest of her days. He isn't capable of love. Penelope is terrified of him. Ask some of your friends about him. Ask anyone. They'll all tell you the same thing. He doesn't have a heart. Well, a heartless man. She had met her share of those. Lily sighed. Zachary, I have no advice to offer, she said regretfully. I love my sister and naturally it would delight me to see her happy. But there's nothing I can do for either of you. You could talk to your family, he begged. You could plead my cause. Zachary, you know I'm an outcast from the family. My words carry no weight with them. I haven't been in their good graces for years. Please, you're my last hope. Please. Lily stared into Zachary's anguished face and shook her head helplessly. She didn't want to be the source of anyone's hope. Her own small supply had been exhausted. Unable to remain sitting, she sprang up and paced around the room, while he remained deathly still in his chair. Zachary spoke as if he feared that one ill-chosen word would be his ruin. Lily, think of how your sister feels— Try to imagine what it is like for a woman without your strength and freedom. Frightened, dependent on others, helpless. Oh, I know that is a feeling utterly foreign to someone like you, but... He was interrupted by a caustic laugh. Lily had stopped pacing and was standing near the heavily draped window. She rested her back against the wall, one leg bent until the point of her knee showed through the thick ivory robe. Regarding him with bright, mocking eyes, she gave him a smile shadowed with irony. Utterly foreign, she repeated. But Penelope and I are both lost. We need someone to help us, guide us to the path we were meant to walk together. Dear, how poetic. Oh, God, Lily, don't you know what it is to love? Don't you believe in it? Lily turned away pulling at a few strands of her short, matted hair. She rubbed her forehead wearily. No, not that kind of love, she said in a distracted manner. His question troubled her. Suddenly, she wished he would go and take his desperate gaze with him. I believe in the love a mother has for her child, and the love between brothers and sisters. I believe in friendship. I've never seen a romantic match that lasts. They're all destined to end out of jealousy, anger, indifference. She steeled herself to look at him coolly. Be like every other man, my dear. Marry advantageously, then take a mistress who will supply all the love you need for as long as you're willing to keep her. Zachary flinched as if she had slapped him. He stared at her as he never had before his soft eyes accusing. For the first time, he said unsteadily, I can believe some of the things that others say about you. F forgive me for coming here. I thought you could provide some help, or at least comfort. Damnation, Lily exploded, using her favorite curse. Zachary winced, but remained in his chair. In astonishment, Lily realized that his need was that great, his hope that stubborn, and she, of all people, should understand the hell it was to be separated from the one you loved. Slowly, she went to him and pressed a kiss to his forehead, smoothing his hair back as if he were a little boy. Forgive me, she muttered remorsefully. I'm a selfish wretch. No, he said in confusion. No, you're... I am. I'm impossible. Of course I'll help you, Zachary. 
I always repay my debts. And this has been long outstanding. Suddenly, she leapt away and strode around the room with renewed energy, chewing on her knuckles as if she were a cat frantically grooming itself. Now let me think, let me think. Dazed by her swift change of mood, Zachary sat there and watched silently. I'll have to meet Rayford, she finally said. I'll assess the situation for myself. But I've already told you what he's like. I must form my own impression of him. If I find that Rayford is neither as cruel nor as horrid as you paint him, I'll have to let the matter alone. Her small fingers laced together, and she flexed them up and down, as if making them more limber, before seizing the reins of a palfrey and charging off on a hunting course. Go back to the country, Zack, and I will notify you when I've made a decision. What if you discover that I'm right about him? What then? Then, she said pragmatically, I'll do whatever I can to help you get Penny. Chapter Two The lady's maid entered the room with an armload of evening finery. No, Annie, not the pink gown, Lily said, gesturing over her shoulder. Tonight, I want something more dashing. Something wicked. She sat at her dressing table, peering into a gilt-framed oval mirror, and running her fingers through her unruly sable curls. The blue with the slash and puff sleeves and the low neck, Annie suggested, her round face wreathed in a smile. Born and reared in the country, she had a fascination for all the sophisticated styles to be found in London. Perfect. I always win more when I wear that one. All of the gentlemen stare at my bosom instead of concentrating on their cards. Annie chuckled and went in search of the gown while Lily tied a silver and sapphire bandeau around her forehead. Artfully, she coaxed a few curls to fall over the sparkling ribbon. She smiled into the mirror, but it looked rather like a grimace. The daring grin she had once used to great effect had disappeared. Lately, she couldn't seem to manufacture anything but a poor imitation. Perhaps it was the strain she had been living with for so long. Lily frowned at her reflection ruefully. Were it not for Derek Craven's friendship, she would have become far more bitter and hardened by now. Ironic that the most cynical man she had ever known had helped her to retain her last few shreds of hope. Lily knew that most of the Tom believed that she was having an affair with Derek. She was not surprised by such speculation. Derek was not the sort of man who had platonic relationships with women, but there was no romantic attachment between them, and there never would be. He had never even made an attempt to kiss her. Of course, it would be impossible to convince anyone else of that, for they were seen together, cup and can, in their favourite haunts, places that ranged from the most prized seats of the opera to the dingiest Covent Garden drinking establishments. Derek never asked to visit Lily's London Terrace, and she did not invite him. There were certain lines they did not cross. Lily liked the arrangement, for it kept other men from making unwanted advances to her. No one would dare intrude on what was considered to be Derek Craven's territory. There were things about Derek that Lily had come to admire over the past two years. His strength and utter lack of fear. Of course, he had his faults. He was lost to sentiment. He loved money. The clink of coins was music to him, sweeter than any sound a violin or piano could produce. Derek had no taste for paintings or sculpture, but the perfect shape of a die, that he appreciated. As well as his lack of cultural refinement, Lily also had to admit that Derek was selfish to his very marrow, the reason, she suspected, that he had never fallen in love. He would never be able to put another's needs before his own. But if he had been less selfish, if he had possessed a sensitive and kind nature, his childhood would have destroyed him. Derek had confessed to Lily that he had been born in a drainpipe, 
and abandoned by his mother. He had been raised by pimps, prostitutes, and criminals who had shown him the darkest side of life. In his youth, he had made money by robbing graves, but found his stomach was too unsteady for it. Later, he had turned to laboring on the docks, shoveling dung, sorting fish, whatever would yield a coin. When he was still just a boy, a high-born lady had caught sight of him from her carriage as he carried boxes of empty bottles out of a gin shop. In spite of his unkempt and filthy appearance, something about his looks had appealed to her, and she had invited him into her carriage. It's a lie, Lily had interrupted in the middle of that particular story, watching Derek with wide eyes. It's the truth, he countered lazily, relaxing before the fire in his apartments, stretching his long legs. With his black hair and tanned face, and features that were neither chiselled nor coarse, but somewhere in between, he was handsome, almost. His strong white teeth were slightly snaggled, giving him the appearance of a friendly lion when he smiled. Nearly irresistible, that smile, although it never reached his hard green eyes. She took me in her carriage, she did, and brung me to her home in London. Where was her husband? Away to the country. What would she want to do with a dirty boy she had just plucked from the streets? Lily asked suspiciously, and scowled as he gave her a knowing smile. I don't believe this, Derek. Not a bloody word of it. First, she had me take a bath, Derek reminisced, a thoughtful expression on his face. God, the hot water. Hard soap, and it smelled so sweet. And a rug on the floor. Soft. I washed my arms and elbows first. My skin looked so white to me. He shook his head with a faint smile and sipped some brandy. Afterwards, I was shivering like a newborn pup. And then, I suppose she invited you into her bed, and you were a magnificent lover beyond anything she had experienced before, Lily said sarcastically. No, Derek grinned. The worst, more like. How did I know to please a woman? I only knew as to please myself. But she liked it anyway, Lily asked sceptically. She was experiencing the same confusion she always had concerning such matters. She had no idea what drew men and women together why they desired to share a bed and engage in an act that was so painful, embarrassing, and joyless. There was no doubt that men enjoyed it far more than women did. Why would a woman deliberately seek out some stranger to couple with? A blush came to her cheeks, and her gaze fell. But she listened intently as Derek continued. She taught me what she liked, he said, and I wanted to learn. Why? Why? Derek hesitated, drinking more, staring into the dancing fire. Any man can rut, but few knows or cares to please a woman. And to see a woman like that, going soft and easy underneath me, it gives a man power, you see. He glanced at Lily's perplexed face and laughed. No, I suppose you don't, poor gypsy. I'm not poor anything she retorted, wrinkling her nose in distaste. What do you mean by power? The smile he turned to her was faintly nasty. Tickle a woman's tail right, and she'll do anything for you. Anything. Thing, Lily said distinctly, and shook her head in bemusement. I don't agree with you, Derek. I've had my... I mean, I've done... that and it wasn't at all what I expected. And Giuseppe was known everywhere as Italy's greatest lover. Everyone said so. Derek's bright green eyes filled with mockery. Sure, he did it right. Since I conceived a child from the act, he must have done something right, Lily retorted. A man can father a thousand bastards and still not do it right, lovey. Plain as a pipe stem. You don't know nothing about it. Arrogant male, Lily thought, 
and gave him a speaking glance. She didn't care how someone did it. There was no possible way it could be pleasant. Frowning, she remembered Giuseppe's wet mouth on her skin, the suffocating weight of his body, the pain that had driven through and through her until she had gone rigid in silent misery. Is this all you have to give? he had demanded in his fluid Italian, his hands roving over her body. She had flinched from the intimate groping that had brought only embarrassment, the rough probing that brought pain. Oh, you're like all the English, cold as a fish. Long before then, she had learned that men could never be trusted with her heart. Giuseppe had taught her not to trust anyone with her body either. To subject herself to that again from any man would be more degradation than she could bear. Reading Lily's thoughts, Derek stood up and approached her chair. He braced his hands above her head and stared down at her with glinting green eyes. Lily shifted uncomfortably, feeling trapped. You do tempt me, lovey, Derek murmured. I'd like to be the man what shows you the pleasure it can be. Disliking the threatened feeling that was coming over her, Lily scowled at him. I wouldn't allow you to touch me, you wax-nosed cockney. I could if I wanted to, he returned evenly. And I'd make you like it. You needs a good tumble, worse than any woman I ever knew. But it won't be me that does you over. Why not? Lily asked, trying to sound bored. Her voice held a nervous quaver that made him smile. I'd lose you then, he said. That's what always happens, and the devil will go blind before I lose his you. So, you'll find some other man to lift your eels for, and I'll be here when you come back to me. Always. Lily was quiet, her wondering gaze locked on his purposeful face. Perhaps, she thought, this was as close as Derek could ever come to loving someone. He saw love as a weakness, and he despised weakness in himself. But at the same time, he depended on their odd friendship. He didn't want to lose her. Well, she didn't want to lose him either. She gave him a glance of mock scorn. Was that supposed to be a declaration of affection? she asked. The mood was broken. Derek grinned and rumpled her short hair, pulling at the silky curls. Whatever you wants it to be, lovey. After her meeting with Zachary, Lily went to Craven's in search of Derek. Certainly he would know something about Rayford. Derek knew the financial worth of every man in England, including past bankruptcies and scandals, future inheritances, and outstanding debts and liabilities. Through his own intelligence service, Derek was also aware of the private contents of their wills, which men kept mistresses, and how much they paid for them, and what marks their sons made at Eton, Harrow, and Westfield. Dressed in a pale blue gown, her small breasts emphasized by a scoop-necked bodice edged with sparkling cream lace, Lily strolled through Craven's unaccompanied. Her presence attracted little attention, for by now she was a familiar sight, an accepted oddity. She was the only woman Derek had ever allowed membership at Craven's, and in return he had demanded complete honesty from her. He alone knew her darkest secrets. Peering into room after room, Lily took in the sights of early evening at the gambling palace. The supper rooms were filled with guests, partaking of fine food and drink. Pigeons, she said softly, smiling to herself. That was Derek's word for his guests, although no one but her ever heard him use it. First, the pigeons would dine on the best cuisine in London, prepared by a chef to whom Derek paid the unthinkable salary of £2,000 a year. The supper would be accompanied by a selection of French and Rhenish wines, which Derek furnished at his own expense, ostensibly out of the goodness of his heart. Such an appearance of generosity encouraged the guests to spend more at the tables later. After supper, 
the club members would proceed through the building to the game rooms. Louis XIV would have felt entirely at home here, surrounded by stained glass, magnificent chandeliers, acres of rich blue velvet, dazzling and priceless artwork. Set at the centre of the edifice, like a precious jewel, was the hazard room with its domed ceiling. The air was filled with a quiet buzz of activity. Skirting the edge of the octagonal-shaped room, Lily absorbed the rhythm of ivory dice rattling in the box, the crisp shuffle of cards, the hum of voices. A shaded lamp hung directly over the oval-shaped hazard table, concentrating brilliant light on the green cloth and yellow markings. Tonight, several German embassy officials, a few French exiles, and a number of English dandies were grouped around the central hazard table. A wry, pitying smile touched Lily's lips as she saw how absorbed they were. Bets were placed, and dice tossed with hypnotic regularity. Were a foreigner to come here, someone who had never seen gambling before, he would assume that some sort of religious rite were taking place. The trick of winning was to play with detachment, taking calculated risks. But most of the men here did not play to win. They played for the thrill of casting themselves on the mercy of fate. Lily played without emotion, winning moderately but consistently. Derek called her a rook, which was for him a term of highest praise. A couple of the croupiers at the hazard table, Darnell and Fitz, nodded discreetly as Lily passed by. She was on excellent terms with Derek's employees, including the kitchen staff. The chef, Monsieur Labarge, always insisted that she sample and praise his latest creations. Lobster patties covered with breadcrumbs and cream, miniature potato souffles, partridge stuffed with hazelnuts and truffles, omelettes filled with jellied fruit, pastries and mouth-watering custards layered with crushed macaroons. Lily glanced around the hazard room in search of Derek's slim, dark form, but he was not there. As she headed toward one of six arched doorways, she was aware of a light touch at her gloved elbow. Turning around with a half-smile, she expected to see Derek's lean face. It was not Derek, but a tall Spaniard, wearing a golden insignia on his sleeve that designated him as an ambassador's aide. He bowed to her perfunctorily, then reached for her with insolent familiarity. You have attracted the notice of Ambassador Alvarez, he informed her. Come. He wishes you to sit with him. Come with me. Jerking her elbow away, Lily looked across the room at the ambassador, a rotund man with a thin moustache. He was staring at her avidly. With an unmistakable gesture, he motioned her to come to him. Lily returned her gaze to the aide. There's been a mistake, she said gently. Tell Senor Alvarez that I am flattered by his interest, but I have other plans for this evening. As she turned away, the aide took her wrist and jerked her back. Come, he insisted. He will pay for his pleasure. Obviously, she had been mistaken for one of Craven's hired women, but even they were not subjected to this sort of treatment, as if they were whores procured from a street corner. I'm not one of the house wenches, Lily said through her teeth. I'm not for sale. Do you understand? Now let go of me. The aide's face darkened with frustration. He began to chatter in Spanish trying to force her toward the hazard table where Alvarez was waiting. Several guests paused in their gambling to observe the commotion. As embarrassment joined her irritation, Lily shot a murderous glance at Worthy, Derek's factotum. He stood up from his desk in the corner and began toward them. Before Worthy reached the aid, Derek miraculously appeared from nowhere. Well now, Senor Bereda, I see as you've met Miss Lawson. A beauty, ain't she? As he spoke, Derek deftly extricated Lily from the Spaniard's grasp, 
but she's a special guest. My special guest. There's other women we has for the ambassador's convenience, and sweeter to the taste. This one's a sour little apple she is. You know what you are, Lily muttered, glaring at Derek. He wants this one, the aide insisted. He can't have her, Derek said, his voice pleasant. The gambling palace was his own private kingdom. His word, the final one in all matters. Lily saw the flash of uneasiness in the Spaniard's gaze. Having once attempted to face down Derek, she knew exactly how daunting he was. As always, Derek was dressed in expensive garments, a blue coat, pearl-grey pantaloons, and an immaculate white shirt and cravat. But in spite of his exquisitely tailored clothes, Derek had the rough, seasoned look of someone who had spent most of his life in the streets. Now he rubbed elbows with the cream of society, knowing, as everyone else did, that his elbows had originally been meant to occupy far less exalted places. Derek motioned to his two most beautiful house wenches, who sped efficiently to the frowning ambassador, sporting lavish displays of cleavage. No, I assure you, you'll like those two better. See? Happy as a mouse in cheese. Lily and Bareda followed his gaze and saw that with the women's expert attentions, Alvarez's frown had indeed cleared away. Giving Lily one last frown, the aide retreated with a few mumbled words. How dare he! Lily exclaimed indignantly, her face flushed. And how dare you, your special guest? I don't want anyone to think I need a protector. I'm completely self-sufficient, and I'll thank you to refrain from implying otherwise, especially in front of- Easy. Settle your temper. I should have let him have a go at you. Is that it? No, but you could have referred to me with some respect. And where the hell have you been? I want to speak with you about someone. I respect you, lovey. More than a woman should be respected. Now come have a walk with me. My ear, what's left of it, is yours to chew. Lily was unable to prevent a short laugh, and she slipped her hand into the crook of Derek's wiry arm. He often liked to take her on his strolls through the gambling palace, as if she were a rare prize he had won. As they crossed the main entrance hall and went to the magnificent gold staircase, Derek welcomed some of the arriving club members, Lord Milwright and Lord Neville, a baron and an earl, respectively. Lily favoured them with a bright smile. Edward, I hope you'll indulge me later with a game of cribbage, Lily said to Neville. After I lost to you last week, I fretted for the chance to redeem myself. Lord Neville's pudgy face creased with an answering smile. Most assuredly, Miss Lawson, I look forward to another match. As Neville and Milwright headed to the dining room, Neville was heard to say, For a woman, she's quite clever. Not too much of a scalping, Derek warned Lily. He touched me for a loan yesterday. His pockets aren't long enough to please a little rook like you. Well, who's are? Lily asked, causing him to chuckle. Try young Lord Bentink. His father takes care of his debts when he plays too deep. Together they ascended the magnificent grand staircase. Derek, Lily said briskly, I came to ask what you know about a certain gentleman. Who? The Earl of Rayford. Derek recognised the name instantly. The knob was betrothed to your sister? Yes, I've heard some rather disturbing speculation on his character. I want your impression of him. Why? Because I fear he is going to be a cruel husband to Penelope. and There is still time for me to do something about it. The wedding is only four weeks away. You don't give an oyster for your sister, he said. Lily directed a reproving glare at him. That shows how little you know about me. It is true that we have never been much alike, 
but I adore Penny. She is gentle, shy, obedient. Qualities, I think, are very admirable in other women. She doesn't need your help. Yes, she does. Penny is as sweet and helpless as a lamb. And you were born with claws and teeth, he said smoothly. Lily lifted her nose. If something is threatening my sister's future happiness, it is my responsibility to do something about it. A bloody saint you are. Now tell me what you know about Rayford. You know everything about everyone. And stop snickering like that. I don't intend to interfere in anyone else's affairs or do anything rash. Like hell you won't. Derek was laughing, envisioning yet another scrape she might land herself into. Hell, Derek, she corrected, enunciating the word. You didn't see Mr. Hastings today, did you? I can always tell when you've missed a lesson. Derek gave her a warning glance. Lily alone knew that for two days every week, Derek employed a special tutor who tried to soften his cockney accent into a more genteel one. It was a hopeless cause. After years of devoted study, Derek had managed to elevate his speech from the level of Billingsgate fish vendor to that of, well, perhaps a hackney driver or a temple bar merchant. A slight improvement, but hardly remarkable. His H's are his downfall, the tutor had once told Lily in despair. He can say them if he tries, but he always forgets. To him, I'll be Mr. Hastings until he draws his last breath. Lily had replied with a mixture of laughter and sympathy. That's all right, Mr. Hastings. Just have patience. He will surprise you some day. That H won't stop him forever. He doesn't have the ear for it the tutor said glumly. Lily had not argued. Privately, she knew that Derek would never sound like a gentleman. It didn't matter to her. She had actually come to like the manner of his speech, the mixed-up V's and W's, the imprecise consonants that fell rather pleasantly on the ear. Derek led her to the carved, gilded balcony overlooking the main floor. It was his favourite place to talk, for he could watch every move at the tables, his mind never ceasing its intricate calculations. Not a farthing, cribbage counter, nor a card flicking through nimble fingers ever escaped his vigilant gaze. Lord Rayford, he murmured thoughtfully. Aye, he shook the elbow here a time or two. Not a pigeon, though. Really? Lily said with surprise. Not a pigeon? Coming from you, that's quite a compliment. Rayford plays wise, follows runs but never goes deep. Derek turned a smile on her. Even you wouldn't be able to rook him. Lily ignored the taunt. Is he as wealthy as the rumours claim? That produced an emphatic nod. More. Any family scandals? Secrets? Trouble? Past affairs? Any misdeeds that would reflect badly on his character? Does he seem like a cold, cruel sort of fellow? Derek folded his long, well-tended hands over the balustrade, looking down at his small kingdom. He's quiet. Private. Especially since the woman he loved was knocked off a year or two ago. Knocked off? Lily interrupted, both amused and appalled. Must you be so vulgar? Derek ignored the reprimand. Miss Caroline Whitmore, Whitfield, something of the sort. Broke her neck on a nut, so they say. Damn little fool, I say. Hunt, Lily said, irritated by his meaningful glance. She loved to ride to the hands, but even Derek didn't approve of such a dangerous activity for a woman. And I'm not like other women. I can ride as well as any man, better than most. "'Tis your neck," he replied casually. "'Precisely. Now, that can't be all you know about Rayford. I know you. You're keeping something from me." No. Lily was caught by Derek's steady gaze, transfixed by the cool depths of green. His eyes contained a spark of humour, but also a warning. 
Once again, she was reminded that despite their friendship, Derek would not be there to help her if she landed herself in trouble. His voice was shaded with a quiet force that was as troubling as it was rare. Listen to me, Gypsy. Let it be. The marriage, everything. Rayford's not a cruel sort, but he's no rum cull. Stay clear of him. You has problems enough to handle. His lips twisted wryly, and he corrected himself. Handle. Lily considered his advice. Derek was right, of course. She should be preserving her strength, thinking of nothing but getting Nicole back. But for some reason, this question of Rayford's character had taken root inside her, nagging, until she would not have peace without seeing him. She thought of how docile Penny had always been, never misbehaving or questioning their parents' decisions. God knew Penny had no one to help her. The image of Zachary's pleading face came before her. She owed this to him. Lily sighed. I must meet Rayford and see for myself, she said stubbornly. Then go to the Middleton Hunt this week, Derek said, taking special care with his vowels and consonants. Suddenly, he almost sounded like a gentleman. Most likely, he'll be there. Assembling at the stables with the others, Alex waited while a small army of grooms brought the horses out to their masters. There was excitement in the air, for all participants knew it would be an exceptional day. It was cool and dry, the course would be challenging, and the Middleton Pack was renowned for its quality, reputedly worth more than three thousand guineas. Alex glanced at the brightening sky his mouth twisting with impatience. The hunt had been scheduled for six o'clock. They would be late getting started. More than half the hunting party hadn't mounted their horses yet. He considered walking over to someone and striking up a conversation. Most of the men here were familiar to him, some of them old classmates, but he wasn't in a sociable mood. He wanted to ride lose himself in the chase until he was too tired to think or feel. He looked across the field at the cool mist that hung over the yellow grasses and edged the dark grey-green woods. The nearby covert was thick with spiny gold-flowered gorse. All at once, a flash of memory assailed him. Caro, you're not going on the hunt! His fiancée, Caroline Whitmore laughed and pouted playfully. She was a lovely girl, with peach-coloured skin and bright hazel eyes, and hair the dark amber of clover honey. Darling, you wouldn't deprive me of such fun, would you? There's no chance of danger. I'm a superb rider, a clipping one, as you British would say. You don't know what it's like, riding to a leap in company. There are collisions, refusals or you could be thrown or ridden down. I'll ride with the utmost discretion. What do you suppose, that I'll ride neck or nothing across every hurdle? I'll have you know, dearest, that common sense is one of my strongest virtues. Besides, you know it's impossible to change my mind once I'm set on something. Caroline sighed melodramatically. Why must you be so difficult? Because I love you. Then don't love me. At least not tomorrow morning. Alex shook his head roughly, trying to clear away the haunting memories. God, would it always be like this? It had been two years since her death, and still he was tormented by it. The past engulfed Alex in an invisible shroud. He had tried to move beyond it, but after a few futile attempts, he had realized he would never be free of Caroline. Of course, there were others like her, women of spirit, passion, and beauty, but he did not want that kind of woman any more. Caroline had told him once that she thought no one would ever be able to love him quite enough. There had been too many years in which she had been bereft of a woman's nurturing care. His mother had died in childbirth when Alex was a boy. Her death was followed a year later by the passing of the Earl. 
It was said that he had willed himself to death, leaving behind his two sons and a mountain of responsibilities. Since the age of eighteen, Alex had been occupied with managing business interests, tenants and land agents, household staff and family. He had property in Herefordshire, set among fertile wheat and cornfields, and rivers filled with salmon, and a Buckinghamshire estate poised on a tract of harshly beautiful land that included steep Chilton chalk hills. Alex had devoted himself to caring for and educating his younger brother Henry. His own needs had been neglected, put aside, to be taken care of at some future date. When he had found a woman to love, the feelings he had pent up for so long were overwhelming. Losing Caroline had nearly killed him. He would never subject himself to such pain again. That was why he had deliberately sought Penelope Lawson's hand. A demure, blonde girl, quintessentially English, she had attracted him with her gentle manner at many of the society balls in London. Penelope was what he needed. It was time to marry and produce heirs. Penelope couldn't be more different than Caroline. She would share his bed, bear his children, grow old beside him, all in safety and peace, never becoming a part of him. Alex found ease in Penelope's undemanding presence. There was no spark or vivacity in her pretty brown eyes, no sharp wit in her comments, nothing that threatened to touch his heart in any way. She would never think to argue with him or contradict him. The distant friendliness between them was something she did not seem to want to bridge any more than he did. Suddenly, Alex's thoughts were interrupted by a remarkable sight. A woman was riding past the edge of the crowd, a young woman mounted on a high-strung white palfrey. Alex dropped his gaze instantly, but the vision blazed across his mind. A frown knotted itself between his brows. Exotic, hoidenish, startling, she had appeared from nowhere. She was as slim as a boy, except for the gentle rise of her breasts. Her short, curly black hair was held back from her forehead with a ribbon. Incredulously, Alex saw that she straddled the horse the way a man did, that she was wearing breeches underneath her riding gown. Breeches the colour of raspberries, for God's sake! Yet no one seemed to find her as astonishing as he did. Most of the men seemed to be acquainted with her, exchanging laughing comments with her, everyone from the fresh-faced Lord Yarborough to crotchety old Lord Harrington. Alex watched expressionlessly as the woman in raspberry breeches rode around the clearing where the bagged fox was to be loosed. There was something strangely familiar about her. Lily suppressed a satisfied smile as she saw that Rayford had fastened an unblinking gaze on her. He had definitely noticed her. My lord, she said to Lord Harrington, a robust older gentleman who had been an admirer of hers for years, who is that man staring at me so rudely? Why, it's the Earl of Rayford, Harrington replied. I would have assumed you had made acquaintance with him before, considering that he is soon to wed your delightful sister. Lily shook her head with a smile. No, his lordship and I move in quite different circles. Tell me, is he as boorish as he appears? Harrington gave a hearty laugh. <laughs> Would you like me to introduce you, so that you may judge for yourself? Thank you, but I believe I will present myself to Rayford unaccompanied. Before he could reply, Lily walked her horse toward Rayford. As she drew closer to him, she was conscious of an odd sensation in the pit of her stomach. She caught a glimpse of his face and suddenly realized who he was. My God, she breathed, stopping her horse beside him. It's you. His gaze was as piercing as a rapier. The water party, he murmured. You were the one who jumped overboard. And you were the one with the disapproving stare. Lily grinned at him. I was an idiot that day, she admitted ruefully but I was slightly foxed, although I suppose you wouldn't consider that an acceptable excuse. 
what do you want? His voice caused every fine hair on her spine to rise in awareness. Low, gravelly, it sounded as if he were growling. What do I want? she repeated, laughing softly. How direct you are. But I like that in a man. You wouldn't have approached me unless you wanted something. You're right. Do you know who I am, my lord? No. Miss Lily Lawson, your fiancé's sister. Concealing his surprise, Alex studied her closely. It didn't seem possible that this creature was related to Penelope. One sister so fair and angelic, the other dark and smouldering. And yet, there was a resemblance. They had the same brown eyes, the same fine features, the same unique sweetness in the curve of the lips. He tried to recall what little the Lawsons had revealed about their eldest daughter. They had preferred not to speak of her, except to say that Lily, or Wilhelmina, as her mother called her, had gone a little mad after having been jilted at the altar when she was twenty years old. She'd gone to live abroad after that. Under the lax chaperonage of her widowed aunt, Lily had led a wild existence. Alex had been only mildly interested in the story. Now he wished he had listened more closely. Has my family ever mentioned me to you? she asked. They described you as an eccentric. I wondered if they still bother to acknowledge my existence. She leaned down and said conspiratorially, I have a tarnished reputation. It's taken years of dedicated effort to acquire. The Lawsons don't approve of me. Well, fate chooses our relatives, as they say. Too late to prune me from the family tree. Lily paused in her friendly chatter as she stared down into his closed face. Heaven knew what was going on behind those silver eyes. It was clear that he was not going to indulge her with small talk and smiles, reverting to the game that sociable strangers played. She wondered if bluntness were the best way to deal with him. Rayford, she said briskly, I want to talk to you about my sister. He was silent watching her with icy grey eyes. I know more than anyone about my parents' ambitions of making an exceptional match for Penny, Lily remarked. She is a lovely and accomplished girl, isn't she? And it would be a brilliant marriage. Miss Penelope Lawson, the Countess of Rayford. No one in my family has ever ascended to such a title. But I wonder... Would it be in her best interests to become your wife? That is, do you care for my sister, Lord Rayford? His face was impassive. As much as necessary. That hardly sets my mind at ease. What is your concern, Miss Lawson? He asked sardonically. That I'll mistreat your sister? That she's had no choice in the matter? I assure you. Penelope is quite content with the state of affairs. His eyes narrowed, and he continued softly. And if you're about to delight everyone with one of your theatrical displays, Miss Lawson, I warn you, I don't like scenes. Lily was taken aback by the veiled menace in his tone. Oh, she didn't like him at all. At first she had considered him vaguely amusing, a large, slightly pompous aristocrat with ice water in his veins. But something warned her that his nature was not only cold, but cruel. I don't believe your claim that Penny is content, she replied. I know my sister, and I have no doubt my parents have bullied and prodded her every step of the way to get what they want. You must terrify Penny. Does her happiness matter to you at all? She deserves a man who truly loves her. My instincts tell me that all you want is an obedient, fertile girl who will produce a string of little blonde heirs to carry on your name. And if that's the case, you could easily find a hundred other girls to- Enough, he interrupted harshly. Go interfere in someone else's life, Miss Lawson. I'll see you in hell. No. 
I'll send you there, before I let you meddle with mine. Lily gave him an ominous look. I've found out what I wanted to know, she said, preparing to leave. Good day, my lord. You've been most enlightening. Wait. Before Alex was aware of what he was doing, he reached out and caught one of her reins. Let go, Lily said in surprised annoyance. His actions were outrageous. To take hold of any rider's reins without invitation, removing control of the horse, it was a demeaning act. You're not going to hunt, he said. You don't think I came out here to wish you well, do you? Yes, I'm going to hunt. Have no fear. I shan't slow anyone down. Women shouldn't hunt. Of course they should, if they wish to. Only if they happen to be wives or daughters of masters of hounds. Otherwise, a mere accident of birth won't prevent me from hunting. I am a bruising rider, and I insist that no allowance be made for me. I'll top any fence, no matter how high. I suppose you would like me to stay inside with the other women, tatting and gossiping. There, you won't pose a danger to anyone. Out here, you'll be a hazard to others as well as yourself. I'm afraid your opinion is in the minority, Lord Rayford. No one but you takes exception to my presence here. No man in his rational mind would want you here. Now, I suppose I should go away meekly, Lily mused, my gaze cast down in shame. How dare I interfere in such a manly occupation as hunting? Well, I don't give this. She made a snapping motion with her gloved fingers. For you and your self-righteous opinions. Now let go. You're not riding. Alex muttered. Something broke free inside him, driving him beyond rational thought. Caroline, no. Oh, God. I'll be damned if I'm not. Lily jerked at the reins, while the white palfrey sidestepped uneasily. Alex's grasp remained unbroken. Shocked, Lily stared into grey eyes as reflective as mirror glass. You're mad, she whispered. They were both still. Lily was the first to move, lashing out with her whip in a stroke of rebellious rage. It caught Alex underneath the jaw, leaving a streak of red that ended at the tip of his chin. Spurring the palfrey forward, Lily used the burst of motion to free the reins from the snare of his fingers. She rode away without looking back. The confrontation had been so quick that no one had noticed. Alex wiped the smear of blood from his jaw, barely noticing the sting of pain. His mind was whirling. He wondered what was happening to him. For a few seconds, he hadn't been able to separate the present from the past. Caroline's light, faraway voice came to his ears. Darling Alex, then don't love me. He flinched, his heart beginning to pound as he remembered the day she had fallen. An accident, one of his friends said quietly. Unseated, I knew when she fell. Get a doctor, Alex said hoarsely. Alex, it's no use. Damn you, get a doctor or I'll... Her neck was broken by the fall. No, Alex, she's dead. His groom's voice abruptly recalled him to the present. My lord? Alex blinked and focused his gaze on the shining chestnut gelding, chosen for its combination of power and suppleness. Taking the reins, he mounted the horse easily and glanced across the clearing. Lily Lawson was chatting and smiling with the other riders. To look at her, one would never guess there had been a confrontation between them. The pack of foxhounds were set loose, covering the field with their frantic snuffling. Then a scent was found. Reynard is out, came the call as a fox broke cover. A rich note pierced the air as the master blew the horn and the riders set out on the chase. The hunters rode to the copse in a fever of exultation, shouting madly. The field fairly shook under the onslaught of horses and dogs, hooves tearing at the ground, eager cries renting the air. Gone away! Tally-ho! Halloo! 
as the congregation spurred their mounts onward, the hunt took on the expected formation. The huntsmen riding close to the foremost hounds, the whippers in following the dogs and keeping the occasional stragglers in pace with the pack. Lily Lawson rode like a woman possessed, rushing at the highest obstacles and taking them as if she had wings. She seemed to have no concern for her own safety. Usually, Alex would have ridden ahead with the others. But for now, he held back. He was driven to follow Lily, watching her take suicidal chances. The course was filled with noise and revelry, while Alex went through a living nightmare. His horse strained over the jumps, hooves biting into the ground with every surge. Caroline. Long ago, he had closed it all away stored every recollection in the back of his mind. But he had no defence against the thoughts that came without warning. The feel of Caroline's mouth beneath his, her silky hair in his hands, the sweet torment of holding her close. She had taken away a part of him that would never be restored. You fool, he told himself savagely. He was making the hunt into a macabre reprise of his past. A fool chasing after lost dreams. And still he followed Lily, watching her leap through gaps and over reinforced hedges. Although she did not look back, he sensed that she knew he was there. They rode for nearly an hour, crossing from one county to another. Lily spurred her horse onward in determination, her nerves crackling with excitement. She had never cared much for the end of a hunt, being in at the kill, but the riding, oh, there was nothing like it. Gleefully, she approached a towering double oxer, a quickthorn braced on each side with an ox rail. In a split second, she realized it was too high and too much of a risk to take, but some devilish urge impelled her forward. At the last moment, the palfrey refused to jump. The arrested motion of the horse threw Lily out of the saddle. The world seemed to spin, and she was suspended in mid-air. Then the ground came rushing up at her. Shielding her face with her hands, Lily felt her body slam into the mossy earth. The breath was forced from her lungs. Writhing on the ground, she gasped for air, while her hands clutched reflexively around bits of leaves and mud. Dazedly, she felt herself being turned, and her shoulders lifted. Opening her mouth, she fought to pull in air. Red and black danced before her eyes. Slowly, the mist cleared away to reveal a face above her. Rayford. The golden glow of his skin was infused with ashen grey. Lily stirred against him, discovering that she was held securely in the lee of his muscular thighs. She was as limp and helpless as a doll. Her breasts rose and fell rapidly as she tried to regain her breath. His hand was tight on the back of her neck. Too tight, hurting her. I told you not to hunt, Rayford snarled. Were you trying to kill yourself? Lily made a small sound, looking up at him with hazy confusion. There was blood on his collar, a splotch of scarlet from the wound she had given him earlier. His hand was powerful on her neck. If he chose, he could snap her bones as if they were twigs. Lily was aware of the weight and sinew of him, the sheer power lodged within his body. There was a primitive expression on his flushed face, a mixture of hatred and something else she couldn't identify. Through the roaring of her ears, she thought she heard a name. Caroline. <gasps> You're a madman, she gasped. Good God, you belong in Bedlam. What's going on? Do you know who in the hell I am? Get your hands off me, do you hear? Her words seemed to bring him back to awareness of what he was doing. The murderous gleam left his eyes, and the contorted shape of his mouth softened. Lily sensed an enormous tension leaving his body. He dropped her abruptly, as if the touch of her had burned him. Falling back among the leaves and dirt, Lily watched with a glare as he stood up. He did not reach down a hand to assist her. 
but he did wait until she struggled to her feet. Assured that no serious harm had come to her, he hoisted himself onto his horse. Finding that her knees were weak, Lily braced herself against a tree. She would wait until she felt stronger before mounting her palfrey again. Curiously, she stared at Rayford's expressionless face. She took a few steadying breaths. Penny is too good for you, she managed to say. Before, I was afraid you would only make her miserable. Now, I believe you'll cause her bodily harm. Why do you pretend to give a damn? He sneered. You haven't seen your sister or your family in years. And obviously they want nothing to do with you. You know nothing about it, she said hotly. To think of this monster crushing all the happiness from Penelope's life. It would make her sister old before her time. Outrage leapt inside her. Why should an ogre like Rayford be allowed to marry Penelope when someone as dear and gentle as Zachary was in love with her? You shan't have Penny, Lily cried. I won't allow it. Alex regarded her with contempt. Don't make an even bigger fool of yourself, Miss Lawson. Swearing, dredging up the foulest language she could think of, Lily watched Rayford ride away. You won't have her, she vowed under her breath. I swear it on my life. You won't have her. Chapter 3 Upon his arrival at Rayford Park, Alex went to bid good morning to Penelope and her parents. By anyone's standards, the Lawsons were an odd pair. Lawson was a scholarly man, occupying himself with books of Greek and Latin, closeting himself in a room for days at a time with his texts, and having all his meals sent in. The squire had no interest in the outside world. Through sheer carelessness, he had badly mismanaged the estate and fortune he had inherited. His wife, Totty, was an attractive, fluttery woman, all round eyes and bouncing golden curls. She adored society gossip and parties, and had always set her heart on a splendid wedding for her daughter. Alex could see how the two of them could produce a child like Penelope. Quiet, shy, pretty, Penelope was the best of them combined. As for Lily, there was no accounting for how she had emerged from the Lawson family. Alex didn't blame them for casting Lily out of their lives. Otherwise, there would have been no peace for any of them. He had no doubt that she thrived on conflict, that she would meddle and torment until those around her had been driven insane. Although Lily had left the Middleton estate after their encounter on the course, Alex hadn't been able to stop brooding about her. He was grimly thankful that she was estranged from her family. With luck, he'd never have to abide her presence again. Happily, Totty informed him that the wedding arrangements were progressing nicely. The vicar would be coming to visit later in the afternoon. Good, Alex replied. Inform me when he arrives. Lord Rayford, Totty said eagerly, gesturing to a place on the sofa between her and Penelope. Won't you take tea with us? Riley, Alex noted that all of a sudden Penelope looked like a small rabbit in the presence of a wolf. He declined the invitation, having no desire to endure Totty's chatter about flower arrangements and wedding fripperies. Thank you, but I have business concerns to attend to. I'll see you at supper. Yes, my lord, both women murmured, one in disappointment and the other in poorly concealed relief. Closeting himself in the library, Alex regarded a pile of documents and account books that required his attention. He could have allowed his estate manager to handle most of it, but since Caroline's death, he had taken on more work than was necessary wanting to escape from the loneliness and the memories. He spent more time in the library than in any other room of the house, enjoying the sense of peace and order to be found there. Books were categorized and grouped together neatly. Furniture was carefully arranged. Even the decanters of liquor on the Italian corner cupboard were placed with geometrical precision. 
There was not a speck of dust anywhere, not in the entire mansion at Rayford Park. An army of fifty indoor servants saw to that. Another thirty took care of the outside grounds, gardens and stables. Visitors had always exclaimed with pleasure over the mansion's domed marble entrance hall and the great hall with its barrel-vaulted ceiling and exquisite plasterwork. The mansion possessed summer and winter parlours, long galleries filled with artwork, a breakfast room, a coffee room, two dining salons, countless sets of bedchambers and dressing rooms, an immense kitchen, a library, a hunting room, and a pair of drawing rooms that were occasionally combined into a massive ballroom. It was a large household, but Penelope would be capable of managing it. Since early childhood, she had been reared to do exactly that. Alex had no doubt that she would be able to take her place as Lady of the Manor without difficulty. She was an intelligent girl, albeit quiet and docile. She had yet to meet his younger brother Henry, but he was a well-behaved lad, and it was likely they would get along quite well. The silence in the library was broken by a tiny tap-tap on the door. What is it? Alex asked brusquely. The door opened a crack, and Penelope's blonde head appeared. Her overcautious manner annoyed him. For God's sake! It seemed as if she considered visiting him to be a dangerous undertaking. Was he really so fearsome? He knew his manner was abrupt sometimes, but he doubted he could change even if he wanted to. Yes, he demanded. Come in. My lord, Penelope said timidly. I, I wish to know if the hunt was successful, if you found it enjoyable. Alex suspected that her mother Totty had sent her to ask. Penelope never sought his company of her own accord. The hunt was fine, he said, setting aside the papers on his desk and turning toward her. Penelope shifted nervously, as if his gaze made her uncomfortable. Something rather interesting happened on the first day. A vague expression of interest crossed her face. Oh, my lord, was there an accident of some sort? A collision? You could call it that, he said dryly. I met your sister. Penelope gasped. <gasps> Lily was there? Oh, dear. At a loss for words, she closed her mouth and looked at him helplessly. She's quite extraordinary. Alex's tone was far from complimentary. Penelope nodded and gulped. There is usually no middle ground with Lily. One either likes her tremendously or... She shrugged helplessly. Yes, Alex said sardonically. I'm of the latter persuasion. Oh. Penelope's forehead puckered in a dainty frown. Of course, both of you are rather decided in your opinions. That's a tactful way of putting it. Alex stared at her closely. It was unnerving to see the echoes of Lily in Penelope's sweet, gentle face. We talked about you, he said abruptly. Her eyes turned round with apprehension. My lord, I should make it clear that Lily does not speak for me or the rest of the family. I know that. What was said between you? she asked timidly. Your sister claimed that I must frighten you. Do I? Underneath his cool appraisal, the colour rushed to her face. A little, my lord, she admitted. Alex found her sweet shyness somewhat irritating. He wondered if she was capable of snapping back at him if she would ever take him to task when he did something to displease her. As he stood and walked over to her, he saw her flinch involuntarily. Coming to stand next to her, he put his hands on her waist. Penelope bent her head, but Alex was aware of her quickly indrawn breath. Suddenly, he couldn't rid his mind of a disturbing image. Picking Lily up from the ground, holding her lithe body in his arms, Although Penelope was taller, more voluptuous than her older sister, 
she gave the impression of being much softer and smaller. Look at me, Alex said quietly, and Penelope obeyed. He stared into her brown eyes, exactly like Lily's. Except these eyes were filled with startled innocence, not dark fire. There's no reason to be uneasy. I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, my lord, she whispered. Why don't you call me Alex? He had asked it of her before, but the use of his name seemed to be difficult for her. Oh, I... I couldn't. With great effort, he suppressed his impatience. Try. Alex, Penelope murmured. Good. He bent his head and touched her lips with his own. Penelope didn't move, only brushed his shoulder with her hand. Alex prolonged the kiss, increasing the pressure of his mouth. For the first time, he sought more than docile acceptance from her. Her lips remained cool and still beneath his. All at once, Alex was puzzled and annoyed to realize that Penelope considered his embrace a duty she had to endure. Lifting his head, he looked down at her placid face. She looked like a child who had just obediently downed a spoonful of medicine and was suffering the aftertaste. Never in his life had a woman considered kissing him to be a chore. Alex's tawny brows drew together in a frown. Damn it, I won't be tolerated, he said gruffly. Penelope stiffened in alarm. My lord, Alex knew he should play the gentleman and treat her with tender respect, but his full-blooded nature demanded a response from her. Kiss me back, he commanded, and crushed her against his body. With a surprised squeak, Penelope twisted away from him and slapped his face. Not exactly a slap. He would have welcomed a vigorous, hearty slap. This was more like a reproving pat on his cheek. Penelope retreated to the door and regarded him tearfully. My lord, are you testing me in some manner? She asked in a wounded voice. Alex looked at her for a long time, keeping his face expressionless. He knew he was being unreasonable. He should not expect something from her that she was not able or willing to give. Silently, he cursed himself, wondering why he was in such a devilish mood. I beg your pardon. Penelope gave him an uncertain nod. I suppose you were still excited from the hunt. I have heard that men are very affected by the primitive atmosphere of such events. He smiled sardonically. That's probably it. May I be excused now? Wordlessly, he waved her out of the room. Penelope paused at the door, looking back over her shoulder. My lord, please don't think badly of Lily. She is an unusual woman, very brave and headstrong. When I was a child, she used to protect me from everyone and everything that frightened me. Alex was surprised by Penelope's little speech. It was rare that he heard Penelope put more than two sentences together. Was she ever close to either of your parents? Only to our Aunt Sally. Sally was an eccentric in the same way my sister is, always seeking adventure and doing unconventional things. When she passed away a few years ago, she left her entire fortune to Lily. So that was how Lily had obtained her means to live. The information hardly improved Alex's opinion of her. Probably she had deliberately courted the old woman's favour and then danced upon the deathbed at the thought of the money she had inherited. Why hasn't she ever married? Lily has always said that marriage is a dreadful institution devised for the benefit of men, not women. Penelope cleared her throat delicately. Actually... She hasn't a very high opinion of men, although she does seem to enjoy their company, going hunting and shooting and gaming and so forth. And so forth, Alex repeated sardonically. Does your sister have any special friends? 
the question seemed to perplex Penelope. Although she didn't quite understand his meaning, she answered readily. Special? Well, Lily keeps company quite often with a man named Derek Craven. She has mentioned him in her letters to me. Craven? Now the entire sordid picture was clear. Alex's lip curled with disgust. He himself was a member of Craven's club. He'd met the proprietor on two occasions. It only made sense that Lily Lawson would choose to associate with such a man, a cockney who was disdainfully known in polite circles as Flash Gentry. No doubt Lily had the morals of a prostitute, for a friendship with Craven could mean nothing else. How could a woman who had been born into a decent family, provided with education and all her material wants, sink into such degradation? Lily had willingly chosen it, every step of the way. Lily is merely too high-spirited for the kind of life she was born to, Penelope said, guessing at his thoughts. Everything might have been different for her, had she not been jilted all those years ago. The betrayal and humiliation, being abandoned like that. I believe it led her to do many reckless things. At least that is what Mamma says. Why hasn't she... Alex broke off, looking toward the window. He had been alerted by a sound outside, the grating of carriage wheels upon the graveled drive. Is your mother expecting callers today? Penelope shook her head. No, my lord. It could be the dressmaker's assistant, come to do some fittings for my trousseau. But I thought that was tomorrow. Alex couldn't explain why, but he had a feeling, a very bad feeling. His nerves sparked with a sensation of warning. Let's see who it is. He sent the library door swinging open, striding to the grey and white marbled entrance hall with Penelope at his heels. He brushed past the elderly butler, Sylvan. I'll take care of it, he said to Sylvan and went to the front door. Sylvan sniffed in disapproval at his lordship's unorthodox behaviour, but did not voice a protest. A magnificent black and gold carriage, with no identifiable crest, had come to a stop at the end of the long gravelled drive. Penelope came to stand by Alex, shivering in her light gown as the breeze touched her. It was a misty springtime day, cool and fresh, with billowing white clouds overhead. I don't recognize the carriage, she murmured. A footman, dressed in splendid blue and black livery, opened the carriage door. Ceremoniously, he placed a small rectangular step on the ground for the convenience of the passenger. Then she emerged. Alex stood as if turned to stone. Lily! Penelope exclaimed, with a cry of delight, she hurried to her sister. Laughing exuberantly, Lily reached the ground. Penny! She flung her arms around Penelope and hugged her, then held her at arm's length. My goodness! What an elegant creature you are! Ravishing! It's been years since I've seen you. Not since you were little. And now look at you. The most beautiful girl in England. Oh no, you're the beautiful one. Lily laughed and hugged her again. How nice to flatter your poor spinsterish sister. You don't look at all like a spinster, Penelope said. In spite of Alex's amazement, his emotions rallying to battle readiness, he had to agree. Lily was beautifully dressed in a dark blue gown and velvet cloak edged with white ermine. Her hair, unconfined by a ribbon, curled prettily around her temples and lay in wisps in front of her dainty ears. It was difficult to believe she was the same outlandish woman who had dressed in raspberry breeches and straddled a horse like a man. Pink-cheeked and smiling, she looked like a well-to-do young wife on a social call, or an aristocratic courtesan. Lily saw him as she looked over Penelope's shoulder, Without shame, 
or even a trace of discomposure, she disentangled herself from her sister and walked up to the circular steps to where he stood. Extending a small hand to him, she smiled impudently. Straight into the enemy camp, she murmured. The sight of his thunderous skull caused her dark eyes to gleam in satisfaction. Wisely, Lily restrained herself from grinning outright. It wouldn't do to send Rayford into a rage. He was angry, though. Certainly he hadn't expected her to come sailing up to the door of his country estate. Oh, she hadn't expected to enjoy this so much. She had never felt such pure delight in provoking a man. By the time she was through with Rayford, his entire world would be turned upside down. She felt no remorse for what she planned to do. It was an outrage, this pairing of Rayford and her sister. The wrongness of it was evident just in glancing at these two. Penny was as fragile as a white-petaled anemone, her golden hair shining with the soft gleam of a child's. She had no defence against those who would bully and intimidate her, no recourse except to bend like a delicate reed in the face of a violent storm. And Rayford was ten times worse than Lily had remembered him. His features, so harshly perfect and remote, with those clear, pale eyes and the stern jut of his chin, there was no compassion, no gentleness in that face. The brutal power of his body, all muscle and sinewed tension, was evident in spite of his civilized attire. He needed a woman who was as cynical as he was, insensitive to his barbs. Alex ignored Lily's hand. He stared at her coldly. Leave, he growled. Now. A chill scattered over her back. But Lily smiled demurely. My lord, I wish to see my family. It's been far too long. Before Alex could reply, he heard Totty and George's exclamations behind him. Wilhelmina! Lily, good gad. There was silence, all of them forming a frozen tableau. Their gazes centred on Lily's petite form. Rapidly, the cockiness and self-assurance on Lily's face faded, until she resembled an uncertain little girl. Nervously, her white teeth pulled at her delicate lower lip. Mama, she asked softly. Mama, Will you try to forgive me? Totty burst into tears and came forward, holding her chubby arms wide. Wilhelmina, you might have come before. I've been so afraid I would never see you again. Lily flew to her, laughing and crying. The two women embraced and talked at the same time. Mama, you haven't changed at all. And how splendidly you've done with Penny. She's the toast of the season. Dear, we've heard such dreadful tales of your carryings on. I always worry, you know. Merciful heavens, what have you done to your hair? Self-consciously, Lily raised a hand to her short, curly locks and grinned. Is it too dreadful, Mama? It suits you, Totty admitted. Rather becoming, actually. Lily saw her father and hurried to him. Papa! Awkwardly, George patted her slender back and pushed her away gently. There, there, no need to carry on. Gad, such scenes you cause, Lily, and in front of Lord Rayford. Are you in some sort of trouble? Why have you come here of all places, and now of all times? I'm in no trouble at all, Lily said, smiling at her father. They were of similarly small stature, standing nearly face to face. I would have come sooner, but I was uncertain of my reception. I want to share in the joy of Penny's wedding. Naturally, if my presence displeases the Earl, I will leave immediately. I've no wish to cause trouble for anyone. I just thought that I might be allowed to stay for a week or so. She glanced at Alex and added cautiously, I would be on my best behaviour. I would be a veritable saint. Alex's gaze bore through her like an icicle. He was tempted to shove her back into the ornate carriage 
and tell the driver to head straight for London, or a far hotter place. Confronted with his silence, Lily appeared to be perturbed. But perhaps there isn't enough room for me here. She craned her neck up to stare at the towering mansion, letting her gaze travel across the endless rows of windows and balconies. Alex gritted his teeth together. It would have been the greatest pleasure of his life to throttle her. He understood what she was doing. To refuse her now would paint him as an inhospitable blackguard in her family's eyes. Penelope was already regarding him with anxious dismay. Alex, Penelope beseeched, coming up to him and placing a hand on his arm. It was the first time she had ever voluntarily touched him. Alex, there is enough room here for my sister, isn't there? If she says she will conduct herself well, I am certain that she will. Lily clucked affectionately. Now, Penny, let us not embarrass his lordship. I will find some other occasion to see you, I promise. No, I wish you to stay, Penelope cried, her fingers tightening on Alex's arm. Please, my lord, please allow her to remain here. There's no need to beg, Alex muttered. How could he refuse his fiancée when she was pleading with him in front of her family, the butler, and every servant within earshot? He glared at Lily, expecting to see a gleam of triumph in her eyes, a smug tilt to her lips. But she wore a forbearing expression that would have become Joan of Arc. Damn her. Do whatever you want, he said to Penelope. Just keep her out of my sight. Oh, thank you. Penelope whirled in delight, hugged Lily, and then Totty. Mama, isn't it wonderful? In the midst of Penelope's torrent of gratitude, Lily approached Alex calmly. Rayford, I'm afraid you and I have got off to a bad start, she said. It was entirely my fault. Can't we forget the bloody hunt and begin again? She was so sincere, so frank and appealing. Alex didn't believe any of it. Miss Lawson, he said with deliberate slowness, if you do anything to undermine my interests. Your what? Lily smiled at him provocatively. There was nothing he could do to hurt her. The worst had been done to her long ago. She wasn't afraid of him. I'll make you regret it for the rest of your life, he said softly. Lily's smile faded as he strode away. Suddenly, Derek's warning came to her ears. Listen to me, Gypsy. Let it be. Stay clear of his path. Lily pushed the words out of her mind, shrugging impatiently. Lord Rayford was only a man, and she could run circles around him. Hadn't she just gained herself an invitation to stay right underneath his roof for the next few weeks? She looked at her mother and sister and laughed quietly. I asked Rayford if he loved you. Lily had taken the first opportunity to steer Penelope to a private room where they could have, as she put it, a sisterly chat. Immediately, she had launched into an account of the Middleton hunt, determined to make Penny understand what manner of man she was engaged to. Oh, Lily! You didn't. Penelope put her hands over her eyes and moaned. But why would you do such a thing? Suddenly she surprised Lily by bursting into giggles. I can't imagine how his lordship replied. I don't see what is so amusing, Lily said with perplexed dignity. I am trying to have a serious conversation with you about your future, Penny. My future is well in hand. Or was, rather. Choking with dismayed laughter, Penelope covered her mouth with her hand. Indignantly, Lily wondered why the story of her meeting with Rayford at the hunt was causing her sister amusement, instead of making her properly alarmed. In response to my perfectly straightforward question, Rayford was rude, evasive, and insulting. In my opinion, he is not a gentleman, and is far from worthy of you. Penelope shrugged helplessly. All of London recognizes him as a splendid catch. I beg to differ. Lily paced back and forth in front of the canopied bed, repeatedly slapping a kid glove in her palm. 
What are the qualities that make him a good catch? His looks? Well, I admit he could be considered handsome, but only in a bland, cold, unremarkable sort of way. I, I suppose that is a matter of taste. And as to his fortune, Lily continued vigorously, there are many other men who have the means to take care of you and keep you in a fine style. His title? You could easily land someone with even bluer blood and more impressive lineage. And you can't claim you have any great liking for Rayford, Penny. The arrangement has been made and settled between Papa and Lord Rayford, Penelope replied softly. And while it is true that I do not love him, I never expected to. If I am fortunate, that sort of feeling may come later. That is the way of things. I am not like you, Lily. I have always been very conventional. Lily uttered a garbled curse and stared at her in frustration. Something about her sister's prosaic manner was making Lily feel much as she had during her rebellious youth, when everyone had seemed to have an understanding of the world that she could not share in. What was their secret? Why did a loveless, arranged marriage make sense to everyone else and not to her? Clearly, she'd enjoyed too much freedom for too long. She sat on the bed next to Penelope. I don't see why you're so agreeable to the prospect of marrying a man you don't care for. Lily tried to sound brisk, but her voice came out plaintive. I am not agreeable, just resigned. Do forgive me for saying it, Lily, but you are a romantic in the worst sense of the word. Lily scowled. Not at all. I have quite a hard-bitten, practical nature. I've been dealt enough knocks to develop a realistic understanding of the world and its workings, and therefore I know, dearest Lily. Penelope took her hand and pressed it between her own. Since I was a little girl, I've always thought of you as the most beautiful, most courageous, most everything, but not practical. Never practical. Lily withdrew her hand and regarded her younger sister in amazement. It seemed that Penelope wasn't going to be as cooperative as she had expected. Well, the plan still had to be carried out. It was for Penny's own good, whether or not she admitted that she needed to be rescued. I don't want to talk about myself, she said abruptly. I want to talk about you. Of all the swains in London, there must have been someone you preferred over Rayford. She arched her brows meaningfully. Such as Lord Stamford, hmm? Penelope was quiet for a long time, her thoughts seeming to drift to some faraway place. A wistful smile appeared on her face. Dear Zachary, she whispered. Then she shook her head. My situation is settled. Lily, you know that I have never asked you for anything. But I am asking you now, from the depths of my heart, please do not take it into your head to help me. I am going to abide by Papa and Mamma's decision and marry Lord Rayford. It is my obligation. She snapped her fingers, as if a new idea had occurred to her. Why don't we direct our attention toward finding a husband for you? Good God! Lily wrinkled her nose. I have no use for men. Of course, they can be great fun on a hunting field and in the gaming room. But other times, oh, men are too bloody inconvenient. Greedy, demanding creatures. I can't abide the thought of being at someone's beck and call and being treated as a forward child instead of a woman with her own opinions. Men are useful if one desires a family. Like all proper young girls of her station, Penelope had been taught that bearing children was a woman's most laudable role. The words gave Lily an unpleasant sensation, stirring up painful emotions. Yes, she said bitterly. They are certainly helpful in producing children. You don't wish to be alone forever, do you? Better that than to be some man's pawn. Lily didn't realize she had spoken aloud until she saw the confusion on Penelope's face. Giving her a quick smile, Lily fumbled for a shawl draped over a chair. May I borrow this? 
I believe I'll go exploring. Perhaps take a stroll outside. It's rather stuffy in here. But Lily... We'll talk more later, I promise. I... I'll see you at supper, dear. Hurriedly, Lily left and strode through the hall and down the ornate staircase, not caring where she was going. Ignoring her sumptuous surroundings, she kept her head down. My God, I've got to be careful, she whispered. Lately, her self-control had been stretched to its limits, and she wasn't guarding her words carefully enough. Wandering through the great hall, she found herself in a gallery at least one hundred feet long, illuminated with the light from a row of glass doors. Through the well-polished glass, she could see a formal garden with smooth green lawns and bordered paths. A brisk walk was just what she needed. Flinging the shawl around her shoulders, Lily went outside, relishing the cool bite of the breeze. The garden was magnificent, dignified and lush, divided into many sections by precisely trimmed yew hedges. There was a chapel garden with a tiny stream and a small round pool filled with white lilies. It opened into the rose garden, a multitude of flowers surrounding a large and rare Ayrshire rose bush. Lily walked along a garden wall covered with vines and climbing roses. She ascended a series of weathered steps that led to a terrace overlooking an artificial lake. Nearby was a fountain surrounded by a pride of a dozen strutting peacocks. There was an aura of absolute serenity in the garden. It seemed like an enchanted place where nothing bad could ever happen. Her attention was drawn by a planting of fruit trees on the east side of the estate. The sight of them reminded Lily of the lemon garden of the Italian villa where she had lived for two years. She and Nicole had spent most of their time in the garden, or in the many-columned lodger at the back of the little house. Sometimes she had taken Nicole for walks in the shady wooded Bosco nearby. Don't think of it, she whispered fiercely. Don't. But the memory was as clear as if it had happened yesterday. She sat on the rim of the fountain and gathered the shawl more closely around her body. Blindly, she turned her face toward the distant woods beyond the lake, remembering. Domina, Domina, I've brought the most wonderful things from the market. Bread and soft cheese and good wine. Help me gather some fruit from the garden, and for lunch we'll... Lily stopped as she became aware of the unnatural silence in the caseta. Her cheerful smile faded. She set the basket down by the door and ventured into the little house. Like the local women, she was dressed in a cotton skirt and a full-sleeved blouse, her hair covered with a large kerchief. With her dark curls and her flawless accent, she was often mistaken for a native Italian. Domina? she asked cautiously. Suddenly, the housekeeper appeared, her wrinkled, sun-weathered face covered with tears. She was in disarray her grey hair escaping from the narrow braid coiled around her head. <gasps> Signorina, she gasped, and began to speak so incoherently that Lily couldn't understand her. She put her arm around the elderly woman's round shoulders and tried to soothe her. Domina, tell me what's happened. Is it Nicole? Where is she? The housekeeper began to sob. Something had happened. Something too dreadful for words. Was her baby ill? Had she been hurt? Terrified, Lily let go of Domina and raced toward the stairs that led to the nursery. Nicole, she called. Nicole, Mama's here. It's all... Signorina, she is gone. Lily froze with her foot on the first step, her hand gripping the banister. She looked at Domina, who was trembling visibly. What do you mean? she asked hoarsely. Where is she? It was two men. I could not stop them. I tried, Dio mio, but they took the baby away. She is gone. Lily felt as if she were in the middle of a nightmare. Nothing was making sense. What did they say? she asked in a queer, thick voice. Domina began to sob, and Lily swore at her, rushing forward. Damn you! Don't cry! 
Just tell me what they said. Domina stepped back, frightened by Lily's contorted face. They said nothing. Where did they take her? I do not know. Did they leave a note, a message? No, signorina. Lily stared into the elderly woman's streaming eyes. It's not happening. It's not. Frantically, she ran to the nursery, stumbling to her knees and bumping her shins, not feeling the pain. The little room looked the same as usual. Toys scattered on the floor, a ruffled dress draped over the arm of a rocking chair. The crib was empty. Lily pressed one hand over her stomach and the other up to her mouth. She was too frightened to cry, but she heard her own voice in a wrenching scream. No! Nicole! No! With a start, Lily recalled herself to the present. It had been more than two years since then. Two years. Bleakly, she wondered if Nicole still remembered her. If Nicole were even still alive. The thought caused her throat to tighten until she could hardly breathe. Perhaps, she thought miserably, this was to be the punishment for her sins, to have her baby taken from her forever. But the Lord had to be merciful. Nicole was so innocent, so blameless. Lily knew that if it took the rest of her life, she would find her daughter. Alex had never seen one small woman eat so heartily. Perhaps that was the source of her unflagging energy. With dainty precision, Lily downed a plateful of ham and Madeira sauce, several spoonfuls of potatoes and boiled vegetables, pastry and fresh fruit. She laughed and chattered all the while, the warm light casting a glow over her animated face. Several times, Alex was chagrined to find himself staring at her. It bothered him greatly, his fascination with her and the puzzle she presented. No matter what the subject of conversation, Lily had something to add to it. Her knowledge of hunting, horses, and other masculine subjects gave her a certain rough-and-tumble appeal. But when she exchanged society gossip with Totty, she sounded as sophisticated as any woman in the Beaumont could ever hope to be. Most perplexing of all, there were moments, brief to be sure, when she displayed an artless charm that far eclipsed her younger sister. Penny will be the most exquisite bride London has ever seen, Lily exclaimed, causing her sister to giggle modestly. Then she glanced at Totty Riley. I'm glad that you'll finally have the grand wedding you dreamed of giving, Mama, especially after the years of torment I've caused you. You haven't been completely tormenting, dear, and I still haven't relinquished my hopes of giving you a wedding some day. Lily kept her expression bland, but inwardly she laughed. May the devil take me before I become someone's wife, she thought grimly. She glanced at Alex who appeared to be absorbed in the plate of lukewarm food before him. The kind of man I would consent to marry is difficult to find. Penelope regarded her curiously. What kind is that, Lily? I don't know if there's a particular word to describe him, Lily said thoughtfully. Milksop, Alex suggested. Lily glared at him. From what I've observed... This business of marriage is far more advantageous for the man. The husband always has the whip hand, legally and financially, whereas the poor wife spends her best years bearing his children and seeing to his welfare, and then discovers herself to be as burnt out as an old candle. Wilhelmina, that is not so, Totty exclaimed. Every woman requires a man's protection and guidance. I don't. Really? Alex remarked his steady gaze pinning her to the chair. Lily writhed in discomfort as she returned his stare. Apparently, he had heard about her relationship with Derek Craven. Well, his opinion of her didn't matter a damned bit, and it was none of his business whether she had an arrangement with someone or not. Yes, really, she said coolly. But were I to marry, my lord, 
I would only have a man who doesn't equate strength with brutality. Someone who considers a wife a companion, rather than a glorified slave. Someone... Lily, that is enough, her father said, his face darkening. Above all, I desire peace, and you are creating a disturbance. You will keep your silence now. I'd like her to continue, Alex said calmly. Tell us, Miss Lawson, what else do you want in a man? Lily felt her cheeks begin to burn. There was a strange sensation in her chest, tautness and warmth and turbulence. I don't wish to continue, she muttered. I'm sure you all have the general idea. She put a bite of chicken in her mouth, but the succulent morsel suddenly had the texture of sawdust, and it was difficult to swallow. All seated at the table were silent, while Penelope's distressed gaze flickered back and forth between her fiancé and her sister. Although, Lily said after a moment, lifting her gaze to Totty's pink face, I'm becoming more settled in my advanced age, mother. It's possible that I could find someone willing to make certain allowances for me. Someone tolerant enough to endure my wild ways. She paused significantly. In fact, I think I may have found him. What are you talking about, dear? Totty asked. I may be receiving a caller in a day or two. An absolutely delightful young man, and a neighbour of yours, Lord Rayford. Totty registered immediate delight. Are you teasing, Wilhelmina? Is it someone I'm familiar with? Why haven't you mentioned him to us before now? I'm not certain how much there is to tell, Lily said coyly. And yes, you are familiar with him. It's Zachary. Viscount Stamford? Her family's astonishment caused Lily to grin. None other. As you know, I began a friendship with Zack after Harry and I left off. Through the years, we have cherished a certain fondness for each other. We get along famously. Lately, I have suspected that the feelings between us may have ripened. Perfect, she thought with pride. She had delivered the news in just the right tone. Casual, pleased, a touch bashful. It was on the tip of Alex's tongue to ask what her paramour, Derek Craven, thought of the situation, but he bit the words back. He considered what kind of pair they would make. Stamford was a harmless pup, without much of a spine. Lily would lead the poor fool around by his refined little nose. Lily smiled at Penelope apologetically. Of course, dear Penny, we all know that Zack entertained an interest in you for a while. But of late, Zack has begun to view me in a light he never has before. I hope you would not be disconcerted by the prospect of a match between us. There was a strange expression on Penelope's face, amazement battling with jealousy. Penny had never looked at her sister in such a way before. She managed to produce a valiant smile. It would please me if you were to find someone who could give you happiness, Lily. Zack would be quite a good husband for me, Lily mused. Although we'd have to work on his marksmanship. He's not quite the sportsman I am. Well, Penelope said with wan enthusiasm, Viscount Stamford is a gentle and thoughtful man. Yes, he is, Lily murmured. Penny, bless her, was easy to read. She was in shock at the thought that the man who had courted her so ardently was now considering marriage with her older sister. Everything was going to fall into place nicely. Glowing with satisfaction, Lily looked at Alex. I trust you have no objections to my receiving visitors, my lord? I wouldn't dream of interfering with any matrimonial prospect that comes your way, Miss Lawson. Who knows when there might be another? You're too kind, she replied sourly and leaned back as a servant ventured forth to remove her empty plate. Miss, miss, shall I fetch something from the kitchen? Perhaps a cup of tea? There was the sound of curtains being pulled. Lily stirred and groaned, climbing up from the soft depths of sleep. 
the glare of daylight was in her eyes. As she turned her head, she winced at the ache of sore muscles in her neck. What a wretched sleep she'd had, filled with strange dreams, some of them about Nicole. She'd been chasing after her daughter, trying to reach her, stumbling through endless hallways in unfamiliar places. The maid continued to pester her with tentative questions. Probably his odious lordship had sent his servants to wake her at some ungodly hour just for spite. Cursing Rayford silently, Lily rubbed her eyes and struggled to a sitting position. No, I don't want any tea, she muttered. I just want to stay in bed and... Lily broke off with a gasp as she saw her surroundings. Her heart thumped in fright. She was not in bed. She wasn't even in her room. She was... Oh, God. She was downstairs in the library, curled uncomfortably in one of the leather armchairs. The maid, a young woman with a wealth of red curls stuffed under a white cap, was standing in front of her, wringing her hands. Lily looked at herself, realising she was dressed in her thin white nightgown, no robe or slippers. She had gone to sleep last night in the guest room provided for her, and somehow she had ended up here. The problem was, she had no recollection of getting out of bed or coming down the stairs. She didn't remember any of it. It had happened again. Disoriented, Lily ran her palm over her sweat-beaded forehead. She could understand the situation, if she had been drinking. Oh, she'd done quite a few foolish things when she'd bought the sack, as Derek called it when she was tipsy. But all she'd had to drink last night was a few sips of liqueur after dinner, and that followed by a cup of strong coffee. It had happened on two other occasions. Once, when she had gone to sleep in the bedroom of her London terrace, and had awakened the next morning to find herself in the kitchen. And the time after that, Burton, the butler, had discovered her asleep in the parlour. Burton had assumed that she had been under the influence of strong drink, or some other intoxicant. Lily hadn't mustered the nerve to tell him she'd been as sober as a judge. Good Lord, she couldn't let anyone know that she roamed the house in her sleep. That wasn't the behaviour of a sane woman, was it? The maid was watching her, waiting for an explanation. I... I was feeling restless last night and came here for a drink, Lily said, twisting the folds of her nightgown in her fists. How, how silly of me to fall asleep right in this chair. The girl glanced around the room, obviously wondering about the absence of a glass. Somehow, Lily manufactured a light laugh. <laughs> I sat here to think about something, and then I went to sleep before I even got the bloody drink. Yes, miss, the maid said doubtfully. Lily ran her fingers through her tousled curls. A headache pounded in her temples and forehead. Even her scalp was sensitive. I believe I'll return to my room now. Have some coffee sent up, would you? Yes, miss. Gathering her nightgown around the front of her body, Lily crawled out of the large chair and left the library, trying not to stagger. She went through the entrance hall. There were clinking sounds of dishes and pots from the kitchen, voices of servants engaged in their early morning tasks. She had to get to her room before she was seen by anyone else. Clutching the hem of her nightgown in her hands, she flew up the stairs, her feet a pale blur. Just as Lily neared the top, she saw a dark, imposing figure. Her heart sank. It was Lord Rayford, going for a morning ride. He was dressed in riding clothes and gleaming black boots. Defensively, Lily pulled at the front of her gown, trying to conceal herself as much as possible. Rayford's assessing gaze seemed to shred her thin nightgown and detect every detail of her body underneath. What are you doing, traipsing through the house like that? He asked curtly. Lily was tongue-tied. On a sudden inspiration, she lifted her nose and stared up at him as haughtily as possible. Perhaps I was consorting with one of the servants last night. Shouldn't one expect such behaviour from a woman like me? There was silence. 
Lily endured his unfathomable gaze for an eternity, then tried to look away. It was impossible. Suddenly it seemed to her that instead of icy glints, his eyes were filled with sparks of intense heat. Although she stood there motionless, she had the sensation of the world careening around the two of them. She swayed slightly and placed her hand on the banister. When Rayford spoke, his voice was more gravelly than usual. If you're to stay under my roof, Miss Lawson, there'll be no displays of your well-used little body for the benefit of the servants or anyone else. Do you understand? His contempt was worse than a slap in the face. Well used. Lily drew in a quick breath. She couldn't recall ever hating anyone more in her life. Except, of course, Giuseppe. She wanted to fling a scalding retort at him. But suddenly, she was overwhelmed with the urge to flee. Understood, she said briskly, and rushed past him. Alex did not turn to watch her go. He descended the stairs with nearly the same speed as she had gone up them. Instead of walking toward the stables, he strode into the empty library and closed the door with such force that it shook in the door jam. He allowed himself several long, searing breaths. From the moment he had seen her in the filmy white gown, he had wanted her. His body was still rigid, trembling with arousal. He'd wanted to take her right then on the steps, bear her down to the carpet and push into her. Her hair, those damnable short curls that enticed his fingers to wind through them, the delicate whiteness of her throat, the small, tempting points of her breasts. Alex cursed and rubbed his shaven chin roughly. With Caroline, his desire had been mingled with tenderness and love. But this kind of wanting had nothing to do with love. He felt as if the surge of arousal had been a betrayal of his feelings for Caroline. Lily was more dangerous than he had suspected. He managed to stay in control of himself and everything around him, except when she was near. But he wouldn't yield to the temptation she presented. He wouldn't, by God, even if the effort killed him. Chapter 4 Zachary, dear, dear Zachary, how nice of you to call. Lily strode forward and clasped his hands, welcoming him into the mansion as if she were the lady of the manor. Standing on her toes, she lifted her face, and he kissed her cheek dutifully. In his black silk cravat and elegant riding clothes, Zachary was every bit the handsome country gentleman. Discreetly, the butler took Zachary's coat, gloves, and hat and withdrew. Pulling Zack to a corner of the entrance hall, Lily whispered in his ear, They're all taking tea in the parlour. Mother, Penny, and Rayford. Remember to act as if you're in love with me, and if you make eyes at my sister, I'll pinch you. Now come. Wait, Zachary whispered anxiously, tightening his hold on her. How is Penelope? Lily smiled. Don't look so worried. There's still a chance for you, old fellow. Does she still love me? Has she said so? No, she won't admit it, Lily said reluctantly. But she certainly doesn't love Rayford. Lily, I'm dying of love for her. Our plan must work. It will, she said with determination, slipping her hand into the crook of his arm. Now, off to battle. Together they strolled out of the entrance hall. Have I called at too late an hour? Zachary inquired, loudly enough that the occupants of the parlour could hear. Lily winked at him. Not at all, dearest. Just in time for tea. With a broad smile, she pulled him into the parlour. A beautiful and airy room with pale yellow silk walls, carved mahogany furniture and large windows. Here we are, she said lightly, all familiar with each other. No need for introductions. How convenient. Fondly, she squeezed Zachary's arm. I must tell you, Zach, that the tea at Rayford Park is excellent. Almost as good as the blend I serve in London. Zachary smiled as he regarded the room in general. 
Lily does serve the best tea I've ever tasted. She orders a secret blend that no one else can quite reproduce. I encountered it during my travels, Lily replied, seating herself in a delicate clawfoot chair. She sneaked a glance at her sister and was delighted to witness a brief but intense glance between Penny and Zachary. For just a moment, Penny's gaze was filled with sadness and hopeless longing. Poor Penny, Lily thought. I'll make everything right for you. And then perhaps you and Zack can prove to me that true love does exist. In a courtly manner, Zachary went to the settee, where Penelope and Totty were situated. Sensitive to Penelope's deep blush, he did not speak directly to her, but addressed her mother. Mrs. Lawson, it is a pleasure to see you and your lovely daughter. I trust all is well with you. Quite well, Totty replied in mild discomfort. In spite of her objections to Zachary's courtship of her daughter, she had rather liked him, and she had been aware, as everyone else had, that Zachary's love for Penelope had been sincere and honourable. But a family of limited financial means had to be practical. Lord Rayford was by far a more advantageous match for their daughter. Alex stood by the marble mantel of the fireplace and lit a cigar as he surveyed the proceedings. Lily glared at him. How impossibly rude he was. Gentlemen usually reserved their smoking for when they congregated to discuss masculine subjects of interest. Unless he were an irascible elderly gentleman puffing on a dignified pipe, Rayford should have smoked in private, not in the presence of ladies. Warily, Zachary nodded to Alex. Good afternoon, Rayford. Alex nodded and brought the cigar to his lips. As he exhaled a stream of smoke, his eyes narrowed into gleaming slits of silver. Surly beast, Lily thought darkly. He must feel threatened by the presence of a man so different from himself. A charming, gentlemanly fellow whom everyone liked. Rayford couldn't make himself likable even if he tried for a hundred years. She scowled at him and then directed a smile to Zachary. Come sit down, Zach, and tell us the latest happenings in London. Unbearably dull without you, as always, Zachary replied, taking the chair next to hers. But I did attend a large dinner party recently, and observed that Annabel is looking quite splendid since her marriage to Lord Deerhurst. Glad to hear it, Lily rejoined. She deserves to be happy. After enduring ten years of marriage to Sir Charles, the randy old goat, Wilhelmina, Totty gasped in dismay. How oh, could you call Sir Charles, may he rest in peace, such a dreadful name? How could I not? Annabel was only fifteen when she was compelled to marry him, and he was old enough to be her grandfather. And everyone knows that Sir Charles wasn't kind to her. Personally, I'm gratified that he passed on, in time for Annabel to find a husband of more suitable age. Totty gave her a disapproving frown. Wilhelmina, you sound quite heartless. Zachary reached over to pat Lily's hand as he came to her defence. You are rather forthright, my dear, but anyone who is acquainted with you knows that you have the most compassionate of hearts. Lily beamed at him. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw that her sister looked dumbstruck. Penelope could scarcely conceive that the man she loved was calling Lily my dear. Sympathy and amusement battled within Lily's chest. She wished she could tell Penelope that this was all a sham. I shall try to curb my tongue, Lily promised with a laugh. If only for this afternoon. Do go on with your news, Zack, and I'll refrain from spouting my shocking opinions. Let me pour your tea. Milk, no sugar, correct? While Zachary entertained them with his tales of London, Alex drew on his cigar and watched Lily. He was forced to concede there was a possibility the two were contemplating marriage. There was an easy familiarity between them that bespoke a long friendship. It was clear that they liked each other and were comfortable together. The advantages such a marriage would present were obvious. 
Zachary would certainly be appreciative of Lily's fortune, more sizable than what he would stand to inherit. And Lily was an attractive woman. In the sea-green gown she was wearing today, her skin took on a faint, rosy glow, and her dark hair and eyes were strikingly exotic. No man would find it a chore to bed her. Furthermore, in the view of society, Lily would be fortunate to land a man of such good family and character, especially after she had strayed along the edge of the demi-monde for so long. Alex frowned at the thought of the two of them together. It was all wrong. For all his thirty years, Zachary was still a guileless boy. He would never be the man in his own home, not with a wife as headstrong as Lily. Zachary would always find it easier to obey her wishes rather than argue with her. As the years passed by, Lily would come to feel contempt for her callow husband. This marriage was misery in the making. My lord? Lily and the others were looking at him expectantly. Alex realized that his thoughts had wandered, and he had lost track of the conversation. My lord, Lily said, I just asked you if the hole has been dug in the garden yet. Alex wondered if he had heard her correctly. Hole, he repeated. Lily looked extremely pleased with herself. Yes, for the new pond. Alex regarded her in dumbfounded silence. Somehow he regained his voice. What in hell are you talking about? Everyone seemed startled by his profanity, except for Lily. Her smile remained unaltered. I had a lovely conversation with your gardener, Mr. Chumley, yesterday afternoon. I gave him several ideas to improve the garden. Alex stubbed out his cigar and threw the butt into the fireplace. My garden doesn't need improvement, he snarled. It's been the same way for twenty years. She nodded cheerfully. Precisely my point. I told him that the style of your landscape is sadly outmoded. All the really fashionable gardens have several ponds all around them. I showed Mr. Chumley exactly where a new one must be dug. A flush of scarlet crept up from Alex's collar to his temples. He wanted to strangle her. Chumley wouldn't overturn a spoonful of dirt without asking my permission. Lily shrugged innocently. He seemed enthusiastic about the notion. I wouldn't be surprised if he's already begun digging. Really, I think you will adore the changes. She gave him a fond, sisterly smile. And whenever you walk by that dear little pond, perhaps you'll always think of me. Rayford's features contorted. He made a sound that resembled a roar as he stormed out of the parlour. Totty, Penelope, and Zachary all stared at Lily. I don't think he appreciated my idea, she remarked, looking disappointed. Wilhelmina, Totty said faintly. I know your efforts were well-intentioned. However, I do not think you should attempt to make any more improvements about Lord Rayford's estate. Suddenly, one of the cook maids, clad in a white apron and ruffled cap, appeared at the door of the parlour. Mum, cook wants to speak with you about the wedding feast, as soon as your ladyship has the time. She don't know what to make or what, from the soup to the trifle. But why? Totty asked, perplexed. She and I already agreed on those preparations, down to the last detail. There's no reason for confusion. Lily cleared her throat delicately. Mm, mother, it's possible that Cook wants to discuss the changes I suggested to the wedding menu. Oh dear, Wilhelmina, what have you done? Totty stood up and rushed from the room, her curls bouncing agitatedly. Lily smiled at Zachary and Penelope. Well, why don't the two of you pass the time together while I try to undo some of the havoc I've caused? Ignoring Penelope's weak protests, she slipped out of the parlour and closed the door. She rubbed her hands together and grinned. Well done, she said to herself, restraining the urge to whistle as she strode through the back gallery. Opening the French doors, she went out to the garden. 
wandering around hedges and well-tended trees. Lily enjoyed the clear day and the feel of the breeze in her curls. She took care to keep out of sight, especially when she heard the sound of voices. The ominous rumble of Rayford's tone resembled thunder. She had to hear what was going on. It was too great a temptation to resist. Lily sneaked closer, drawing behind a concealing yew hedge. But my lord, Chumley was protesting. Lily could picture his round face turning pink around his whiskers, the sunlight shining off his balding forehead. My lord, she did make the suggestion, but I would never undertake such a significant project without consulting you. I don't care what she suggests, significant or trivial. Don't do it, Rayford commanded. Don't so much as clip a twig or pull a weed at her request. Don't move a pebble. Yes, my lord, I certainly agree. We don't need any more damned ponds in this garden. No, my lord, we do not. Inform me if she tries to instruct you in your duties again, Chumley, and notify the rest of the staff that they're not to make any changes in their usual activities. I'm afraid of setting foot off my own estate. Next she'll have the entire mansion painted pink and purple. Yes, my lord. It seemed that Rayford's ranting had come to an end. The conversation concluded. Hearing the sound of footsteps, Lily shrank further into the protection of the yew. It would not do to be discovered. Unfortunately, a sixth sense must have alerted Rayford to her presence. Lily made no movement or sound, but still he looked around the hedge and found her. One moment she was smiling and silently congratulating herself, and the next she was staring into his scowling face. Miss Lawson, he snapped. Lily used her hand to shade her eyes. Yes, my lord. Did you ever hear enough, or should I repeat myself? Everyone within a mile could not help overhearing you, and if it reassures you, I would never dream of painting the mansion purple. Although... What are you doing out here? He interrupted. Lily thought rapidly. Well, Zachary and I had a... a slight altercation. I came out here to take the air and let my temper cool, and then... Is your mother with Stamford and Penelope? Well, I suppose she must be, she replied innocently. Rayford stared into Lily's eyes as if he could see past her carefully blank expression and read every thought. What are you up to? he asked in a murderous tone. Abruptly he turned and walked away from her, following the path to the house. Oh, no. Lily went cold, thinking that he might possibly catch Zachary and Penelope in some compromising situation. Everything would be ruined. She had to find some way to stop him. Wait, she cried, hurrying after him. Wait, wait. All at once her foot was caught in something, and she went flying to the ground with a shriek. With an oath, she twisted to see what had stopped her. A twisted tree root, arcing out of the ground. She tried to get to her feet, but a stab of pain went through her ankle, and she collapsed to the grass. Oh, bloody hell! Rayford's voice cut through her extravagant cursing. What is it? he demanded, having come back a few steps along the path. I turned my ankle, she said in furious surprise. Alex gave her a speaking glance and turned away. Damn you, I did, she shouted. Come and help me up. Surely even you must be enough of a gentleman to do that. Surely you have the teaspoonful of breeding required for that. Alex approached her making no effort to reach down for her. Which leg is it? Is it necessary for you to know? Sinking to his haunches, Alex flipped the hem of her skirts up to her stockinged ankles. Which one? This? No, the- Ow! Lily yelped in pain. What are you trying to- Ow! That hurts like the devil! Take your blasted hand away, you big hatchet-faced sadist! Well. It seems you're not shamming. Alex seized her elbows, lifting her to her feet. Of course I'm not. 
Why hasn't that deuced root been cut out of the ground? It's positively hazardous. He responded with a scorching glare. Are there any other changes to my garden you'd like to suggest? His tone was humming with suppressed violence. Prudently, Lily shook her head and kept her mouth closed. Good, he muttered, and they started back to the house. Awkwardly, Lily limped along beside him. Aren't you going to offer me your arm? He shoved his elbow at her. She took his arm, leaning her weight on the solid support. Lily did her best to hamper Rayford as they made their way back through the garden. She wanted Zachary and Penelope to have as much time alone as possible. Discreetly, Lily glanced at her companion. Some time after he had left the parlour, Rayford must have raked his hands through his golden hair, for the usually immaculate smoothness was ruffled and disordered. The humid air was making it curl on the back of his neck. A stray lock or two had fallen onto his forehead. Really, he had beautiful hair for a man. Walking so close to him, Lily became aware of the pleasant scent that clung to him. The mixture of tobacco and crisp starched linen and some appealing underlying fragrance she couldn't quite identify. In spite of the throbbing of her ankle, she was almost enjoying her stroll with him. That disturbed her so profoundly that she was compelled to stir up another argument. Must you walk so fast? she demanded. I feel as if we're in a frigging foot race. Blast it! If this worsens my injury, Rayford, I'll hold you accountable. Alex scowled but slowed his pace. You have a foul mouth, Miss Lawson. Men talk the same way. I don't see why I can't. Besides, all of my gentlemen friends admire my colourful vocabulary. Including Derek Craven? Lily was glad that he was aware of her friendship with Derek. It was good for him to know she had a powerful ally. Mr. Craven has taught me some of the most useful words I know. I don't doubt it. Must we plough ahead like this? I am not some obstinate mule to be dragged forth at such a relentless pace. Could we slow to a more reasonable speed? Incidentally, my lord, you reek of cigars. If it offends you, make your own way back. They continued to quarrel as they entered the house. Lily made certain that her voice was strong enough to echo through the gallery and the marble hall, alerting Penelope and Zachary to their return. As Rayford opened the parlour door and yanked Lily inside with him, they saw the star-crossed lovers sitting respectably far apart from each other. Lily wondered what had transpired between them during their moment of privacy. Zachary appeared to be in his usually good humour, while Penelope looked pink and flustered. Alex surveyed the two of them and spoke dryly. Miss Lawson mentioned something about an argument. Having risen to his feet at their entrance, Zachary gave Lily a bewildered glance. <laughs> My quick temper is legendary, Lily interceded with a laugh. I just had to dash out and clear my head. Am I forgiven, Zach? There's nothing to forgive, Zachary said gallantly, coming over to kiss her hand. Lily switched her hold on Alex's arm to Zachary's. Zach, I'm afraid you'll have to help me to a chair. I turned my ankle while I was strolling through the garden. She waved a hand disdainfully in the direction of Rayford's immaculately groomed landscape. A root was protruding from the ground, nearly as thick as a man's leg. A slight exaggeration, Alex said sardonically. Well, it was quite large nonetheless. With Zachary's help, she limped dramatically to a nearby chair and eased herself into it. We'll have to make a poultice, Penelope exclaimed. Poor Lily, don't move. She rushed from the room and headed towards the kitchen. Zachary began to question Lily in concern. How bad is the injury? Is the pain limited solely to your ankle? I'll be perfectly fine. She gave an exaggerated wince. But perhaps you would return tomorrow to check on my condition. Every day. Until you're better, Zachary promised.
Lily smiled over his head at Rayford, wondering if the grating sound she heard was his teeth gnashing together. By the next day, Lily's ankle felt almost like new, with only a twinge of discomfort as a reminder of having sprained it. The weather was unusually warm and sunny. In the morning, Zachary arrived to take her for a carriage ride, and Lily insisted that Penelope accompany them. Brusquely, Alex declined Penelope's half-hearted invitation to join them, electing to stay behind and attend some business about the estate. Needless to say, Lily, Penelope, and Zachary were all silently relieved at Alex's refusal. Had he participated in their outing, it would have made things rather tense. The threesome set off in an open-air carriage. Zachary handled the ribbons expertly, occasionally looking over his shoulder and grinning at the comments made by his two passengers. Lily and Penelope sat together, their smiling faces shaded by straw bonnets. They came to a fork in the road. At Zachary's suggestion, they took the less-travelled avenue until they reached a particularly beautiful section of country. Zachary pulled the carriage to a stop. They admired the wide green meadow before them, fragrant with violets, clover, and wild geraniums. How lovely, Penelope exclaimed, pushing an errant blonde curl away from her eyes. Might we go for a walk? I'd love to pick some violets for Mother. Hmm, Lily shook her head regretfully. I'm afraid my ankle still pains me a little, she lied. I'm not up to tromping through fields today. Perhaps Zachary would volunteer to escort you. Oh, I... Penelope looked at Zachary's serious, handsome face and blushed with confusion. I don't think that would be proper. Please, Zachary entreated. It would be my great pleasure. But unchaperoned... Come, we all know Zach's the perfect gentleman, Lily said and I will keep my eyes on the two of you the entire time. I'll chaperone from a distance. Of course, if you don't wish to walk, Penny, I would be delighted for you to sit here with me and admire the view from the carriage. Faced with the decision to walk unchaperoned through the meadow with the man she loved, or sit in the carriage with her sister, Penelope bit her lower lip and frowned. Temptation won out. She gave Zachary a small smile. Perhaps just a short walk. We'll return the very moment you desire, Zachary replied, and leapt eagerly from the carriage. Lily watched in fond amusement as Zachary helped Penny to the ground, and the two began a slow trek across the meadow. The two of them were perfect for each other. Zachary was an honourable young man, strong enough to protect her, yet boyish enough that he would never intimidate her, and Penny was exactly the sweet, innocent sort of girl that he needed. Putting her slippered feet up on the velvet upholstered seat, Lily reached for the basket of fruit and biscuits they had brought. She bit into a strawberry and tossed the green stem over the side of the carriage. Untying her bonnet strings, she let the sun shine on her face and reached for another strawberry. Once, long ago, she and Giuseppe had partaken of a picnic lunch in Italy, reclining in a meadow very much like this one. It had been in the days just before they had become lovers. At the time, Lily had thought herself to be quite sophisticated. It had been only later that she realised how stupidly naive she had been. Ah, oh, the country air is splendid, she had declared, leaning her bare elbows on a blanket and biting into a buttery, ripe pear. Everything tastes better out here. So, you tire of the jaded pleasures of the city, amore mio? Giuseppe's beautiful eyes, long-lashed and liquid black, regarded her with sensuous warmth. Society is as much a bore here as it is in England, Lily said reflectively, staring at the hot, green grass. Everyone's striving to be witty and sought after. Everyone talking, and no one listening. I listen, Carissima. I listen to everything you say. 
Lily turned and smiled at him, resting her weight on her elbow. You do, don't you? Why is that, Giuseppe? I am in love with you, he said passionately. She couldn't help laughing at him. <laughs> You're in love with every woman. Is that wrong? In England, perhaps. Not in Italy. I have special love to give every woman. Special love for you. He plucked a succulent grape and held it to her lips, while his eyes bore into hers. Flattered, feeling her heart beat faster, Lily opened her mouth. She took the grape between her teeth and smiled at him as she chewed. No man had ever pursued her with such ardent gentleness. There were impossible promises in his gaze, promises of tenderness, pleasure, desire, and while her mind refused to believe them, her heart desperately wanted to. She had been lonely for such a long time, and she wanted to know about the mystery that everyone else seemed to take for granted. Lily, my beautiful little English girl, Giuseppe murmured, I can make you happy, so very happy, Bella. You shouldn't say that. She looked away from him, trying to hide her flushed cheeks. No one can promise such a thing. Perché no? Let me try, Cara. Beautiful Lily, always with a sad smile. I make it all better. Slowly he bent to kiss her. The touch of his lips was warm, pleasant. It was in that moment Lily had decided that he would make a woman of her. She would give herself to him. After all, no one would expect or believe that she was a virgin. Her innocence mattered to no one. Looking back now, Lily had no idea why she had thought of men and love as such an alluring mystery. She had paid for her mistake with Giuseppe a thousand times over, and she would continue to pay the price for her sins. Sighing, she watched her sister walk with Zachary. They were not holding hands, but there was an air of intimacy about them. He's the kind of man who'll never betray you, Penny, she thought. And that, believe me, is a rarity. After Zachary had taken his leave, Penelope was radiant. However, something changed in the hours afterward. During supper, the sparkle was gone from her eyes, and she was pale and subdued. Lily wondered at her thoughts and feelings, but they had no opportunity to talk until late evening, when they were preparing for bed. Penny, she said, unhooking the back of her sister's gown, what is the matter? You've been so quiet all afternoon, and you barely touched your supper. Penelope walked to the vanity table and pulled the pins from her hair until a golden cascade fell to her waist. She looked at Lily, her gaze shadowed with misery. I know what you've been trying to do, but you must not arrange any further meetings between Zachary and me. It can lead to nothing, and it is wrong. Are you sorry for having been with him this afternoon? Lily asked contritely. I placed you in an awkward position, didn't I? Forgive me. No, it was wonderful, Penelope exclaimed, and then looked shamefaced. I shouldn't have said that. I don't know what is the matter with me. I'm so confused about everything. It's because you've always obeyed mother and father and done what's expected of you. Penny, you've never done a selfish thing in your life. You're in love with Zachary, but you're sacrificing yourself for the sake of duty. Penelope sat on the bed and lowered her face. It doesn't matter whom I'm in love with. Your happiness is the only thing that matters. Why are you so upset? Has something happened? Lord Rayford took me aside this afternoon, Penelope said dully, after we returned from the carriage drive. Lily's gaze sharpened. What? What did he say? He asked questions, and he implied that Zachary is not really your suitor that Zachary is behaving dishonourably in trying to court me by pretending an interest in my sister. How 
dare he say such a thing? Lily demanded in instant fury. It is true, Penelope said miserably. You know it is. Of course it is. I'm the one who thought of the plan in the first place. I thought so. But how dare he insult us by making such an accusation? Lord Rayford said that if Zachary had once been intent on marrying a girl like me, he would never want to marry one like you. Lily's frown deepened. One like me? Seasoned was the word he used, Penelope said uncomfortably. Seasoned? Lily paced around the room like a tigress. I suppose he doesn't think I'm desirable enough to catch a husband, she fumed. Well, other men find me quite attractive. Men who have more than ice water running through their veins. Oh, he's a fine one to criticise, when he's got more faults than I have time to list. Well, I'm going to fix everything. And by the time I'm through, Lily, please, Penelope entreated in a small voice. All this trouble distresses me terribly. Can't we let things be? Certainly, after I bring his lordship some much-needed enlightenment. No. Penelope held a hand to her forehead, as if the situation were too much for her to bear. You must not make Lord Rayford angry. I would be afraid for all of us. Did he threaten you? It was fortunate that Penelope could not see Lily's eyes, for there was a vengeful glow in them that would have frightened her. N not precisely, no. But he is such a powerful man, and I don't think he would tolerate any sort of betrayal. He is not a man to be crossed. Penny, if Zachary asked you to... No, Penelope said quickly, tears springing to her eyes. No. We must not discuss this any further. I won't listen. I can't. All right, Lily soothed. No more talking tonight. Don't cry. Everything will be fine. You'll see. Alex strode rapidly down the grand staircase. He was dressed in travelling clothes, a coat of fine blended wool, a tan poplin waistcoat, and cotton trousers. In response to a message he had received from a carrier the day before, it was necessary for him to travel to London. His youngest brother, Henry, was being expelled from Westfield. Feeling equal parts of anger and concern, Alex wondered what incident had prompted the expulsion. Henry had always been an energetic boy, full of mischief, but possessed of a good-natured disposition. There had been no explanation in the short note from Westfield's headmaster, only that the boy was no longer welcome at the school. Alex sighed heavily, thinking that he hadn't given the boy enough guidance. Whenever it had come time for discipline, he'd never had the heart to punish Henry for his misdeeds. Henry had been so young when his parents had died. Alex had been more of a father than a brother to Henry. He wondered if he had done well by the boy. Guiltily, Alex thought that he should have married years ago in order to provide a kind, maternal woman in Henry's life. Alex's thoughts were interrupted by the sight of a small figure clad in a nightgown hurrying up the staircase. Lily again, scampering through the house in next to nothing. He paused and watched her hasty ascent. Suddenly, she noticed him and stopped a few steps away. Looking up into his stern face, she groaned and held a hand to her head. Let's just ignore this, shall we? No, Miss Lawson, Alex said in a grating voice. I want an explanation of where you've been and what you've been doing. You won't get one, she mumbled. Alex contemplated her silently. It was possible she had been telling the truth before, that she was indeed involved in a tete-a-tete -tete with one of the servants. She had the appearance of it, dressed in a nightgown, barefooted, her face haggard, and her eyes dark-circled, as if she were exhausted after a night of debauchery. He didn't know why the thought enraged him. Usually he didn't give a damn what others did, so long as they didn't inconvenience him. 
all he was conscious of was a bitter taste in his mouth. The next time this happens, he said coldly, I'll pack your bags personally. In London, a lack of morality is something to be admired, but it won't be tolerated here. Lily held his gaze defiantly, then continued up the staircase, muttering some obscenity sotto voce. What did you say? he asked in a soft growl. She threw a saccharine smile over her shoulder. I wished you a perfectly splendid day, my lord. Retreating to her room, Lily requested a bath to be prepared. Efficiently, the maids filled the porcelain-rimmed tub in the adjoining dressing room. One of the girls stoked the fire in the little fireplace and set the towels on a nearby warming rack. Lily declined their assistance after that. Easing into the tub, she idly splashed water over her chest. The walls were papered with scenery in the Chinese style, illustrated with hand-painted flowers and birds. The porcelain fireplace mantelpiece was decorated with dragons and pagodas. Outmoded, she would bet her last farthing that the wall had last been papered at least two decades ago. If I had my way around here, there would be some changes made, she thought, and submerged herself, head and all, in the steaming water. Coming up with dripping hair, she finally allowed herself to think about what was happening to her. This sleepwalking business was occurring more frequently. Yesterday, she had awakened in the library, this morning in the parlour, in back of the settee. How had she come to be there? How had she managed to descend the stairs without mishap? She might have broken her neck. She couldn't allow this to continue. Frightened, Lily wondered if she should begin tying herself to the bed each night. But how would that appear to anyone who might discover her? Well, Rayford certainly wouldn't be surprised, she thought, and giggled nervously. He probably thought of her as the most depraved woman alive. Perhaps she should try drinking before bedtime. If she were drunk enough, no. That would be the fastest course to ruin. She had seen it too many times in London, where people destroyed themselves with strong drink. Perhaps if she consulted a physician and asked for sleeping powders. But what if he declared her to be a madwoman? God knew what would happen to her then. Lily ran her fingers through her wet hair and closed her eyes. Perhaps I am insane, she muttered clenching her hands into dripping fists. It would drive any woman mad to have her child taken from her. After an industrious scrubbing of her hair and skin, Lily rose from the bath and patted herself dry with a length of towel. She donned a white lace-trimmed shift, embroidered cotton stockings, and a cotton gown printed with tiny pink flowers. The dress made her appear nearly as young as Penelope. Sitting before the fire, Lily ran her fingers through her damp curls and considered what her plan for the day should be. First, she said with a snap of her fingers, I'll have to convince Rayford that Zachary is courting me, not Penny. That will throw him off the scent. Miss? She heard a puzzled voice. The maid was standing in the door of the dressing room. Did you say, no, no, pay no heed. I was just talking to myself. I came to collect the soiled linens. You may take my nightgown and have it washed. Oh, and tell me where Lord Rayford is. I wish to speak with him. He's gone to London, miss. London? Lily frowned. But why? For how long? He told Silver he'd be back tonight. Well, that's a quick journey. What could he possibly accomplish in so short a time? Nobody knows what he went for. Lily had a feeling the maid knew something she wasn't telling. But Rayford's servants were close-mouthed and quite loyal to their master. Rather than press the issue, Lily shrugged indifferently. Westfield was built on one of the three heights to the northwest of London. In good weather, it was possible to stand on the hill and obtain a view of nearly a dozen counties. The most venerable of public schools, Westfield, had produced great politicians. 
artists, poets, and military men. As a youth, Alex had been a student there. Although he had memories of the strict discipline of the masters and the tyranny of the older boys, he also remembered the high-spirited days of close friendship and mischief. He had hoped that Henry would do well at the place, but evidently that was not to be the case. Alex was shown into the headmaster's office by a sullen-looking boy. Dr. Thornwait, the headmaster, stood up from a large, multi-drawed desk and greeted him without smiling. Thornwaite was a lean man with stringy white hair, a narrow, grooved face and bushy black brows. His tone was thin and disapproving. Lord Rayford, I would like to express my relief that you've come to collect our culprit. He is a young man of dangerously volatile temperament, quite unsuitable for Westfield. During this little speech, Alex heard his brother's voice behind him. Alex! Henry, who had been seated on a wooden bench against the wall, rushed toward him with a few quick strides, then checked himself, trying to look chastened. Unable to prevent a grin, Alex grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and pulled him near. Then he held Henry back, regarding him closely. Why does he say you're dangerous, boy? A prank, Henry confessed. Alex smiled ruefully at that. Henry did have a lively sense of fun, but he was a fine boy, one that any man would be proud of. Although short in stature for a lad of twelve, Henry was husky and strong. He excelled in sports and mathematics and concealed a secret love for poetry. Usually, an infectious smile danced in his intense blue eyes and his white blonde hair required frequent combing to restrain its unruly waves. To make up for his lack of height, Henry had always been daring and assertive, the leader of his group of friends. When he was in the wrong, he was always quick to apologize. Alex couldn't imagine what Henry had done to require expulsion. Gluing the pages of a few school books, no doubt, or balancing a pail of water on top of a partially opened door. Well, he would soothe Thornwaite's ire, apologize, and convince him to allow Henry to stay. What sort of prank was it? Alex asked, looking from Dr. Thornwaite to Henry. Thornwaite was the one to answer. He blew up the front door of my home, he said sternly. Alex stared at his brother. You did what? Henry had the grace to look away guiltily. Gunpowder, he confessed. The explosion might have caused serious injury to me, Thornwaite said, his spidery brows drawing low over his eyes. Or to my housekeeper. Why? Alex asked in bewilderment. Henry, this isn't like you. On the contrary, Dr. Thornwaite remarked. It is typical of him. Henry is a boy of rebellious spirit, resentful of authority, unable to accept discipline in any form. Bugger you if I ain't, Henry shot back, glaring at the headmaster. I took all you had to give and more. Thornwaite regarded Alex with a, you see, expression. Gently, Alex took the boy by his shoulders. Look at me. Why did you blow up his door? Henry remained obstinately silent. Thornwaite began to answer for him. Henry is the kind of boy who doesn't... I've heard your opinion, Alex interrupted, giving the headmaster a freezing glance that silenced him immediately. He looked back at his brother, his gaze softening. Henry, explain it to me. It don't matter, Henry mumbled. Tell me why you did it. Alex said in a warning tone. Now, Henry glared at him as he answered reluctantly. It was the flogging. You were flogged? Alex frowned. For what reason? Any reason you could think of. A flush came over Henry's face. With a birch, a rod, they do it all the time, Alex. He threw a mutinous glance over his shoulder at Thornwaite. One time I was a minute late for breakfast. 
Once I dropped my books in front of the English master. Once my neck wasn't clean enough. I've been thrashed near three times a week for months, and I'm damn sick of it. I mete out the same punishment to other boys with similar rebelliousness, Thornwaite said crisply. Alex kept his face expressionless, but inside he was roiling with fury. Show me, he said to Henry, his voice clipped. Henry shook his head, his face reddening even more. Alex, show me, Alex insisted. Looking from his brother to the headmaster, Henry sighed heavily. <sighs> Why not? Thornwaite's seen it enough by now. He turned, reluctantly removed his jacket, fumbled at his waist, and dropped his breeches a few inches. Alex stopped breathing as he saw what they had done to his brother. Henry's lower back and buttocks were a mass of welts, scabs, and bruises. Such treatment would not be considered usual or necessary by anyone, not even the strictest disciplinarian. The floggings had not been done for the sake of discipline. They had been done by a man who got perverse pleasure from inflicting pain on others. The thought that this had been done to someone he loved. Trying to control his rage, Alex raised a shaking hand to his jaw and rubbed it roughly. He dared not look at Thornwaite, or he'd kill the bastard. Henry jerked up his breeches and turned back to face him. His blue eyes widened as he saw Alex's cold eyes and rapidly twitching cheek. It was entirely justified. Dr. Thornwaite said in a self-righteous tone. Flogging is a normal part of the Westfield tradition. Henry, Alex interrupted unsteadily. Henry, did they do anything to you besides the flogging? Did they hurt you in any other way? Henry looked at him in confusion. No, what do you mean? Nothing. Alex motioned to the door with a jerk of his head. Go outside he said quietly. I'll be right there. Henry obeyed slowly, glancing back with unconcealed curiosity. As soon as the door closed, Alex strode to Dr. Thornwaite, who instinctively backed away. Lord Rayford, flogging is an accepted method of teaching the boys. I don't accept it. Roughly, Alex seized him and shoved him back against the wall. I'll have you arrested the headmaster gasped. You can't, can't what? Kill you as I'd like to? Perhaps not. I can come damn close to it, though. Gripping his collar, Alex held him up until Thornwaite's toes barely grazed the floor. He relished the faint choking sound coming from the headmaster's scrawny throat. Thornwaite's blurring vision was filled with Alex's steely eyes and snarling white teeth. I know what kind of perverted bastard you are, Alex sneered, taking out your frustrations on boys. It satisfies you to whip some poor lad across the backside until you draw blood. You're not fit to be called a man. I'll bet you enjoy the hell out of beating my brother and the other innocents in your care. D discipline, Thornwaite managed to gasp painfully. If any permanent damage results from your so-called discipline, or if Henry reveals that you've abused him in other ways, you'd better flee before I can get my hands on you. Alex gripped Thornwaite's throat then, pressing inward as if he were molding clay. The man writhed and gurgled in terror. Alex waited until the headmaster's face turned grey. Or I'll have your head stuffed and mounted on Henry's bedroom wall he growled, as a memento of his days at Westfield. I think he'd like that. He let go of Thornwaite suddenly, allowing him to collapse to the floor. The headmaster choked and wheezed. Wiping his hands on his coat in distaste, Alex opened the office door with such force that it slammed against the wall and the bolt fell from one of the hinges. Finding Henry out in the hall, he took the boy by the arm and began walking rapidly. Why didn't you come to me about this? he demanded. Henry struggled to match his long strides. I don't know. Suddenly, 
the memory of Lily's accusations about his being unapproachable and unfeeling rang in Alex's ears. Was it possible there had been some truth in her words? He scowled darkly. Did you think I wouldn't be sympathetic? That I wouldn't understand? You should have told me about this long ago. Hang it, Henry mumbled. I thought it might get better here, or that I could take care of it myself. By setting off explosives? The boy was silent. Alex sighed grimly. Henry, I don't want you to take care of things yourself. You haven't come of age yet, and you're my responsibility. I know that, Henry said in an offended tone. But I knew you were occupied with other things, like the wedding. Damn the wedding! Don't use it as an excuse. What do you want from me? The boy asked hotly. Gritting his teeth, Alex forced himself to stay calm. I want you to understand that you're to come to me when you're having trouble. Any kind of trouble. I'm never too busy to help you. Henry nodded shortly. What are we going to do now? We're going home to Rayford Park. Really? The thought nearly brought a smile to the boy's face. My things are still at the boarding house. Anything important? Not really. Good. We're leaving everything here. Will I have to come back? Henry asked with dread. No, Alex said emphatically. I'll employ a tutor. You can study with the local boys. Giving a whoop of joy, Henry tossed his school cap in the air. It fell on the floor behind them and lay there unretrieved as they walked out of the school together. Shh! I think he's coming. Having observed Rayford's carriage moving up the drive, Lily had yanked Zachary away from the music room. He, Totty and Penelope had been happily involved in singing hymns and playing the piano. Lily, tell me what you're planning. My guess is that Rayford will come to the library for a drink after travelling all day. And I want him to see us together. Energetically, Lily pulled Zachary to a heavy leather chair. She threw herself into his lap and clapped her hand over his mouth as he protested. Quiet, Zach. I can't hear a thing. Tilting her head, Lily listened intently to the sound of approaching footsteps. A heavy, measured tread. It had to be Rayford. She took her hand from Zachary's mouth and wound her arms around his neck. Kiss me and make it look convincing. But Lily, must we do this? My feelings for Penny. It doesn't mean a thing, she said impatiently. But is it necessary? Do it, damn it! Meekly, Zachary complied. The kiss was like any other Lily had ever experienced, which was to say, unremarkable. Heaven knew why the poets conspired to describe something vaguely distasteful as such a rapturous experience. She tended to agree with the writer Swift, who had wondered, what fool it was that first invented kissing. But couples in love seemed fond of the custom, and Rayford must be made to think she and Zachary were enamoured of each other. The library door opened. There was a scorching silence. Lily touched Zachary's fine brown hair, trying to look involved in the passionate kiss. Then she raised her head slowly, as if becoming aware of the interruption. Rayford was there, looking rumpled and dusty from his travels. A scowl was gathering on his bronzed face. Lily grinned impudently. If it isn't Lord Rayford, with his usual cheerful countenance. As you can see, my lord, you've intruded on a private moment between... Abruptly she stopped, as she noticed the boy standing next to Rayford. A short, blonde boy with inquiring blue eyes and the beginnings of a smile. Well, she hadn't counted on anyone besides Rayford witnessing her embrace with Zachary. Lily felt herself blush. Miss Lawson, Alex said, his expression thunderous. This is my younger brother Henry. Hello, Lily managed to say. Meeting her wan smile with an interested gaze, the boy wasted no time with small talk. 
Why were you kissing Viscount Stamford if you're going to marry Alex? Oh, I'm not that, Miss Lawson, Lily replied hastily. You're referring to my poor, that is, to my younger sister. Realizing she was still on Zachary's lap, she leapt away and nearly fell on the floor. Penny and Mother are in the music room, she said to Alex, singing hymns. Alex gave a curt nod. Come, Henry, he said flatly. I'll introduce you to Penelope. Appearing not to hear him, Henry wandered over to Lily, who was straightening her gown. Why is your hair chopped like that? he asked. Lily laughed at the description of her fashionable style. It got in the way, hanging in my eyes when I went hunting and shooting. Do you hunt? Henry stared at her in fascination. It's dangerous for women, you know. Lily glanced at Rayford and found he was staring at her. She couldn't prevent a teasing grin. Why, Henry, your brother said the same thing to me when we first met. Their gazes held. Suddenly, there was a betraying tug at the corner of Alex's mouth, as if he were holding back a wry smile. My lord, Lily said impishly, don't worry that I'll be a bad influence on Henry. I'm much more of a danger to older men than to younger ones. Alex rolled his eyes. I believe you, Miss Lawson. Ushering Henry from the room, he left without a backward glance. Lily did not move. She was flooded with confusion, her heart thumping irregularly. The look of him, all tired and disheveled, the protective hand he had placed on his small brother's shoulder, all of it had made her feel strange. She was not the kind of woman who would fuss over a man, and yet she had a sudden wish that someone would smooth his hair, order a light supper for him, and make him confess what had put the troubled look in his eyes. Lily, Zachary questioned, do you think he believed our kiss was genuine? I'm certain he did, she replied automatically. Why wouldn't he? He's a very perceptive man. I'm getting bloody tired of the way everyone overestimates him, Lily said. Immediately, she was sorry for sounding so sharp. It was just that she was astonished by the image that had come to mind. Her willful imagination had conjured a picture of herself embracing Rayford, feeling his hard mouth against hers, his blonde hair underneath her hands. The idea made her stomach tighten. Unconsciously, she raised a hand to soothe the prickling on the back of her neck. She had been held by him only once, when she had fallen during the Middleton hunt and Rayford had picked her up and nearly strangled her. The power in his hands and the violence in his face had frightened her. She doubted he had ever shown that side of himself to Caroline Whitmore. Lily was immensely curious about the mysterious Caroline. Had she loved Rayford, or had she agreed to marry him because of his inordinate wealth, or perhaps his aristocratic lineage? Lily had heard that Americans were quite impressed with titles and blue blood. And what had Rayford been like around Caroline? Was it possible he had been warm and smiling? Had Caroline made him happy? The unanswered questions annoyed Lily. She rebuked herself silently. It didn't matter what Rayford's lost love had been like. All that was important was that she rescue Penelope from him. Alex bid the tutor goodbye and sighed as the man left. The man, a Mr. Hodgkins, was the fourth he had interviewed for the position of Henry's tutor. So far, none of them had been satisfactory. He guessed that it would take some time before he found a tutor with the right balance of discipline and understanding to suit Henry's needs. Between that and the meetings he had held for the last few days with irate tenants, Alex had been busy. The tenants were angry because of the damage done to their crops by an abundance of marauding hares and rabbits. At the same time, his gamekeeper had informed him, with some distress, that the amount of poaching had increased considerably. "'Tisn't bad that they poached the rabbits, sir,' the gamekeeper said, 
but this trapping and poaching at night, and this interfering with the pheasants breeding. There will not be pheasant to shoot this year. Alex resolved the problem by offering to compensate the tenants for their damaged crops if they would restrict their illegal poaching, which they refused to admit doing in the first place. In the meanwhile, he'd had meetings with some of the district agents for his Buckinghamshire property, discussing their rent collecting and other aspects of estate management. You should appoint a full-time steward, Lily had remarked to him after eavesdropping on some of the discussions. Other men of your position do? I know how to manage my own affairs, Alex said brusquely. Of course. Lily had given him a flippant smile. You prefer to do everything yourself. You'd probably like to go and personally collect rent from each of your tenants, if you could but find the time. I'm rather amazed you don't sweep and polish the floors in the mansion and knead the bread dough in the kitchen. Why appoint a servant to do it when you're perfectly able? Alex had snapped at her to mind her own business, and she had called him a medieval tyrant. Privately, he had considered her point. Much of the work he did could be handled just as well by subordinates. But what if he did manage to make more time for himself? What would he do? Spend it with Penelope? Although they were perfectly civil to each other, he and Penelope found no great enjoyment in each other's company. There were the options of gaming, hunting, parties, and politics in London. It all seemed a great bore. Alex supposed he could renew some old friendships. In the past two years, he had avoided the company of his closest acquaintances, especially those who had known Caroline and expressed sympathy over her death. Alex hadn't been able to stand the pity in their eyes. Frustrated, moody, Alex went to visit Penelope, who clung to her mother like a shadow. He tried to converse with them, drinking a cup of the tepid tea they offered. Shyly, Penelope glanced at him while she did embroidery work on a tambour frame, drawing coloured silk through fabric using a delicate hook. She looked maidenly and refined as her soft hands moved deftly over the white muslin. After a few minutes in the cloying atmosphere, he escaped with a mutter about needing to do more work. The sound of laughter and shuffling cards echoed from the long gallery. Curiously, he went to investigate. Alex's first thought was that Henry had a friend visiting. Two small figures were sitting cross-legged on the polished floor playing cards. One of them was clearly Henry's square-shouldered form, but the other... the other... Alex scowled as he recognised her. Not only was Lily dressed in her raspberry breeches, she had borrowed one of Henry's shirts and vests. Purposefully, Alex strode to the gallery, intending to upbraid her for the wildly inappropriate attire. As he reached them, his eyes flickered over Lily and he swallowed hard. The way she was sitting, the breeches were stretched tautly over her thighs and knees, showing the slim shape of her legs. God help him, she was the most distracting woman he had ever met. In his time, he had known many seductive females, had seen them dressed and undressed, in sumptuous evening gowns and in gauzy wisps of nothing, naked in the bath, in French silk undergarments tied with narrow ribbons. But nothing had ever tantalised like the sight of Lily Lawson in breeches. Alex felt his colour deepening, his body tightening, filling with arousal. Desperately, he struggled to bring an image of Penelope to mind. When that failed, he searched deeper for a memory of Caroline. But he couldn't see Caroline's face. Hell, he could barely remember it. There were only the points of Lily's knees, the top of her curly, dark head, the nimble movements of her fingers as she fanned a deck of cards. It was a battle to keep his breathing regular. For the first time, he couldn't recall the exact sound of Caroline's voice or the shape of her face. It was all drowned in a soft haze. 
his traitorous senses were drawn to Lily, whose vibrant beauty was the focus of all the light in the gallery. Lily acknowledged Alex with a brief glance, her shoulders tensed as she waited for some negative remark. When none was forthcoming, she continued her demonstration. Expertly, she cut and riffled the cards. Now look, Henry, she said. Just push this group of cards straight through the other group, and they come out the same as before. And you see, the ace is still on the bottom. Henry laughed and took the deck to practice the manoeuvre. Alex watched the boy finger the cards. Do you know what they do to card sheets? he asked. Only to bad ones, Lily replied, before the boy could reply. Good ones are never caught. She indicated a space on the floor next to them, as graciously as a lady offering a chair in an elegant parlour. Care to join us, my lord? I'll have you know I'm breaking one of my strictest rules by teaching your brother my best tricks. Alex lowered himself to the floor beside her. Should I be grateful? he asked dryly, turning my brother into a cheat. Lily grinned at him. Certainly not. I merely want this poor lad to be aware of the ways in which other people could take advantage of him. Henry exclaimed in self-disgust as his fingers slipped and the cards scattered over the floor. That's all right, Lily said, leaning over to scoop up the cards. Practice, Henry. You'll have it in no time. Alex couldn't stop himself from staring at Lily's neatly rounded bottom as she industriously collected the scattered deck. A new flood of response went through him, turning the surface of his skin hot. He pulled the edges of his coat together over his lap. He should get to his feet and walk away this very instant. But instead, he stayed in the sunlit gallery, sitting on the floor near the most maddening woman he had ever known. Henry shuffled the cards together. What about my tutor, Alex? Alex dragged his attention from Lily. I haven't found anyone suitable yet. Good, the boy said emphatically. The last one looked like a freak pig. Alex frowned. A what? Lily leaned toward Henry conspiratorially. Henry, don't use the new words Auntie Lily taught you until Alex is gone. Without thinking, Alex caught hold of Lily's slim upper arm. Miss Lawson, you're aptly demonstrating all the reasons I didn't want you near him. Startled by his touch, Lily glanced at him quickly, expecting a cold frown. Instead, she saw a rueful, boyish smile that caused her heart to give an extra little thump. How odd that making him smile would give her such a sense of accomplishment. Her brown eyes laughed into his, and she directed another comment to Henry. Do you know why your brother hasn't found a tutor yet? He won't be satisfied until he's hired Galileo, Shakespeare and Plato all rolled into one. I do pity you, my boy. Henry screwed his face into an appalled grimace. Alex, tell her it's not true. I have certain standards, Alex admitted, dropping his hand from Lily's arm. Finding a qualified tutor is taking more time than I anticipated. Why don't you let Henry choose? Lily suggested. You could attend to your other business while he conducts the interviews. Then he would present his choice for your approval. Alex snorted sardonically. I'd like to see what kind of tutor Henry would choose. I believe he would be quite responsible in his decision. Besides, it's going to be his tutor. I think he should have some say in it. Henry appeared to consider the question thoughtfully. His blue eyes met Alex's. I'd pick a smashing one, Alex. Damn me if I wouldn't. The idea was unorthodox. On the other hand, the responsibility might be good for Henry. He supposed there would be no harm in trying it. I'll consider it, Alex said gruffly. But the ultimate approval will be mine. Well, Lily said in satisfaction. It appears you can be reasonable at times. She took the cards from the boy, 
shuffled them deftly, and placed the deck on the floor. Would you care to cut, my lord? Alex stared at her intently. He wondered if this was how she looked in Craven's club, her brown eyes gleaming with a mischievous invitation, her slim hand pushing back the curls that dangled on her forehead. She would never be a demure, proper wife to anyone. She would be an engaging playmate, with the wiles of a courtesan, a combination of gambling sharp and hellcat. She was a hundred different things, none of which she needed. What's the game? he asked. I'm instructing Henry on the finer points of Vingt-et-un. A challenging grin appeared on her lovely face. Do you consider yourself competent at the game, Rayford? Slowly, he reached for the deck and cut it. Deal. Chapter 5 Lily discovered, with consternation, that Rayford was adept at cards. More than adept. In order to beat him, it was necessary for her to cheat. She used the pretext of giving further instructions to Henry in order to peek surreptitiously at the top card of the deck. Occasionally, she dealt seconds, or from the bottom. Once or twice, she used special shuffling to stack the deck, something she had learned from Derek after hours of practice in front of a mirror. If Rayford was suspicious, he kept his silence. That was, until the game was nearly over. Now this, Lily said to Henry during the last hand, is a two-way hand in which the ace could either be valued at one or eleven. Your best strategy is to try for a high count. If that doesn't work, value the ace at one. Following her directions, Henry flipped a card and grinned in satisfaction. Twenty, he said. No one can beat that. Unless, Alex remarked dryly, Miss Lawson somehow produces a natural. Warily, Lily glanced at him, wondering if he had caught on to her cheating. He must have. There could be no other explanation for his resigned expression. With a few flicks of her fingers, the last card was dealt, and the game concluded. Henry wins that hand, she said cheerfully. Next time we'll play for money, Henry. Not a chance in hell, Alex said. Lily laughed. Don't get in a foam about it, Rayford. I only intended to wager a shilling or two, not bilk the poor boy out of his inheritance. Henry stood up and stretched with a faint groan. Next time let's play at a table sitting on chairs, he suggested. This floor is bloody hard. Alex looked at him with immediate concern. How are you? I'm fine. Henry smiled as he understood Alex's worry. It's fine, Alex. Really. Alex nodded, but Lily noticed the same troubled expression in his pale eyes that had been there the night before. It remained, even after Henry left, with a rather stiff gait. What is it? Lily asked. Why did you ask Henry? Miss Lawson, Alex interrupted, rising to his feet and reaching down for her. I've never seen a woman cheat with such skill. She was momentarily diverted. Years of practice, she admitted modestly. Suddenly, Alex grinned, amused by her complete lack of shame. His white teeth flashed in his golden face. Taking her small hand in his, he pulled her to her feet. He slid a quick glance down her slim body. I suppose it was necessary for you to win against a twelve-year-old boy. That wasn't my purpose. You were the one I wanted to beat. Why? That was a good question. It shouldn't have mattered whether she won or lost a game with him. Uncomfortably, Lily returned his silvery stare, heartily wishing she could stay indifferent to him. It just seemed the thing to do. It might be interesting to try an honest game some day, he remarked, if you're capable of it. Let's play at honesty right now, my lord. The loser must answer any question the winner poses. Deftly, she cast two cards on the floor. 
one coming to rest face up at his feet. A seven. The other card settled in front of her. A queen. Alex surveyed Lily's down-bent head as she glanced at the cards. She was standing close to him. Suddenly, he imagined clasping her head in his hands, dipping his face down to crush his mouth and nose into her sable curls, breathing in her perfume, her skin. He imagined sinking to his knees, pulling her hips forward until he was lost in the warmth of her body. Feeling himself begin to flush and torten, he tried to banish the forbidden image from his mind. He struggled for self-discipline. When she looked up at him, he was certain she would be able to recognize the shameful turn of his thoughts. Strangely, she seemed to notice nothing. Another? Lily asked. He nodded. She took the top card from the deck with exaggerated care and dropped it to the floor. A ten. Stay, he said. With a flourish, Lily drew the next card for herself and grinned as she saw it was a nine. I win, Rayford. Now tell me why you looked so worried for Henry just now. No, tell me why you brought him home from school. Was it his marks? Is he having... That's three questions so far, Alex interrupted sardonically. And before I answer, I want to know why you're so interested. I like the boy, Lily replied with dignity. I'm asking out of sincere concern. He considered that. It was possible she was telling the truth. She and Henry did seem to get along well together. It wasn't his marks, he said brusquely. Henry was in some trouble. Tardiness. Mischief, the usual things. The headmaster disciplined him. Alex's jaw hardened. Flogging. Lily stared at his averted face. His features were especially harsh at that angle, giving him the appearance of a golden satyr. That's why he walked so stiffly at times. It was bad, wasn't it? Yes, it was bad. His voice was gruff. I wanted to kill Thornwaite. I still do. The headmaster? In spite of her loathing of anyone who could commit such cruelty against a child, Lily almost pitied the man. She suspected Thornwaite would not get off lightly for what he'd done. Henry retaliated by lighting a pile of gunpowder underneath Thornwaite's front door, Alex continued. Lily laughed at that. I would have expected no less of him. Her amusement died quickly as she studied Alex's implacable face. But you're disturbed about something else. It must be that Henry didn't tell you about what had been happening. She read the answer in his silence. All at once she understood. Alex, with his unreasonable sense of responsibility for everyone and everything, would take all the blame upon himself. Obviously, he doted on the boy. This would be the perfect opportunity for her to twist the knife and make him feel worse than he already did. Instead, she found herself trying to ease his guilt. I'm not surprised, she said matter-of-factly. Most boys of Henry's age are extremely proud, you know. Don't try to claim that you weren't when you were young. Of course, Henry would try to handle things himself. He wouldn't want to run to you like a child. From what I've observed, that is the way boys think. What would you know about boys? He muttered. She gave him a chiding glance. It's not your fault, Rayford. Much as you'd like to shoulder the blame, you have too much of a conscience. It nearly matches the size of your ego. What I need is a lecture from you about conscience, he said caustically. But he looked at her without the usual animosity, and the pale grey depths of his eyes caused a strange feeling to ripple through her. Miss Lawson, he gestured to the deck she held. Would you care to play another hand of truth? Why? Smiling, Lily flipped another couple of cards to the floor. What question would you like to ask, my lord? He continued to stare at her. 
Lily had the startling feeling that even though they were standing apart, he was touching her. He wasn't, of course, but still she had the suffocated sensation that plucked notes of warning in her memory. Yes, she had felt this way with Giuseppe, threatened, dominated. Alex ignored the pretext of the cards, the game, and watched her intently. Why do you hate men? He couldn't stop himself from asking. The curiosity had built with every word he had heard her speak, every wary glance she had given him, her father, even Zachary. She kept a distance between herself and every man that came near. With Henry, however, Lily was different. Alex could only surmise that Henry was too young for Lily to consider a threat. His instincts told him that Lily had been taken advantage of in the past, often enough that she had come to regard men as enemies to be used and manipulated. Why do I? Lily's voice drifted into shocked silence. Only Derek had ever been able to disarm her so completely with a few words. Why would he ask such a thing? Certainly he had no personal interest in her feelings. He must have asked, because he had sensed, somehow, that it would hurt her, the bastard. And he was right. She did hate men, although she had never before put it into words, spoken or otherwise. What should she find so frigging wonderful about them? Her father had ignored her. Her fiancé had jilted her. Giuseppe had abused her hard-won trust. Men had taken her child. Even her friendship with Derek, such as it was, had started as blackmail. Devil take the lot of them. I've had enough of games this afternoon, she said, and dropped the deck, letting it scatter. Turning quickly, she left the gallery. She heard Alex's footsteps behind her. He reached her in three long strides. Miss Lawson! He caught at her arm. She whirled around, violently flinging off his hand. Don't touch me, she hissed. Don't ever touch me again. All right, he said quietly. Calm yourself. I had no right to ask. Is that some sort of apology? Her chest heaved with the force of her anger. Yes. Alex hadn't expected to hit a raw nerve with his question. Even now. Lily was struggling to control herself. Usually, she was so brashly confident. For the first time, she seemed fragile to him, a volatile woman living with some terrible strain. It was uncalled for. Bloody right about that! Lily raked her hand through her hair until the curls fell in a wild tangle over her forehead, her searing eyes locked onto his unreadable face. She couldn't seem to hold back a tumble of accusing words. But here's your damned answer. I have yet to meet a man worthy of trust. I've never known a so-called gentleman with the slightest understanding of honesty or compassion. You all like to bray about your honour, when the truth is... Abruptly, she closed her mouth. When the truth is, Alex repeated, wanting her to finish. He wanted to know at least this one small part of the complexity. God, it would take at least a lifetime to understand her. Lily gave a small, determined shake of her head. The forceful emotions seemed to drain away magically, by a self-will that Alex suddenly understood was an equal match for his own. She regarded him with an insolent smile. Bugger off, my lord she said lightly, and left him there in the gallery, strewn with scattered cards. Something about that morning started a piercing ache in Lily's head that wouldn't go away. She spent the day in Totty and Penelope's company, half listening to their ladylike conversation. In the evening, she excused herself from supper and nibbled on cold beef and bread from a tray in her room. After downing two glasses of red wine, she changed for bed and lay down to rest. The silk damask bed hangings draped down from a circle overhead, shrouding her in shadow. Restlessly, she changed position, 
shifting to her stomach and curving her arms around the pillow beneath her. Loneliness filled her chest with a cold, heavy weight. She wanted someone to talk to. She wanted to unburden herself. She needed Aunt Sally, the only one who had known about Nicole. With her salty wisdom and unorthodox sense of humour, Sally had been able to handle any predicament. She had assisted the midwife at Nicole's birth and had taken care of Lily as tenderly as a mother. Sally, I want my baby, Lily whispered. If only you were here, you'd help me figure out what to do. The money's all gone. I have no one. I'm becoming desperate. What am I going to do? What? She remembered going to Sally and confessing in a storm of misery and shame that she had taken a lover, and from that one night of illicit passion, a child had been conceived. At the time, she had thought that was the worst that could happen to her. Sally had comforted her with common sense. Have you considered giving the babe away? Sally had asked. Paying someone else to rear it? No, I wouldn't do that. Lily had replied tearfully. The baby is innocent. He or she doesn't deserve to pay for my sins. Then if you plan to keep the child, we'll live quietly together in Italy. Sally's eyes had been bright with anticipation. We'll be a family. But I couldn't ask that of you. You didn't. I offered. Look at me, Lily. I'm a rich old woman who can do as she pleases. I have enough money to suit our needs. We won't give a fig for the rest of the world and its hypocrisy. To Lily's sorrow, Sally had died soon after the baby was born. Lily had missed her, but she had found solace in her baby daughter. Nicole was the centre of her world, filling every day with love and wonder. As long as she had Nicole, everything was all right. Lily felt tears seep from her eyes, the pillow absorbing the hot moisture. The ache in her head spread to her throat as she began to cry silently. She had never broken down in front of anyone, not even Derek. Something about Derek wouldn't allow her to be vulnerable. Derek had seen too much suffering in his lifetime. If he once might have been moved to sympathy by a woman's tears, that ability had left him long ago. Miserably, Lily wondered who was with Nicole, and who, if anyone, comforted her when she cried. Alex stirred and groaned in his sleep, caught in the grip of a tormenting dream. Somehow he knew it wasn't really happening, but he couldn't wake up. He sank deeper into a world of mist and shadow and movement. Lily was there. Her mocking laugh echoed all around him. Her gleaming brown eyes stared into his. With a smile of wicked amusement, she held his gaze as she lowered her mouth to his shoulder and lightly bit at his skin. He snarled and tried to push her away but suddenly her naked body was entwined with his. His mind swam with the sensation of her silky limbs sliding over him. Show me what you want, Alex, she whispered with a knowing smile. Get away from me, he said hoarsely, but she didn't listen, only laughed softly. And then he grasped her head in his hands and pushed it down to where he wanted her mouth. There. Alex awoke with a violent start, breathing in rough, unsteady gasps. He dragged his arm over his forehead. The roots of his hair were damp with sweat. His body was aching with arousal. Swearing in a guttural tone of frustration, he took a pillow, strangled and twisted it, and threw it across the room. He wanted a woman. He'd never been so desperate. Trying to ignore his hammering pulse, Alex cast his mind back to when he'd last slept with a woman. Not since before his betrothal to Penelope. He felt he owed her his fidelity. He'd thought a few months of celibacy wouldn't kill him. Idiot, he told himself savagely. Idiot! He had to do something. 
He could go to Penelope's room right now. She wouldn't like it. She would protest and cry. But Alex knew he could bend her to his will. He could bully her into allowing him into her bed. After all, they would be married in a matter of weeks. The idea made sense. At least, it did to a man who was dying of frustration. But the thought of making love to Penelope. His mind recoiled from the notion. It would bring him some measure of relief, of course. No, that wasn't what he wanted. She wasn't what he wanted. What the hell is wrong with you? Alex asked himself savagely and leapt from his bed. He yanked the window hangings aside to allow the gleam of moonlight in the room. Striding to the wash basin set on a tripod stand, he poured some cool water and splashed it on his face. His thoughts had been muddled for days, ever since he'd met Lily. If only he could ease the fire inside him. If only he could think clearly. He needed a drink. Cognac. No, some of the good Highland whiskey his father had always stocked, distinctively pale, tasting of smoke and heather. He wanted something that would set his throat on fire, burn out the thoughts that were torturing him. Pulling on a quilted blue robe, Alex strode from the bedroom. He went through the columned hall that connected the east wing to the grand central staircase. His steps slowed as he heard the betraying creak of one of the steps. He stopped and tilted his head, waiting in the darkness. Creak. There it was again. Someone was descending the stairs. He knew exactly who it was. A grim smile crossed his face. Now was his opportunity to catch Lily in a clandestine meeting with one of the servants. He would use the excuse to throw her out of the house. With Lily gone, things would return to the way they had been before. Stealthily, Alex made his way to the side of the balustraded corridor. He caught a glimpse of Lily below in the domed central hall. The hem of her thin white nightgown trailed gently behind her as she drifted across the marble floor. She was going to meet a lover. Gracefully, she wandered in what seemed to be a mood of dreamy anticipation. Alex was conscious of a bitter sensation seeping through him like poison. He tried to identify the feeling, but its precise nature was obscured in a mixture of anger and confusion. The thought of what Lily was about to do with another man made him want to punish her. Alex went to the staircase and froze. What was he doing? The Earl of Rayford, renowned for his moderate, sensible ways, sneaking around his own house in the dark, nearly wild with jealousy. Yes, jealousy, over the attics of a little madcap and her midnight trysts. How Caroline would have laughed. To hell with Caroline. To hell with everything. He was going to stop Lily. He'd be damned if she was going to have her pleasure tonight. Purposefully, he descended the stairs and fumbled at the small porcelain and wood table in the entrance hall where a lamp was always kept. Lighting the lamp, he turned it to a soft glow. He ventured in the direction Lily had gone, toward the ground floor kitchen. As he passed the library, the sound of whispers floated through the door which had been left ajar. Alex's brows lowered in fury as he heard Lily murmuring something that sounded like, Nick, Nick. Alex flung the library door open wide. What's going on? His gaze swept the room. All he could see was Lily's small form curled in a chair. She had wrapped her arms around herself. Miss Lawson, he walked closer. The lamplight gleamed in Lily's eyes and cast a golden shimmer on her skin and revealed the shadows of her body beneath the gown. She was twitching and rocking, her lips forming silent words. There were furrows in her forehead, lines that seemed to have been carved from intense misery. A sneer pulled at the corner of Alex's mouth. She must have realized he was following her. You little fraud, he muttered. This play-acting is beneath even you. She pretended not to hear him. Her eyes were half-closed, 
as if she were caught in a mysterious trance. That's enough, Alex said, and set the lamp on a nearby table. With rising annoyance, he realized that she intended to ignore him until he left her. I'll drag you out of here if necessary, Miss Lawson. Is that what you're hoping for? A scene? As she refused to even look at him, his endurance snapped. He seized her narrow shoulders, giving her a hard shake. I said that's enough. There was an explosion of movement that astonished Alex. Lily gave an animal cry and struck out blindly, springing from the chair. She stumbled back against the table and nearly overturned the lamp. In a quick reflex, Alex kept her from falling as he reached out and grabbed her. Even then, her panic didn't cease. Alex jerked his head back to avoid the frantic swipe of fingers curled into claws. Although she was a small woman, her wild struggles were difficult to contain. Somehow, he managed to crowd her against him, crushing her flailing arms between them. She flinched and went rigid, breathing in rapid pants. Alex slid his fingers through her thick curls and forced her head against his shoulder. He muttered a string of curses and tried to soothe her. Christ, Lily, it's all right. Lily, relax, relax. The heat of his breath sank through her hair to her scalp. He kept his hold on her tight enough that only the slightest movement was possible. She was too disoriented to speak coherently. He tucked her head under his chin and began to rock her gently. It's me, he murmured. It's Alex. Everything's all right. Easy. Lily regained herself slowly, as if she were waking from a dream. The first thing she became aware of was being held in an inexorable grip. Her cheek and chin were pressed against the opening of a quilted robe, where the brush of wiry hair tickled her skin. A pleasant, masculine scent stirred her memory. It was Rayford, holding her in his arms. Her breath caught in amazement. His hand moved in a slow stroke on her back. She wasn't used to being touched so familiarly, not by anyone. Her first instinct was to wrench away from him, but the circling motion was gentle softening the brittle tension of her body. Alex felt the shift of Lily's weight as she accepted his support. She was light and lithe against him, her small frame trembling with aftershocks. There was a tugging, twisting sensation inside him, alarming in its sweetness. The pronounced silence of the room seemed to enclose them. Rayford? Easy. You're not steady yet. What happened? she croaked. I forgot the old maxim, he said dryly. Something about waking a sleepwalker. So he had found out. Oh, God, what would happen now? She must have betrayed her fear, for he began to rub her back again, as if she were an overwrought child. This is what happened the other nights, isn't it? His palm moved down the delicate ridge of her spine. You should have told me. And give you the idea to put me in some as asylum, she replied shakily, making a move to push herself away. Be still. You've had a shock. She had never heard his voice so gentle. It didn't seem to be his voice at all. Lily blinked in confusion. She had never been held like this before. Giuseppe, with all his impetuous passion, hadn't even held her this long during their lovemaking. She felt uneasy, helpless. The situation was beyond her imagination. Lord Rayford, clad in a robe, no starch, buttons, or cravats anywhere in sight. The chest under her head was like the timbered side of a frigate ship, while his muscled legs were impossibly hard against hers. The beat of his heart resonated in her ear. What would it feel like to be so invincible? He must not be afraid of anyone. Do you want a drink? Alex asked quietly. He had to let go of her. Either that, or sink to the floor with her. He was hovering on the brink of disaster. She nodded against his chest. Brandy. Somehow she mustered the strength to pull away from him. She lowered herself into a leather armchair, 
while Alex went to the corner cupboard where the liquor was kept. He poured a small amount of cognac into a glass. In the light of the lamp, his hair shone with the gold luster of a doubloon. As she watched him, Lily bit at her lower lip. So far, she had known him as an arrogant, judgmental figure, the last man in the world she would accept help from. But for one astonishing moment, she had felt all his strengths around her. She had felt safe and protected. He was her enemy, she reminded herself silently as he approached. She must remember that. She must remember. Here. Alex pressed the glass into her hands and sat nearby. Lily sipped the drink. The brandy had a light taste, unlike the fruitier distillations Derek always stocked. The mellow liquor had a steadying effect on her. Lily drank slowly and glanced at Alex, who hadn't moved his gaze from her. She couldn't quite work up the courage to ask if he intended to tell anyone what had happened. He seemed to read her thoughts. Does anyone else know? Know about what? she parried. His mouth tightened impatiently. Does it happen often? Staring into the brandy glass, she swirled it in feigned absorption. You're going to talk to me, Lily, he said grimly. You may call me Miss Lawson, she shot back. And while I'm certain you're quite curious about my nocturnal habits, it's none of your concern. Do you understand that you could hurt yourself? Or someone else? Just now you nearly knocked the lamp over and started a fire. That was because you startled me. How long has this been going on? Lily rose to her feet and glared at him. Good night, my lord. Sit down. You're not leaving until you give me some answers. You may sit here as long as you wish. I'm going upstairs to my room. She walked toward the door. Alex reached her instantly, spinning her to face him. I'm not through with you yet. Take your hands off me. Who's Nick? Alex knew he had hit a vulnerable spot when he saw her eyes widen to dark pools of fear. Nick, he repeated in a low jeer. Some man you're keeping company with? A lover? Does your cher ami Craver know about Nick? Or have you... With a muffled sound, Lily threw the brandy into his face. Anything to make him stop. Anything to silence the stabbing words. Don't say that name again. The brandy trickled down Alex's face in golden rivulets, bright drops sliding down the harsh grooves that were carved from his nose to his mouth. Not only Craven, but a lover on the side, he sneered. I suppose a woman like you would think nothing of crawling from one man's bed to another's. How dare you accuse me? At least I can find my infidelities to the living. His face went pale while Lily continued recklessly. You're planning to marry my sister, even though you're still in love with Caroline Whitmore, a woman who died years ago. It's morbid, not to mention unfair to Penelope, and you know it. What kind of husband will you be to my sister, you obstinate brute, when you'll insist on living in the past for the rest of... Lily stopped as she realized she'd gone too far. Alex's face looked like a death mask. Once, she had read a few lines that would have described him perfectly. More fierce and more inexorable far than empty tigers or the roaring sea. His eyes bored into hers with an intensity that terrified her. He was going to kill her. The brandy glass dropped from her nerveless hand and fell to the thick Savonnerie carpet with a thump. The sound broke Lily's paralysis. She turned to flee, but it was too late. Alex had caught her. There was nothing she could do but writhe helplessly as he jerked her head back. No, she whimpered, thinking he might break her neck. Instead, his mouth came down hard on hers, his fingers gripping her nape to hold her still. Lily stiffened in surprise and pain. Her lips were ground against her teeth until the taste of blood mingled with brandy. There was no way to break free. She closed her eyes and clenched her teeth. Suddenly, Alex lifted his head with a groan. His grey eyes were hot and radiant, his tanned skin burnished with rising colour. One by one, his fingers unclenched from her nape, 
Almost tentatively, he moved his thumb over her bruised lip. You bloody bastard! Lily cried, childishly spiteful. She writhed as he bent his head again. No! He took her lips in a savage movement, sealing off all sound and breath, suffocating her until she inhaled deeply through her nostrils. She made a move to free herself, but Alex gathered her close, tight, his hand sliding down her back and moulding her hips to his. He shaped her mouth with bites and nudges and sought the silkiness inside, his tongue delving in hot surges. Helplessly, she shoved at his powerful body, dislodging the blue rope from his shoulder. Her palm came against the hair-roughened surface of his chest. Underneath her fingers, a driving pulse seemed to burn through her hand. He made a sound in his throat and cupped his hands around her head, holding her steady for the deep push of his tongue. His breath rushed hotly against her cheek. Only half conscious of what he was doing, Alex moved down to her throat, rubbing his mouth over her skin. His body was shaking with passion. The past years of loneliness seemed to melt away into nothing more than a dark dream. Feverishly, he buried his lips against her soft shoulder. I won't hurt you, he muttered, his breath burning through her gown. No, don't pull away, Carol. The syllables fell so softly on her ears that it took Lily several seconds to realize what he'd said. She froze. Let go, she spat. Abruptly, she was set free. Her dazed eyes flew to his face. Alex looked as confounded as she was. They each backed away a step. Lily shuddered, crossing her arms over her chest. Alex passed an unsteady hand over his jaw, wiping away the moist traces of brandy. Aroused and ashamed, he fought the urge to reach for her once more. Lily, she spoke rapidly, not meeting his eyes. It was my fault. Lily, no. She didn't know what he intended to say. She just knew that she couldn't listen. It would be disastrous. This didn't happen. None of it. I, I, good night. She disappeared from the room in a flurry of panic. Alex shook his head to clear the red mist of passion and made his way to the chair. He sat down heavily. Finding his hands were clenched, he opened them and stared into his empty palms. Caroline. What have I done? You poor fool, he could almost hear Caroline's laughing voice say. You thought you could hold on to me forever. You planned to marry a sweet innocent like Penelope, and then you would never have to let me go, as if the memories would always be enough for you. The memories are enough, he said stubbornly. Why have you always considered yourself above ordinary human weakness, Above grief and loneliness, you think you need less than other men, and the truth is you need more, much more. Stop it, he groaned, clasping his head in his hands, but Caroline's mocking shadow voice persisted. You've been alone for so long, Alex. It's time to go on. I am going on, he said raggedly. I'll make a new beginning with Penelope. God help me. I'll learn to care for her. I'll make myself... Alex stopped suddenly, realizing he was talking to himself like some poor mad fool, holding an imaginary conversation with a ghost. He lifted his head and stared unseeing into the empty fireplace. He had to get rid of Lily, if only to preserve his own sanity. Lily crawled into bed and pulled the covers high under her neck. She couldn't stop shivering. How could she face Rayford after this? She could feel herself turning scarlet, even in the darkness of her room. How could he have done that to her? What was the matter with her? Grinding her hot face into the pillow, she remembered his mouth against hers, his arms locked around her body. He had whispered Caroline's name. Humiliated, strangely hurt, Lily rolled over and groaned. 
she had to settle things between Zachary and Penelope and leave Rayford Park as soon as possible. She couldn't manage Rayford as she did other men, using her sarcasm, temper, or charm. He was impervious to those things, just as Derek was. She was beginning to understand some of what Rayford concealed behind that implacable face. From his reaction to her mention of Caroline, she knew he had never come to terms with her death. He never would. All his love had been given to Caroline. She'd taken it to the grave with her. For the rest of his days, Rayford would be haunted by her. He would resent every woman for not being Caroline. An innocent like Penelope would spend her life trying to please him and find only misery in the effort. Oh, Penny, she whispered, I must get you away from him. He'll grind you into dust without even meaning to. Contrary to his expectations, Zachary was not announced to Lily upon his arrival at Rayford Park. Instead, he was shown to the library, where the Earl of Rayford awaited him alone. Rayford? Zachary questioned, shocked by his appearance. Alex was sprawled in a chair, his thighs spread wide. A half-drained liquor bottle was balanced on his knee. The golden copper of his skin was pallid. Dark circles rimmed his eyes. Hard, bitter lines were etched on his face. The smell of whiskey was rank in the air, as was the acrid odour of tobacco. He was smoking heavily, and had been for some time, if the thick haze in the room was anything to judge by. His fingers were curled loosely around a cigar. Zachary doubted that many people had ever seen Rayford in such a condition. Some terrible misfortune must have befallen him. I... Is something wrong? Not at all, Alex said brusquely. Why do you ask? Hastily, Zachary shook his head and cleared his throat a few times. <clears throat> no reason. I thought perhaps... <clears throat> you look a little tired. I'm fine, as always. Yes, of course. <clears throat> I'm here to see Lily, so perhaps I'll just sit. Drunkenly, Alex waved a hand toward a leather chair. Zachary complied nervously. A shaft of morning sunlight came through the window and brightened his ash-brown hair. Have a drink, Alex said, blowing out a stream of smoke. Zachary squirmed. Actually, I make a habit of avoiding strong drink until late afternoon. So do I. Alex lifted the glass to his lips and took a sloshing swallow. He studied his companion with a calculating stare. They were contemporaries, Alex thought, and yet Zachary hardly looked older than his brother Henry. The telling daylight illuminated Zachary's boyish face. The clear skin and the brown eyes filled with youthful dreams and idealism. He was so damned suitable for Penelope. Anyone with a modicum of intelligence could see it. Alex scowled. Caroline was gone. If the fates wouldn't allow him to have the woman he loved, he'd be damned if he'd let Zachary have Penelope. Alex's alcohol-soaked brain acknowledged that his attitude was selfish, cruel, pointlessly vengeful. But he didn't care. He didn't care about anything. Except maybe one thing. One little thing that had been bothering him for some reason. Who was Miss Lawson engaged to? he demanded gruffly. Zachary appeared to be confused by his abruptness. You're referring to the, uh, episode ten years ago, when Lily was engaged to Hindon? Hindon who? Lord Hindon's son Harry? Yes, Harry. That cocky little dandy who stares into every looking-glass he passes by. Alex gave a scornful laugh. That was her great love. I should have guessed she'd pick someone with more vanity than intelligence. And he was a friend of yours? At the time, yes, Zachary admitted. Hinden had a certain charm. What did she do to make him jilt her? Zachary lifted his shoulders in a defensive shrug. It wasn't anything in particular. Oh, come, Alex sneered. 
She must have deceived him in some way, or publicly humiliated him, or actually, she did deceive him, though it wasn't intentional. Lily was quite young back then, very eager and trusting, and naive. She fell in love with Hinden for his handsomeness, without realizing that he was a man of exceedingly shallow character. In order to attract Hinden, Lily concealed her intelligence and her strong will, charming him by acting like a feather brain. I don't believe it was a conscious plan to deceive him. She just naturally adopted the qualities that she sensed he would admire. But eventually Hinden discovered what she was really like. Yes, he began to realize it in the months after he had proposed to her. Hinden behaved with utter dishonor. He jilted her not long before the wedding. Lily was devastated. I offered for her instead, but she refused me. She said she was destined never to marry. Her aunt took her abroad for a number of years. They lived in Italy for a time. Alex concentrated on his cigar, his golden lashes lowered, concealing his thoughts. When he spoke, his voice was quieter than before. She must have cut quite a swathe across the continent. No, she disappeared, actually. Years passed, and no one heard from her. Something happened to her in Italy, but she's never told a soul about it. All I'm certain of is that Lily came to some sort of grief there. When she reappeared in England two years ago, I could see how she had changed. Zachary frowned thoughtfully. There's a sadness in her eyes that never leaves. She's a worldly, unique woman, with courage that few men could match. Zachary said something else, but Alex didn't hear. He stared at the wholesome young man sitting across from him and remembered the sight of Lily kissing Zachary in the library, a blatant attempt to convince him they were lovers. Instead, the scene had demonstrated beyond a doubt that they shared nothing more than platonic friendship. While Lily had cuddled on Zachary's lap and kissed him, he had sat there passively, his arms held stiffly at his sides, hardly the behavior of a man embracing the woman he loved. If he had been in Zachary's place, Alex dismissed the forbidden thought and pinned Zachary with a brooding stare. Lily's a cunning little actress, but not good enough. I say, you're quite off the mark. Lily is genuine in everything she says and does. It's clear you have no understanding of her. No, it's clear you don't. And you're similarly mistaken about me, Stamford. If you think I've been fooled by the infantile charade you and Miss Lawson have been putting on for my benefit. What? I don't understand. You're not in love with Lily, Alex said sardonically. How could you be? Oh, I'll grant you have some sort of liking for her, but you're also afraid of her. Afraid? Zachary turned purple. Of a woman not half my size. Let's be frank, Stamford. You're a gentleman of the first water. You're incapable of hurting anyone, save to defend your principles. Lily, on the other hand, would do anything to get what she wants. Anything. She doesn't have principles, and doesn't respect them in others. You'd be a fool not to fear her. You're her friend one moment, her pawn the next. Don't think I intend any insult to you. I feel a certain sympathy for you. Damn your sympathy, Zachary spluttered. Penelope, on the other hand, is what every man dreams of. A girl with an appearance and bearing that are nothing short of angelic. You freely admit you were once in love with her. Once, but no longer. You don't lie well. Stamford. Alex crushed out his cigar and smiled cruelly. Forget, Penelope. Nothing is going to stop this marriage. I advise you to attend the first few balls of the season. There you can choose from dozens of girls just like her. Pretty, innocent girls, all eager to learn of the world and its temptations. For what you want, any one of them will suffice. Zachary shot up from his chair. 
He looked as if he were torn between pleading with Alex or calling him out. Lily once said much the same thing to me. Apparently, neither of you are able to see what I do in Penelope. It's true she doesn't have much courage, but she is hardly some empty-headed doll. You're a selfish blackguard, Rayford. For what you've just said, I should... Zachary. Lily's voice interrupted. She was standing in the doorway, looking calm and determined. Her face was drawn, her eyes just as weary and smudged as Alex's. No more, she said to Zachary with a faint smile. It's time for you to leave. I'll take care of this. I'll fight my own battles. Not this one, my dear. Lily indicated the door with a jerk of her head. Listen to me, Zack. You must leave. Now. Zachary strode to her and grasped her hands, turning his back on Alex. He looked down at her small face. The plan has failed, he muttered. I have to face him, Lily. I must finish this. No. She stood on her toes to put her arms around his shoulders. One dainty hand came to rest on the back of his neck. Trust me, she whispered into his ear. I swear on my life you'll have Penelope. But you must do as I say, darling. Go home. I'll take care of everything. How can you say that? He whispered back in amazement. How can you pretend such confidence? We've lost, Lily. We've utterly... Trust me she repeated, and stepped back from him. Zachary turned to look at Rayford, who was sprawled in the library chair like a debauched king on a throne. How can you stand yourself? he burst out. Doesn't it matter to you that the woman you're about to marry is in love with someone else? Alex smiled mockingly. You talk as if I held a gun to her head. Penelope accepted my suit of her own free will. There was nothing free about it. She had no choice in this marriage. It was all arranged without her... Zachary, Lily interrupted. With a mumbled curse, Zachary looked from her to Alex. Turning on his booted heel, he strode from the room. Soon afterward, there was the sound of his horse's hooves as he rode along the graveled drive. They were left alone. Alex's gaze flickered over Lily. With grim satisfaction, he observed that she looked as exhausted as he did. The soft lavender gown, with its frilly lace collar, seemed to emphasize the pallor of her skin and the shadows under her eyes. Her lips were red and swollen, a testament to his roughness the night before. You look like hell, he commented rudely, fumbling to light another cigar. No worse than you. A man in his cups is always so disgusting. Lily wandered to the velvet festooned window and opened it, letting some fresh air into the stale room. She frowned as she saw the cigar burns on the leather-lined table, an exquisite piece that was used to display rare folio books. Ruined. She turned and discovered that Alex was staring at her, his cold eyes daring her to rebuke him. What caused this? she asked. He showed her a used cigar butt. She smiled sourly. Actually, I was asking what caused you to swill your liquor like a pig at the trough, pining after long-lost Saint Caroline. Or is it that you're jealous because Zachary's a better man than you'll ever be? Or could it be? It's you, Alex snarled, tossing the brandy bottle aside, not seeming to notice the resulting shatter. It's because I want you out of my home, out of my life, away from me. You're leaving within the hour. Go back to London. Go anywhere. Lily threw him a disdainful glance. I suppose you want me to throw myself at your feet and beg. Oh, please, my lord, allow me to stay. Well, you won't have your way, Rayford. I'm not begging, and I'm not leaving. Perhaps when you're sober, we can discuss whatever it is that has set off this tantrum. But until then... I'm fortified with a bottle of brandy and I can barely tolerate you, Miss Lawson. Believe me, you don't want me sober. You pompous ass, she exploded. 
I suppose you've decided I'm the cause of all your problems, when the trouble is all in your stupid, thick, muddled-up head. Start packing, or I'll do it for you. Is this because of last night? Because of one meaningless kiss? Let me assure you, it held less significance for me than- I told you to leave, he said with deadly calm. I want every trace of you out of here, including your cards, your midnight rambles, your little schemes, and your big brown eyes. Now! I'll see you in hell first. Lily faced him, ready to stand her ground. She watched in bemusement as he left the library. Where are you going? What are you- Following him, she saw him at the foot of the grand staircase. He was heading to her bedchamber with ground covering strides. Don't you dare! She screeched and scampered after him. You inhospitable swine! You conceited, arrogant monster! Flying up the stairs, Lily reached the bedroom at the same time Alex did. A startled housemaid was engaged in changing the linens. After one glance at the pair, she fled as if retreating before an invading army. Alex flung open the armoire and began to stuff articles of clothing into the first available valise. Take your paws off my things! Outraged, Lily grabbed a delicate china figurine from the bedside table and hurled it at him. Alex ducked quickly. The figure shattered against the wall behind him. That belonged to my mother, he growled, his grey eyes filled with an unholy light. And what do you think your mother would say if she saw you now? A violent brute with a dried-up heart rattling in his chest, caring about nothing except his own selfish needs. Ah! Oh! Lily cried out in fury as Alex opened the window and tossed her valise outside. Gloves, stockings, and feminine articles fell from the half-open valise and scattered on the drive outside. Whirling around, Lily searched for something else to throw. She happened to catch sight of her sister standing in the doorway. Penelope was staring at them in horror. <gasps> You've both gone mad, she gasped. Soft as her voice was, it caught Alex's attention. He paused in the act of cramming a dress into a hat box and glared at Penelope. With his contorted face and his drunken, dishevelled blondness, he hardly looked like himself. Take a close look, Penny, Lily said. This is the man you've agreed to marry. A fine sight, isn't he? You can always tell a man's true character when he's pickled. Look at him, oozing meanness from every pore. Penelope's eyes widened. Before she could form a reply, Alex spoke to her harshly. Your erstwhile lover won't be coming back here, Penelope. If you want him, leave here with your sister. She most certainly will, Lily snapped. Pack your things, Penny, and we'll go to the Stamford estate. But I couldn't. Mamma and Papa wouldn't approve, Penelope said in a faltering whisper. No, they wouldn't, Lily agreed. Is that as important to you as Zachary's love? Alex directed a chilling stare at Penelope. Well, what will it be? Looking from Lily's defiant face to Alex's ominous one, Penelope turned as white as chalk. Giving a terrified cry, she darted away and headed for the retreat of her own room. You bully, Lily exclaimed. Dog in the manger! You know very well you can intimidate the poor child into doing whatever you want. She made her choice. Alex tossed the hat box to the floor and gestured to it. Now, should I finish your packing, or will you do it? There was a long moment of silence. All right, Lily said contemptuously. Get out. Leave me in peace. I'll be gone within the hour. Sooner, if you can manage. Why don't you explain the situation to my parents? Lily invited with a sneer. I'm sure they'll agree with everything you say. Not another word to Penelope, Alex warned and strode from the room. As soon as she was certain he was out of earshot, Lily took a deep breath and forced herself to relax. She shook her head. 
laughing quietly to herself. Arrogant ass, she murmured. Do you really think I'd be defeated so easily? Chapter Six A parade of cowed-looking servants carried Lily's valises and portmanteau out to the chaise. The closed carriage was adorned with shining lacquer and the Rayford armorial bearings. Alex had given the driver explicit instructions to deliver Lily to her terrace in London and return without delay. Lily's allotted hour was nearly over. Mindful of the passing minutes, she wandered through the mansion in search of her father. He was in one of the small upstairs parlours, seated at a desk burdened with stacks of books. Papa, Lily said tonelessly. George Lawson acknowledged his daughter with a glance over his shoulder. He straightened his spectacles. Lord Rayford informed me that you were leaving. I'm being forced to leave. I expected that, he replied ruefully. Did you say anything in my defence, Papa? Lily's forehead creased. Did you tell him I should be allowed to stay? Or are you happy I'll be gone? Do you have a preference one way or the other? I have reading to do, George said in a befuddled way, indicating his books. Yes, of course, Lily murmured. I'm sorry. He turned in his chair to face her, his expression perturbed. There is no need to apologize, daughter. I am no longer surprised by anything you do or any commotion you cause. I ceased to be surprised a long time ago. You never disappoint me, because I never expect anything of you. Lily wasn't certain why she had come to find him. For what little he expected of her, she expected even less of him. As a child, she had bothered and provoked him relentlessly, sneaking into his office, pestering him with questions, accidentally spilling ink all over his desk while trying to write with his pen. It had taken years for her to accept the crushing fact that he wasn't interested in her, not her thoughts or questions, her good behaviour, or even her bad behaviour. She had always tried to find a reason for his indifference. For a long time, she had felt it was some terrible fault in herself that caused him not to care. Before leaving home for good, she had confided her guilt to Totty, who had managed to assuage it somewhat. No, dear, he's always been that way, Totty had said placidly. Your father has a quiet and withdrawn nature, but he's not a cruel man, Lily. Why, there are some men who beat their children for disobeying them. You've been fortunate to have a father of such gentle disposition. Privately, Lily had considered his indifference almost as much a cruelty as beating would have been. Now she was no longer resentful or puzzled by his lack of caring, but resigned and rather sad. She tried to find words to tell him how she felt. I'm sorry for being such a scapegrace, Lily said. Perhaps if I'd been a son, we might have found some way to get along together. Instead, I've been rebellious and foolish and I've made such mistakes. Oh, if you only knew, you'd be even more ashamed of me than you already are. But you should be sorry too, Papa. You've been little more than a stranger to me. Since I was a child, I've had to forge my own way. You were never there. You never punished or scolded me, or did anything to show you were aware of my existence. At least Mother bothered to cry. She raked her hands through her hair and sighed. All the times I needed someone to turn to, I should have been able to rely on you. But you kept to your books and your philosophical treatises. Such a fine, scholarly mind you have, Papa. George glanced at her then, his eyes filled with protest and rebuke. Lily smiled sadly. I just wanted to tell you that in spite of everything, I still care about you. I wish, I wish you could say you felt the same. She waited, her gaze fixed on his face, her small hands clenching into tight fists. There was only silence. 
forgive me, she said casually. I think mother's with Penelope. Tell them I love them. Goodbye, papa. Abruptly, she turned and walked away. Controlling her emotions, Lily descended the majestic staircase with its multitude of landings. She realized with regret that she would never have occasion to see Rayford Park again. Surprising how she had come to love the quiet grandeur of the place and its rich classical design. What a pity. Were it not for Alex's sour disposition, he could have offered such a splendid life to a woman. Bidding goodbye to the butler and two housemaids wearing forlorn expressions, Lily went outside to watch the last of her belongings being loaded onto the carriage. Shading her eyes with her hand, she saw a lone figure ambling along the drive. It was Henry, returning from a morning spent with his friends in the village. He held a long stick in one hand, swinging it aimlessly as he walked. Thank God, Lily said with relief. She gestured for him to come to her. Henry quickened his pace. When he reached her, he looked at her with questioning blue eyes. Affectionately, Lily pushed a few locks of golden hair from his forehead. I feared you wouldn't return in time, she said. What's this? Henry glanced at the carriage. In time for what? For goodbyes, Lily smiled wryly. Your brother and I have had a falling out, Henry. Now I must go. Falling out? Over what? I'm leaving for London, Lily said, ignoring his question. I'm sorry I wasn't able to teach you all my card tricks, old fellow. Well, perhaps we'll cross paths again one day. She pasted a doubtful expression on her face and shrugged. Perhaps even at Craven's. I spend most of my time there, you know. Craven's? Henry repeated in awe. You didn't mention that before. Well, I'm quite good friends with the proprietor. With Derek Craven? So you've heard about him. Lily concealed a satisfied smile. Henry had gone for the bait, as she had known he would. No healthy, hardy boy could resist the lure of the forbidden masculine world on St. James Street. Who hasn't? What a life he's led. Craven knows all the richest, most powerful men in Europe. He's a legend. The most important man in England. Aside from the king, of course. Lily smiled. I wouldn't exactly say that. Were Derek here, he'd most likely tell you that in the whole scheme of things, he's merely a piss in the sea. He does run quite a nice gaming establishment, though. At school, the fellows and I all talked about the time when we'll finally be able to go to Craven's and play the tables and see the women there. It won't be for years, of course, but some day, what high times we'll have. Henry broke off with a wistful sigh. Why? Some day, Lily asked softly. Why not now? He gave her a startled look. I wouldn't be allowed past the front door. At my age, of course, a boy of twelve has never seen the inside of the place, Lily conceded. Derek has rules about such things, but he'll do anything I ask. If you were with me, you could go inside. See the gaming rooms for yourself, dine on French cuisine, and meet a house wench or two. She grinned mischievously. You could even shake Derek's hand for luck. He claims it rubs off on you. You're teasing, Henry said suspiciously, but his blue eyes were bright with impossible hope. Am I? Come with me to London and find out. We couldn't let your brother know, of course. You'd have to stow away in my carriage. Lily winked at him. Let's go to Craven's, Henry. I promise you an adventure. Alex would kill me. Oh, he'd be angry. I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. But he wouldn't thrash me, Henry said reflectively. Not after all the breachings I got at that rotten school. Then what do you have to fear? Henry gave her a grin of incredulous delight. Nothing. Alors, come aboard, Lily said with a laugh. She lowered her voice. 
Don't let the driver or anyone else see you, Henry. You have no idea how disappointed I would be if you were caught. She was gone. Alex stared out the library window, watching the carriage round the bend of the drive. He waited for a feeling of relief that didn't come. Instead, there was emptiness. He prowled through the mansion like a caged tiger, wanting to break free of something. Something. If only he knew what it was. The house was unnaturally quiet, the way it had been for years, before she arrived. Now there would be no more arguments, no more troublemaking, no ridiculous antics. He expected to feel better any minute now. His conscience prodded him to go to Penelope. He knew his display of drunken rage had frightened her. Mounting the stairs, Alex vowed that from now on he would be the soul of patience. He would do all within his power to please Penelope. A vision of his future with her stretched before him. Long, civilized, predictable years. A bleak smile curved his lips. Anyone would agree that marrying Penelope was the right thing. As he neared her room, he heard the sound of heartbroken weeping, and a voice so vibrantly passionate that for a split second he thought it was Lily. But the tones were softer and higher than Lily's. I love him, mother, Penelope sobbed. I'll love Zachary forever. If only I were brave like Lily, then nothing would have stopped me from going to him. There, there, came Totty's soothing voice. Don't say such things. Be sensible, darling. As Lord Rayford's wife, your future and that of your family will be secured forever. Your father and I know what's best for you, and so does Lord Rayford. Penelope's sobbing continued unabated, though she managed to gasp. I don't think so. I'm right about these matters, Totty continued. This is all your sister's doing. I love Wilhelmina dearly, you know that, but she's never satisfied until she's made everyone miserable. We owe Lord Rayford an apology, that well-bred, even-tempered man. I can scarcely believe the state Lily has put him in. We should never have allowed her to stay. She was right about everything. Penelope choked. She knew how Zachary and I love each other. Oh, if only I weren't such a coward. Alex walked away, his fists clenched. A self-mocking smile crossed his face. He would have liked to blame Lily, as Totty did, but he couldn't. The fault was all his, springing from his shattered self-control. The reawakened appetite for something he could never have. During the ride to London, Henry seemed to consider it necessary to recount every kind and selfless thing Alex had ever done for him, dating back to his infancy. As a captive audience, Lily had no choice but to listen. She endured it with what she considered to be remarkable forbearance. As he lounged on the carriage seat opposite her, Henry described the time when he had been caught up a tree, and Alex climbed up to rescue him, and the way Alex had taught him to swim in the lake, not to mention the countless afternoons when they had played soldiers together, and Alex had helped him learn his numbers. Henry, Lily finally interrupted. She smiled and spoke through gritted teeth. I have the impression you're trying to convince me of something. Is it that your brother isn't nearly the heartless brute he seems to be? Yes, that's it, Henry said, looking impressed with her astuteness. Exactly. Oh, I know how Alex comes off at times, but he's a capital fellow. Hang me if he ain't. Lily couldn't help smiling at that. Dear boy, it doesn't matter what I think of your brother. But if you knew Alex, really knew him, you'd like him. Tremendously. I don't intend to know any more of him than I already do. Did I tell you about the puppy he gave me for Christmas when I was seven and... Henry, is there any particular reason you're so determined that I should like your brother? 
He smiled and averted his blue eyes, seeming to consider his answer carefully. You're going to stop Alex from marrying Penelope, aren't you? Lily was perturbed. Riley, she thought that she'd made the same mistake most adults did, underestimating a child's intelligence. Henry was a perceptive boy. Of course he would have grasped the situation between his brother and the Lawsons. What gave you such an idea? she parried. You're all very noisy when you argue, Henry informed her. And the servants have been talking. Would you be sorry if I did stop the wedding? The boy shook his head. Oh, Penelope's all right, as far as girls go. But Alex doesn't love her. Not like Caroline, Lily said flatly. Each time the blasted woman's name was mentioned, she felt an unpleasant stabbing sensation. What had been so bloody marvellous about Caroline that Alex had gone so mad over her? Do you remember her, Henry? Yes, quite well, though I was just a boy then. And now you've reached the grand old age of, what is it, eleven? Twelve? Twelve, he said, grinning in response to her teasing. You're rather like her, you know, except you're prettier and older. Well, Lily said wryly, I hardly know whether to be flattered or offended. Tell me what you thought of her. I liked her. Caroline was a lively girl. She never made Alex angry like you do. She made him laugh. He hardly ever laughs now. A pity, Lily said absently, remembering Alex's brief, dazzling smile when they played cards in the gallery. Are you going to marry Derek Craven? Henry asked diffidently, as if the matter were of merely academic interest. Good God, no! You could marry Alex after you get rid of Penelope. A laugh burst from Lily's lips. Get rid of her! Heavens, you make it sound as if I'm going to dispose of her in the Thames. First of all, my dear, I don't intend to marry anyone, ever. Second, I don't even like your brother. But didn't I tell you about the time when I was afraid of the dark, and Alex came to my room and told me, Henry, she said in a warning voice, just let me finish this one story, he insisted. Lily groaned and settled back, resting her head against the Morocco sleeping cushion, while the list of Rayford's virtues continued. Derek and Worthy bent over the desk in the central gaming room. The mahogany surface was covered with a multitude of notes concerning preparations to be made for the upcoming masked assembly. The only thing they had agreed on was that the gambling palace should be decorated to look like a Roman temple. Derek wanted the ball to reflect the grand decadence of the Roman civilization at its zenith. Unfortunately, he and Worthy had conflicting ideas on how the effect should be achieved. All right, all right, Derek finally said, his green eyes glinting with exasperation. You can have the columns and silver swags hanging off the walls, but that means I'll get my way about the wenches, painting them all white and draping them in sheets to resemble statues, Worthy asked sceptically. What would they do for the entire evening? Stand on their blooming pedestals. They wouldn't be able to hold their poses for longer than ten minutes. They does what I pays them for, Derek insisted. Mr. Craven, Worthy said, his usually calm voice edged with frustration. Even if your idea were feasible, which it is not, I believe it would lend the event a tawdry and lurid atmosphere, not in keeping with the usual standards at Craven's. Derek frowned. What the hell does that mean? He means, Lily's laughing voice came from behind them that it would be outside the bounds of good taste, you low-brow cockney. Derek's dark face lit with a smile as he turned to see Lily standing there. Dressed in a lavender gown embroidered with silver thread, she resembled a dainty confection. Lily launched herself at him, laughing as he swung her around and set her on her feet.
Here's Miss Gypsy, back from the country, Derek said. Did you give Rayford his comeuppance? No, Lily replied, rolling her eyes. But I'm not through with him yet. She gave a sigh of pleasure at being in the familiar atmosphere of the club and beamed as she caught sight of the factotum. Worthy, you handsome devil. How have things been without me? The small, bespectacled man smiled. Only tolerable. You are a welcome sight as always, Miss Lawson. Shall I order something from the kitchen? No, no, Lily said immediately. Monsieur Labarge will want to stuff me with all his latest puddings and pies. Who needs it? Derek commented. No bigger than a titmouse. Come here. He slid an arm around her narrow shoulders and walked her to a private corner. You looks like hell, he remarked. That seems to be the general opinion today, she said dryly. Derek's sharp gaze detected the feverish brightness of her eyes and the pinched look about her mouth. What's the matter, lovey? Rayford turned out to be impossible, Lily replied briskly. I'm resorting to drastic measures. Drastic, he repeated, watching her closely. To begin with, I've abducted his younger brother. What? Derek followed Lily's pointing finger until he saw the handsome blonde boy waiting at the far end of the room. The lad was turning a slow circle, viewing the opulent surroundings with wide eyes. Holy L, Derek breathed in amazement. Holy, Lily corrected, and looked at him with a sort of sheepish defiance. I'm setting a trap for Rayford. Henry's the bait. Jesus, you done it this time. Derek marvelled softly, in a tone that sent a chill down Lily's spine. I want you to keep Henry for me, Derek, just for one night. All the friendly concern faded from Derek's face. He gave her a frosty stare. I never let children in my club. Henry's an angel. He won't give you any trouble. No. At least come and meet him, Lily pleaded. No. Please, Derek, she tugged at his arm. Henry's been so excited at the prospect of meeting you. He considers you the most important man in England, aside from the king. Derek's eyes narrowed. Please, she wheedled. All right, he finally said. I says hello, then he's off. Thank you, Lily said, bestowing several approving pats on his arm. Muttering under his breath, Derek allowed her to pull him to the doorway, where Henry was waiting. Mr. Craven, Lily said, I would like to present Henry, brother of the Earl of Rayford. Adopting his most courteous smile, the one usually reserved for visiting royalty, Derek gave Henry an elegant bow. Welcome to Craven's, my lord. It's even better than I imagined, Henry exclaimed. He seized Derek's hand and shook it vigorously. Smashing! Capital! He left them and searched the room like an inquisitive puppy. His small hand dipped into a bowl of cribbage counters, then traced the elaborate backs of the Empire-style chairs. He approached the hazard table as reverently as if it were a shrine. Does you play? Derek asked, vaguely amused by the boy's enthusiasm. Not well, but Miss Lawson's teaching me. Henry shook his head in wonder. I can't believe I'm here. Cravens, damn and blast, what it must have taken to build this place. He regarded Derek with an awestruck expression. You're the most amazing man I've ever met. Only a genius could have done this. Genius, Derek snorted. Not by off. But you are, Henry insisted. To think of starting with nothing and going so far above your buttons. Cravens is the most famous club in London. Hang me if you ain't a genius. Me and the fellows at school, we all admire you more than any man alive. Lily thought that Henry was laying it on a bit thick. Derek, on the other hand, was warming rapidly to the boy. He turned to Lily with a pleased expression. 
Certainly no cock brain, this one. I'm just repeating what everyone says, Henry said sincerely. Suddenly, Derek gave him a hearty clap on the back. Bright as a new copper, he said. Fine boy. Come with me, you little cheeser. I have some comely wenches for you to meet. No, Derek, Lily warned. No dice, drinking, or women for Henry. His brother would have my head. Derek looked down at Henry with a crooked grin. What does she think this here is? A bloody nunnery? He dragged Henry away with him, assuming a lecturing tone. Finest girls in England, I as. There's no man was ever got crinkums or the clap from my wenches. Lily and Worthy exchanged rueful glances. He likes the boy, Worthy commented. Worthy, don't let anything happen to Henry. Keep him out of sight. He can amuse himself with a deck of cards for hours at a time. Make certain he's not corrupted or harmed in any way. Certainly, the factotum assured her. When would you like him returned? Tomorrow morning. Lily sighed thoughtfully, her forehead puckered in a frown. In a courtly manner, Worthy crooked his elbow. I'll escort you to your carriage, Miss Lawson. Lily slipped her hand through his arm. By this time, Lord Rayford should be quite frantic, wondering where Henry is. Did you leave him a note? Worthy inquired matter-of-factly. No, the Earl's no fool. It won't take long for him to figure out what became of Henry. He'll be in London by nightfall, and I'll be ready for him. Whether Worthy approved or not, he showed her the same loyalty he gave to Derek. How may I be of assistance? If by chance the Earl shows up here first, direct him to my terrace. You must keep Henry hidden from him, or my plan will be ruined. Miss Lawson, the factotum began respectfully. I consider you to be one of the most valiant women I've ever known. Why, thank you. But are you quite certain you know what you're doing? Of course I do. A smile of pure delight spread across her face. I'm in the process of teaching Lord Rayford a lesson he'll never forget. When Henry's absence was noted and the search for him began, one of the housemaids revealed that she had seen the young master conversing with Miss Lawson shortly before her departure. The driver returned from London and was startled to be on the receiving end of a barrage of questions. He admitted he had not seen Master Henry entering or leaving the carriage, but Henry was an agile lad and could have manoeuvred about undetected. Alex was certain his brother was with Lily. The blasted woman had taken Henry with her in order to make him come to London. Well, he would go and take the city apart, brick by brick. He couldn't wait to reach her and make her rue the day she had decided to cross him. It was dark by the time he reached Grosvenor Square. Alex bounded out of the chaise and four almost before the driver had stopped the vehicle. Wearing a grimace, he strode up the steps of number 38 and hammered on the door with his fist. After a few moments, the door was opened by a tall, bearded butler. The man was impressive. He wore his dignity like an invisible mantle, his expressionless face set with authority. Good evening, Lord Rayford. Miss Lawson has been expecting you. Where's my brother? Without waiting for a reply, Alex pushed his way inside. Henry! He bellowed, setting the walls to trembling. Lord Rayford, the butler remarked politely. If you'll come this way, what of my brother? Alex barked. Where is he? Not bothering to match the butler's decorous pace, Alex leapt up the stairs two at a time. Henry! Henry! I'm going to tear you limb from limb. And as for Miss Lawson, she'd be wise to climb on her broomstick and escape before I reach her. Lily's cool, amused voice drifted to him from the hall, branching off the second landing. Rayford, after being ejected from your home, I suppose you think you have every right to barge into mine. Following the voice, Alex flung open the first door he came to. He discovered an empty sitting room. Where are you? Her maddening laughter drifted down the hall. 
in my bedroom. Where's Henry? How should I know? Do stop that atrocious bellowing, Rayford. I doubt a wounded bear could produce more noise. Alex charged to the next door. Flinging it open, he stepped into the bedroom. He had a brief impression of gilded beechwood and green silk hangings. Before he could turn his head, he felt a crashing blow to his skull. With a grunt of pain and surprise, he fell to his hands and knees. The scene blurred, and black mist rolled over him. Clutching at his head, he sank into the flooding darkness. Lily lowered her arm, still holding the bottle. She stood over him, feeling a strange mixture of dismay and triumph. Alex looked like a felled tiger his golden hair bright against the jewel tones of the carpet. Burton, she called. Come here at once. Burton, help me lift Lord Rayford to the bed. The butler came to the door of the bedroom. For a long moment he stood there, his gaze travelling from the cloth-wrapped bottle in Lily's hand to Alex's prostrate form. He had witnessed hundreds of Lily's scrapes and escapades, but this was the first time his composure had ever been visibly rocked. He managed to school his expression into impassiveness. Yes, miss, he finally said, and bent to heft Alex's large body over his shoulder. Careful, don't hurt him, Lily said anxiously. I mean, not any more than I already have. Panting with the effort, Burton lowered Alex's slack body to the bed. Then Burton stood and restored his own appearance, straightening his coat, vest, and tie. He finished by smoothing down a tuft of grey hair that was standing up from the side of his head. Will there be anything else, Miss Lawson? Yes, she said, going to sit by Alex's prone form. Ropes. Ropes, Burton repeated emotionlessly. To tie him up, of course. We can't have him getting away, can we? Oh, and be quick about it, Burton. He might wake up soon. She regarded her prisoner thoughtfully. I suppose we should remove his coat and boots. Miss Lawson? Yes. She looked up from her contemplation of Alex, her brown eyes fawn-like. Burton swallowed hard. May I ask how long the Earl will be staying with us? Oh, just for tonight. Have his carriage brought to the back and lodge his driver for the evening. Very good, miss. While Burton went in search of the ropes, Lily approached the slumbering giant on her bed. All of a sudden, she was rather amazed at what she had done. Alex did not stir. Lying there with his eyes closed, he seemed young and vulnerable. His feathery lashes cast shadows on the highest edge of his cheeks. Without his familiar skull, he looked so innocent. I had to do it, she said remorsefully. I had to. She leaned over him, smoothing his tousled blonde hair. Deciding to make him more comfortable, she untied his black cravat. The silk was still warm from his skin. Contemplating him silently, she unfastened his waistcoat and the top two buttons of his white linen shirt. Her knuckles brushed the taut skin at the base of his throat. An odd, pleasant shiver went through her. Wonderingly, she touched his golden cheek, the stern edge of his jaw, the silky curve of his lower lip. The growth of his night beard had begun to show, turning his jaw and chin into scratchy velvet against her fingertips. No fallen angel could have possessed a more compelling mixture of darkness and light. She saw the strain on his face, a tenseness that remained even in slumber. Too much drinking, too little sleep, and grief from long ago had cast its indelible shadow on his features. We're alike in some ways, you and I, she murmured. Pride, temper, and obstinacy. You'd move a mountain to get what you want. But you, my poor brute, don't even know where the mountain is. She grinned as she recalled the way he had tossed her clothes out the bedroom window. On a sudden impulse, she bent over him, 
gently pressing her lips to his. His mouth was warm, unresponsive. She thought of the crudely intimate way he had kissed her in the library. Lifting her head, she stared down at him, with her nose almost touching his. Wake up, sleeping prince, she murmured. It's time for you to realize what I'm capable of. Alex drifted slowly into wakefulness. Irritably, he wondered who was pounding on a drum nearby. Thump, thump, reverberating in his skull. He winced and turned his aching head against a cold, soothing pressure nearby. There, came a low voice. There, you'll be all right. Alex squinted his eyes open and saw the outline of a woman's face above his. He thought he must be having another dream about Lily. Those were her eyes, the spicy colour of gingerbread, and her mouth curved into a disarming smile. He felt her soft fingertips trace over his cheek. Damn you, he mumbled. Will you haunt me forever? Her smile deepened. That's entirely up to you, my lord. No, don't move. You'll dislodge the ice. Your poor head. I tried to hit you as gently as possible, but I had to do it hard enough that a second time wouldn't be necessary. What? he asked groggily. I hit you on the head. Alex blinked in dawning awareness, beginning to understand it was no dream. He remembered tearing into her house, coming to her room. The blow to his head. He gave a muffled curse. Lily was sitting cross-legged beside him. He was stretched out full length on a bed. For all Lily's show of calm concern, there was a victorious look about her that caused his nerves to crackle with warning. Henry. Don't worry, he's fine. Absolutely fine. She smiled reassuringly. He's staying the night with a friend of mine. Which friend? he demanded. Who? Her gaze turned wary. When I tell you, don't jump to conclusions. If I had the slightest doubt as to his well-being, I never would have... He struggled to sit up. Tell me who has him. Derek Craven. That underworld swindler who surrounds himself with whores and thieves? Henry's absolutely safe with Derek. You have my wo- Lily broke off with a gasp, leaping from the bed as Alex reached for her with a snarl. You bitch! He was caught short by ropes that bound his wrists and ankles to the thick bedposts. Sharply, his head snapped from right to left. He saw what she had done. Shock froze him from the inside out. Then he roared and began to tug in a storm of fury, causing the massive bed to tremble and creak. He fought the ropes like a wild beast experiencing confinement for the first time. Apprehensively, Lily watched him. She relaxed as she saw that the sturdy bed frame would withstand the ferocious punishment. Finally, Alex's struggle subsided. His lean frame was racked with laboured gasps. Why? he demanded. Why? Lily eased back onto the bed and looked down at him, her smile a fraction less confident than before. In spite of her triumph, she didn't like the sight of him bound and helpless. It seemed unnatural, and the ropes had already chafed his wrists. She could see the redness his tugging was causing. I've won, my lord, she said calmly. You may as well accept it with good grace. I admit my tactics lacked sportsmanship, but all's fair, as they say. She rubbed the sore muscles at the back of her neck and yawned. As we speak, Zachary is at Rayford Park. He'll spirit Penelope away to Gretna Green tonight, and they'll be married. I volunteered my services for the task of detaining you. By the time I release you, it will be too late for you to do anything. I couldn't let you have Penny. Not when Zachary loves her so. He'll make her happy. As for you, your damaged pride will soon recover. She smiled into his bloodshot eyes. I told you that you'd never have her. 
You should have taken my warning seriously. Her head tilted coquettishly as she waited for his response. Perhaps he would acknowledge it had been a game well played. Well, she prompted, wanting her victory tribute. I'm interested to hear your opinion of all this. It took Alex a long time to reply. When he did, his voice was nothing but a scratching rumble. My opinion. You should start running and never stop. And pray to God I never catch you. Only Rayford could seem so menacing, while tied hand and foot to a large piece of furniture. It was no idle threat. His words were laced with deadly purpose. Lily dismissed it blithely, deciding she could handle whatever trouble he might pose. I've done you a great favour, she pointed out. You're free to find someone else now. Someone far more suited to you than Penny. I wanted your sister. She never would have pleased you. Good God, you don't really want to marry a girl who would always be frightened of you, do you? If you have an ounce of sense, you'll choose someone with a little more spirit the next time. But no, you'll probably propose to another meek, gentle lamb. Bullies are always drawn to that sort. Alex was dizzy, from the ache in his head and the failed attempt to free himself, and despairing, incredulous with rage. Everyone he loved had been taken away from him. His mother, his father, Caroline. He'd let himself believe that he would never lose Penelope. That, at least, it had seemed reasonable to depend on. He thought he would go raving mad if he had to endure any more. His jaw twitched violently. Lily, he said hoarsely, untie the ropes. Not to save my life. It's the only thing that will. You'll be unleashed in the morning, she promised. Then you'll be free to collect Henry, return home, and plot your revenge. Do your worst. I don't care, now that Penny is safe from you. You'll never be safe, he rasped. At the moment, I feel quite safe. She smiled impudently. Then she seemed to recognize the emotions that writhed beneath his fury. The wicked amusement in her eyes dimmed, replaced by something softer. You shouldn't worry about Henry, she said. He'll be perfectly fine tonight. Derek's factotum is making certain he stays out of trouble. She smiled wryly. Henry filled my ears with praises of you during the carriage ride to London. A man who wins such devotion from a child can't be all that terrible. Watching his face, she put her hand on either side of his lean torso, her slight weight poised over him. But it isn't Henry that's bothering you. What is it? Alex closed his eyes, trying to block out the sight of her, the sound of her voice, wishing to God this were a nightmare that would end soon. But she continued to dissect him with her soft words, heedlessly raking over raw wounds. No one's ever forced you to do anything before, have they? She asked. He concentrated on his breathing, making it steady. He tried to block out her voice. Why so distraught over losing my sister? You can go out and find someone else just like her, if that's what you really want. Lily paused and said thoughtfully, If you're so intent on having someone who won't interfere with Caroline's memory, she noticed the catch of his breath. For shame, she said softly, and shook her head. Few men would mourn for so long. It reflects either on your capacity for love or your remarkable stubbornness. Which is it, I wonder? Alex's eyes flew open. With a tingling shock, Lily saw that the depths of grey had changed from ice to smoke. She felt an odd surge of compassion. You're not the only one who's lost someone, she said quietly. I have too. I understand all about self-pity. It's useless, not to mention unbecoming. Her condescension drove him wild. 
If you think losing that snub-nosed little Viscount is comparable to what I went through with Caroline— No, I'm not referring to him. Lily stared at him in mild surprise, wondering how much he knew about her engagement to Harry Hinden. He must have gotten it out of Zack. What I felt for Harry was infatuation. The one I loved and lost was someone else entirely. I would have died for this person. I still would. Who? That's private. Alex lowered his head back to the pillow. Perhaps your temper will cool tonight, Lily remarked, delicately rearranging his collar, as if he were a plaything. She knew her careless manner would incense him further. When you think about this sensibly, you'll realize it's the best for all concerned. Even you. Noticing his hands straining at the ropes, she touched his taut arm. Don't. You'll only end up with blisters. You may as well relax. Poor Rayford. It must be difficult to accept the fact that you've been pestered by a woman. Her dark eyes danced with sympathetic laughter. For the rest of my life, I'll treasure this memory. The Earl of Rayford completely at my mercy. She leaned over him, her smiling mouth hovering just above his. Just what would you do if you could free yourself, my lord? Strangle you, with my bare hands. Would you? Or would you kiss me as you did in the library? His eyes flickered, and a flush edged his cheekbones. Consider that a mistake, he muttered. Lily was stung by his contemptuous tone. Her experiences with men, Harry's desertion, Giuseppe's angry disappointment, even Derek's lack of sexual interest in her, had all taught her that she lacked whatever it was that made a woman desirable. Now Alex had joined the list. Why wasn't she like other women? What mysterious thing made her so unappealing? Some devilish impulse urged her to show Alex how powerless he was. She leaned close, her breath wafting over his chin. You had me at a disadvantage in the library, she said. Have you ever been kissed against your will, Alex? Perhaps you'd like to know how it feels. Alex stared at her, as if she'd gone mad. Smiling impishly, she dipped her head and pressed a light, close-mouthed kiss to his stiff lips. He jerked his head back as if he'd been touched by fire. She was doing her best to torment him. First a kiss, next she'd probably start plucking out his chest hairs one by one. Lily studied him in the silence. Something had made his breathing choppy. Was it anger? Or was it possible that her kiss had affected him? She was intrigued by the thought. Should I consider that another mistake? She whispered. Alex stared at her, transfixed. He couldn't make a sound. Lily moved the necessary half inch to bring her lips to his. Alex inhaled quickly. This time, he didn't try to move away. Softly, she brushed her mouth over his, giving him nothing more than questioning pressure. Alex tolerated her kiss with his eyes tightly closed, as if she were subjecting him to some acutely painful torture. His shoulders and chest turned rock hard with the tension of his arms pulling on the ropes. She touched the side of his smooth, hot neck with her fingertips, and he gave a single gasp against her lips. Astonished, Lily pulled herself higher onto his chest. She wanted more, something, but she didn't know what or how. Then there was movement, his head turning slowly on the pillow, adjusting beneath hers. Lily curved her small hand behind his neck, instinctively pressing harder with her mouth. She felt the sleek push of his tongue, and she was shaken by a jolt of pleasure that made her want to answer the silken movement. Alex felt the way Lily shivered, her breath striking his cheek in a rush of surprise. Expecting each moment that her lips would be withdrawn, he strained upward in hunger, seeking more. But she did not pull away. She stayed against him, 
open and sweet. Alex clenched his fists. He was trapped by her sinuous body and the bed and his own helplessness. Excitement flooded through him, centering in his loins. Nothing would stop the hardening rise of his flesh, coming to life in heavy, twitching surges. He ached and groaned and damned himself. Ripping his mouth from hers, he buried his face in the perfumed curve of her throat. No more, he said gruffly. Either untie me or stop this. No, she said breathlessly. She had never felt so daring and giddy in her life. She laced her fingers into his thick hair. I'm teaching you a lesson. Get off me, he said fiercely. He almost succeeded in frightening her away. He felt her give a little jump, but she persisted. Still holding his gaze, she eased further over him until she was draped on him full length. He shuddered and bit his lip. The weight of her body bearing down on his aroused manhood caused him to press upward without conscious thought. It wasn't enough. He wanted more. The softness of her flesh surrounding him, the cling and pull of her body as he thrust within her. Somehow he managed to speak very quietly. Enough. Lily. Enough. She was breathing very fast, looking as reckless as she had during the hunt, hurtling over impossible jumps. Alex couldn't fathom what was going on in her mind, until she spoke. Say her name now, she urged in a thick voice. Say it. He set his jaw so hard that he felt it tremble. You can't, Lily whispered, because it's me you want, not Caroline. I can feel it. I'm a living, breathing woman, and I'm here. And you want me. A thousand thoughts raced across his brain. He searched for Caroline, but she wasn't there. Nothing but a blur of memories, faded color, muted sound. None of it was as real as the face above him. Lily's mouth remained just above his, close enough that he could feel the warmth of her lips. He didn't answer, but she could read the truth in his eyes. Lily should have pulled away in triumph, glorying in her victory. She was right after all. Instead, she made a low sound and kissed him again. Disarmed, unable to retreat, all he could do was surrender. Her hands were on his face, his neck, exploring gently. Alex groaned with the need to touch her, hold her tight between his thighs. Instead, he was spread beneath her. It was killing him slowly. The ropes tore at his wrists until they were raw. Lily gasped at the rhythmic goading of his hips. She tried to move away, only to find that he had caught her bottom lip with his teeth. Turn your head, he muttered, his warm breath rushing into her mouth. Turn it. She obeyed, and he let go of her lip, his mouth opening to receive the twisting pressure of hers. Lily gave a small sob of pleasure. Compulsively, she gathered tighter against him, impelling her breasts against his hard chest, her stomach flat against his. The friction between their bodies caused her gown to ride up to her knees, but she didn't care. She couldn't seem to make herself care about anything except the urgent need building inside. There was a knock at the door. Lily stiffened at the sound. Miss Lawson, came the butler's muffled voice. Weakly, she dropped her head to the pillow, the puff of her breath tickling Alex's ear. He turned his head against her buoyant curls and inhaled the sweet fragrance. Burton spoke again. Miss Lawson. Lily raised her head. Yes, Burton, she asked unsteadily. A message has just arrived. She froze. That could mean only one thing. Burton would never intrude on her privacy, unless the note were from a particular source. Alex watched Lily intently. The blush drained from her face. There was a gleam of something like fear in her eyes. She seemed dazed. It can't be, he heard her whisper. It's too soon. Too soon for what? 
The sound of his voice seemed to recall her. She wiped her expression clean and rolled away from him, jerking at her skirts. Carefully, she avoided looking at him. I must bid you good night, my lord. I th think you'll be comfortable here. Not likely, you little tease. He watched in fury as she fumbled to restore her appearance and left the room. He shouted a few choice obscenities after her, adding, I'll see you in Newgate for this. And as for your damn butler... The door slammed and he fell silent, glaring at the ceiling. Lily faced Burton in the hall, too distracted to worry about her disheveled appearance. There was a note poised on the silver tray in his hands. The paper was sealed with a dirty blob of wax. Burton proffered the tray. You instructed me to deliver them to you upon their arrival, no matter what time. Yes, Lily interrupted, snatching the letter. She broke the seal and scanned the scrawled lines. Tonight? Damn him. He must have people watching me. Always seems to know where I am. Miss? Burton had never been privileged to know the contents of the letters, which arrived at the terrace on a sporadic basis. He had come to recognize them by the elaborate, untidy handwriting and the strange appearance of the bearers. The letters were always delivered by ragged boys fresh from the street. Have a horse saddled for me, Lily said. Miss Lawson, I should like to point out the inadvisability of a woman riding alone in London, especially at night. Tell one of the maids to bring my grey cloak, the one with the hood. Yes, miss. Slowly she went down the stairs, keeping hold of the railing as if to steady herself. Covent Garden was an especially unsavoury area of London, where every worldly pleasure, from the conventional to the unthinkable, was to be had for a price. There was advertising both visible and verbal, printed bills and notices plastered on every wall. The din of swindlers, pimps, and prostitutes shouting invitations at every passerby. Regency bucks, coming from the theatres with their lighter loves, teetered drunkenly to the market taverns. Lily took care to avoid all of them. A drunken lord could sometimes prove as dangerous and inhuman as a professional criminal. As she crossed through pools of gaslight and shadow, Lily felt sympathy for the parade of prostitutes trodding the thoroughfares. There were young girls and haggard old women and every age in between. They were either thin from starvation or bloated with gin. They all wore the same weary look as they rested on steps and posed on corners, producing painted smiles for any prospective customer. Surely they would never have turned to such an existence had there been any other choice. There but for the grace of God, Lily thought, and shuddered. She would kill herself rather than turn to such a life, even the life of a courtesan wearing diamond clusters and servicing her protector on silk sheets. Her lip curled with disgust. Better to be dead than owned by a man and forced to serve his physical needs. Travelling south on King Street, she passed the churchyard. She ignored the catcalls and jeers thrown at her from the roofed shacks that served as shops and dwelling places. Cautiously, she went across the street from the market entrance. The two-story arcade was fronted with a pediment and granite Tuscan columns, an oddly regal design for a place containing such squalor. She reined in her horse and paused in a shadow. There was nothing to do but wait. Ruefully she grinned as she saw a pair of young pickpockets nimbly working the crowds. Then she thought of Nicole. Her face turned to stone. My God, what kind of existence was she leading now? Was it possible, young as she was, that she was already being used to turn vice into profit? The notion brought stinging tears to her eyes. Roughly she rubbed them away. She couldn't give way to emotion. Not now. She had to be cool and self-controlled. A lazy voice came from the darkness nearby. So, here you are then. I hope you bring what I want. 
Slowly, Lily dismounted and clutched the reins of her mount in one hand. She turned in the direction of the voice and forced herself to speak steadily, though her entire body was trembling. No more, Giuseppe. Not a farthing more. Until you give me back my daughter. Chapter 7 Count Giuseppe Gavazzi had all the striking splendor of a figure from an Italian Renaissance painting. Boldly prominent features, curly black hair, rich olive skin, and lustrous black eyes. Lily remembered the first time she had ever seen him. Giuseppe had been standing in a sunlit Florentine piazza, surrounded by a group of Italian women who hung on every word he spoke. With his flashing smile and dark beauty, he had taken Lily's breath away. Their paths had crossed numerous times at social events, and Giuseppe had begun to pursue her ardently, ostentatiously. Lily had been overwhelmed by the romance of Italy and the previously unknown excitement of being seduced by a handsome man. Harry Hinden, her only other love, had been staid and so very English, qualities that had pleased her parents. She'd thought Harry's tight grasp on propriety would influence her, save her. Instead, her wildness had caused him to leave her. But Count Gavazzi had seemed to relish her impulsive glee. He had called her exciting, beautiful. At the time, it had seemed as if she'd finally found the man with whom she could drop all pretenses and be herself. Now, the memory of her own foolishness disgusted her. In the past few years, Giuseppe's looks had coarsened. Or perhaps it was merely that her perception of him had changed. His pouting lips, praised by the Italian signoras for their sensuous fullness, now seemed repulsive to Lily. She loathed the way his gaze roamed greedily over her, though once she had been flattered by his attention. There was something seedy about his appearance, even in the way he stood with his hands clasped on his hips to emphasize their unusual narrowness. It made her stomach turn to look at him and remember the night they'd spent together. He had astonished and humiliated her by asking for a gift afterward, as if she was some dried-up spinster, obligated to pay a man to come to her bed. Giuseppe reached out and pushed Lily's hood back, revealing her resolute face. Buona sera, he said in his rich voice, his fingertip extending to stroke her cheek. She knocked his hand away, making him chuckle. <laughs> Still with the claws, my darling cat. I come for the money, Cara. You come for news of Nicoletta. Now give to me. And I do the same. Not any more. Lily drew in a trembling breath. You oily bastard. Why should I give you more money when I don't even know if she's alive? I promise you, she is safe, happy. How can she be happy with no mother? Such a beautiful little girl we have, Lily. With a smile all the time and the pretty air. He touched his own ebony curls. Pretty like mine. She call me Papa. Sometime she ask me where is Mama. That broke her as nothing else could. 
Lily stared at him without blinking. She swallowed against a lump of pain, and tears sprang to her eyes. I'm her mother, she said wretchedly. She needs me, and I want her back, Giuseppe. You know she belongs with me. He regarded her with a faintly pitying smile. Maybe I return Nicoletta before now, Bella. But you make too many times mistake. You have men looking, asking questions in the city. You do tricks on me. Have them follow me after we meet. You make me angry. Now I think for more years I keep Nicoletta. I told you. I don't know anything about that, Lily cried. It was a lie, of course. She was well aware that Derek had men searching for Nicole. Derek had informants in every part of the city, including porters, clerks, dealers, whores, butchers, and pawnbrokers. Over the past year, he had summoned Lily four different times to take a look at dark-haired girls matching Nicole's description. None of them were her daughter. She couldn't afford to take them in. What Derek did with them afterward, she didn't ask, and had no desire to know. She looked at Giuseppe with hate-filled eyes. I've given you a fortune, she said hoarsely. I don't have anything left. Have you heard the expression, blood from a turnip, Giuseppe? It means I can't give you any more, because I don't have it. Then you look to find more, came his soft reply. Or from somewhere I take the money. There is many men asking to buy a pretty girl as Nicoletta. What? Lily put her hand to her mouth to stifle a cry of agony. How could you do that to your own child? You wouldn't sell her like that. It would kill her. And me. Oh, God. You haven't already, have you? Not yet. But I come close, maybe, Cara. He held out his empty palm. You pay the money now. How long will this go on? She whispered. When is it going to be enough? He ignored the question and shoved his open hand toward her. Now. Tears slid down her face. I don't have it. I give you three days, Lily. You come to bring five thousand pounds, or Nicoletta is gone forever. She lowered her head, listening to the sound of his retreating footsteps, the raucous noise of Covent Garden, the soft nicker of her horse. She shook with wild desperation. It took all her strength to keep it inside. Money. Her accounts had never been so depleted. This past month, she hadn't turned her usual profit at Craven's. Well, her luck would have to change, and fast. She'd have to play deep. If she couldn't win five thousand in three days, God, what would she do? She could ask Derek for a loan. No, she'd made that mistake once before, a year and a half ago. She'd thought that with his stupendous fortune, he wouldn't mind loaning her a thousand or two, especially at her promise to return it with interest. To her surprise, Derek had turned coldly cruel and made her swear she'd never ask him for money again. It had taken weeks to get back in his good graces. Lily didn't understand why he had been so angry. It wasn't as if he were a miserly man, just the opposite. He was generous in countless ways, giving her presents, the use of his vast properties, allowing her to pilfer from his kitchens and liquor supply, helping her search for Nicole but he'd never given her a farthing. Now she knew better than to ask. She considered some of the rich old men she knew, men with whom she had gambled and flirted and maintained friendships with. Lord Harrington, she thought numbly, with his fat belly and cheerful red face and limp powdered wigs. Or Arthur Longman, a respected barrister. His face was rather unattractive, large nose, no chin, sagging cheeks. But his eyes were kind, and he was an honourable man. Both of them had hinted in gentlemanly ways about their attraction to her. 
she could accept one of them as a protector. There was no doubt she would be well treated and generously provided for, but it would change her life forever. Certain doors that were yet open to her would be closed for good. She would become an expensive whore, and that was only if she were lucky. If her experience with Giuseppe was anything to judge by, she might prove so unsatisfactory in bed that no one would want to keep her. Lily went to the horse and rested her forehead on its warm, dusty neck. I'm so tired, she whispered. Tired and cynical. She had so little reason to hope for Nicole's return. Her life had become nothing but endless grubbing for money. She should never have wasted so much time with this business about Penny, Zack and Alex Rayford. It may have cost her Nicole. But if not for the distraction of the past week, she thought she might have lost her sanity. A light rain began to fall, drops pattering on her hair. Lily closed her eyes and lifted her face, letting the water trail down her cheeks in cool rivulets. Suddenly, she remembered Nicole at bath time, making the discovery that she could wet her tiny fists and shake them in the air and splash them in the tub. <laughs> Look what you can do, Lily had exclaimed with a laugh. How dare you splash your mamma, you clever little duck. Water is for the bath, not the floor. Stubbornly, Lily wiped away the raindrops and tears. She squared her shoulders. It's only money, she muttered. I've gotten it before. I'll get it again, somehow. The clock chimed nine times. Alex had been staring at it for nearly an hour. It was a sentimental figured bronze clock, adorned with porcelain roses and a shy shepherdess, glancing over her shoulder at a nobleman proffering a bouquet of flowers. The rest of Lily's bedroom was just as feminine. The pale sea-green walls decorated with delicate white plasterwork. The windows hung with rose silk. The furniture upholstered with soft velvet. Now that he thought of it, the brief glimpse he'd caught of Lily's house had been very different from this. Dark, rich, and almost masculine. It was as if she had saved her private room for all the feminine indulgence she hadn't allowed herself elsewhere. As the last chime sounded, the bedroom door opened. The butler. Burton, she had called him. Good morning, sir, Burton said impassively. I trust you had a restful night. Alex glowered at him. After Lily had left him, he had been alone with nothing but silent hours ahead. Until then, he'd made a habit of filling every waking moment with distractions. Work, sporting, social amusements, drinking, women. Countless ways he had devised to avoid being alone with his thoughts. Unwittingly, Lily had forced him to face what he was most afraid of. In the quiet darkness, he hadn't been able to stop the memories from swooping down on him like vultures, tearing at his heart. At first, it had all been a jumble. Anger, passion, regret, grief. No one would ever know what he had gone through in those hours of confinement. No one would ever need to know. All that was important was that the jumble had somehow sorted itself out, and things had become clear in his mind. He would never see Caroline in another woman's face again. She was part of his past, and he would leave her there. No more grief, no ghosts. And as for Lily, he devoted a good deal of thought to what he was going to do about her. Sometime during the early morning hours, he'd drifted into a sleep of pure, dark velvet. The butler came to the bedside, bearing a small knife. Shall I, sir? Burton inquired, gesturing to his bound arms. Alex gave him an incredulous look. Oh, by all means, he replied in a sarcastic show of politeness. Deftly, the butler sawed at the finely woven rope. Alex grimaced as his right arm was released. He brought it to his chest, flexing the aching muscles with a quiet groan, and watched as Burton went around the bed to the other side. Silently, 
Alex had to admit that Burton was impressive. He had the most authentically butlerish appearance Alex had ever seen. He wore a beautifully trimmed beard and a look of intelligence and authority, all this wrapped in a package of impeccable deference. It took aplomb to approach this situation with dignity, and yet Burton was untying him from the bed in the same stoic manner with which he might have poured tea or brushed a hat. Burton's brows twitched in what might have been dismay as he saw Alex's blistered wrists. My lord, I will bring a salve for your arms. No, Alex growled. You've done quite enough. Yes, sir. Painfully, Alex drew himself to a sitting position, flexing his cramped limbs. Where is she this morning? If you're referring to Miss Lawson, sir, I have no knowledge of her whereabouts. However, I have been instructed to remind you that Master Henry is at Mr. Craven's establishment. If anything's happened to him, I'll hold you every bit as responsible as Miss Lawson. Burton looked unruffled. Yes, sir. Alex shook his head in amazement. You'd help her with murder if she asked, wouldn't you? She hasn't requested it, sir. Yet, Alex muttered. But if she did? As my employer, Miss Lawson is entitled to my absolute loyalty. Burton regarded Alex politely. Would you care for a paper, my lord? Coffee? Tea, perhaps? For breakfast, we can provide. To begin with, you can stop behaving as if this is a commonplace occurrence. Or is it? Could it be the usual thing for you to offer breakfast to guests who've been tied hand and foot to Lily Lawson's bed? Burton considered the question carefully, as if reluctant to betray Lily's privacy. You are the first, Lord Rayford, he finally admitted. What a hell of an honour. Alex put a hand to his sore head and probed gingerly. There was a tender bump a few inches above his ear. I'll take a headache powder. She owes me that to start with. Yes, sir. And have my driver bring my carriage around. Unless you and Miss Lawson have him bound to a stable rack or hitching post somewhere. Yes, sir. Burton, that's your name, isn't it? How long have you been working for Miss Lawson? Since she returned to London, my lord. Well, whatever your salary, I'll double it if you'll come work for me. Thank you, Lord Rayford. However, I must respectfully decline. Alex stared at him curiously. Why? God knows Lily must put you through hell. Knowing her, I suspect this isn't the worst escapade she's ever involved you in. I'm afraid it isn't, my lord. Then why stay? Miss Lawson is an unusual woman. Some call it eccentric, Alex said dryly. Tell me what she's done to merit such loyalty. Burton's impassive facade seemed to fade, just for a moment, and there was something almost like fondness in his eyes. Miss Lawson has a compassionate heart, my lord, and a remarkable lack of prejudice. When she arrived in London two years ago, I was in a rather difficult situation, working for an employer who was often inebriated and abusive. Once, while intoxicated, he inflicted a wound on my side with a shaving razor. Another time he summoned me to his room and waved a loaded pistol in front of my face, threatening to shoot me. Hell. Alex regarded him with surprise. Why didn't you find employment elsewhere? A butler of your calibre. I am half Irish, my lord, Burton said quietly. Most employers require that their highly placed servants belong to the Church of England, which I do not. That and my Irish heritage, though not readily apparent, deem me unacceptable to butler most decent English families. Therefore, I was trapped in a most intolerable situation. Upon hearing of my dilemma, Miss Lawson offered to employ me at a higher salary than the one I was earning, although she knew I would have worked for much less. I see. Perhaps you begin to, my lord. Burton hesitated and continued in a low tone, as if against his better judgment. Miss Lawson decided I needed to be rescued. 
Once she takes such an idea into her head, there is no way to stop her. She has rescued many people, though no one seems to realize that she is the one most in need of. Suddenly he stopped and cleared his throat. I have discoursed quite enough, my lord. Forgive me. Perhaps you'll reconsider the idea of cough. What were you going to say? That Lily's in need of rescuing? From what? From whom? Burton looked at him blankly, as if he was speaking a foreign language. Shall I bring this morning's edition of the Times along with your headache powder, my lord? Henry perched at the long table in the cavernous kitchen, watching in fascination as Monsieur Labarge and the army of apron-clad servants worked on a bewildering array of projects. Fragrant sauces and mysterious concoctions bubbled in pots on the cast-iron stove. An entire wall was covered with a staggering collection of shining pots, pans, and moulds, an assortment Labarge referred to as his batterie de cuisine. The chef strode about the room in the manner of a military commander, gesturing with knives, spoons, whatever utensil happened to be in his hand. His towering white hat tilted at alarming angles in response to his vigorous movements. He barked at the second chef, who was making a sauce far too heavy for a dish of fish wrapped in pastry, and at assistant bakers who had allowed the rolls to brown a shade too dark. The fine upturned ends of his moustache quivered in wrath as he saw that one of the vegetable maids was cutting the carrots too fine. In sudden, bewildering changes of mood, Labarge would shove tempting dishes in front of Henry and beam approvingly as Henry gobbled up the savoury feast. Ah, le jeune gentilhomme mange, mange. Our young gentleman must try some of this. And this? C'est bien, oui. Very good, Henry said enthusiastically, around a mouthful of pastry dotted with fruit and lemon cream. May I have some more of those brown things with the sauce? With fatherly pride, the chef brought him a second plate of tiny veal strips sautéed with brandy butter, onions, and mushroom sauce. The first recipe I learned as a boy, helping mon père prepare supper for le comte, he reminisced. This is even better than the meals we have at Rayford Park, Henry said. Monsieur Labarge responded with many uncomplimentary remarks about English food, calling it flavourless garbage that he would not even feed to a dog. This, on the other hand, was French cuisine, as superior to English food as cake was to stale bread. Wisely, Henry nodded in agreement and kept eating. Just as Henry was forced to set his fork down because his stomach was uncomfortably full, Worthy came to the kitchen entrance. Master Henry, he said gravely, your brother has arrived. He has made some uh, vigorous statements of concern for you. I think it best if you show yourself at once. Come with me, if you please. Oh. Henry's cornflower blue eyes turned round with dismay. He covered his mouth with his palm, suppressing a burp, and sighed as he looked around the kitchen. The staff regarded him sympathetically. It will be a long time before I'll be able to come back, Henry said sadly. Years. Monsieur Labarge looked distressed, his thin moustache twitching as he thought rapidly. Lord Rayford, he has the grand temper, no? Perhaps we shall first offer him Houlard à la Périgueux or Saumon Montpellier. The chef paused and considered other delicacies he could prepare, confident that his culinary masterpieces would placate the most savage humour. No, Henry said ruefully, knowing that even Labarge's offering of truffled chicken or salmon in herb sauce wouldn't soothe Alex. I don't think that would work. But thank you, monsieur. This was worth any punishment. I'd spend a month in Newgate for one of those sponge cakes with a coffee cream— or that green souffle thing. Obviously moved, Labarge clasped Henry's shoulders, kissed both cheeks, and delivered a short speech in French, which Henry couldn't understand. He finished by exclaiming, Quel jeune homme magnifique! 
Such a boy this is. Come, Henry. Worthy gestured to the boy. They left the kitchen and walked through the dining rooms. Before they circled to the entrance hall, Worthy felt compelled to make a short speech of his own. Henry, I suppose you've heard that a gentleman always behaves with discretion, especially when it comes to discussing matters of uh, activity with the fair sex. Yes, Henry said in a perplexed manner. He stared up at Worthy with a slight frown. Does that mean I shouldn't tell my brother about the girls Mr. Craven introduced me to last night? Unless you feel there is a particular reason for him to know? Henry shook his head. I can't think of a single reason. Good. Worthy gave a great sigh of relief. Contrary to Henry's expectations, Alex was not wearing a thunderous skull. Actually, he seemed rather calm as he stood in the entrance hall, his hands shoved casually in the pockets of his coat. His clothes were rumpled, and his face was covered with heavy stubble. Henry wasn't accustomed to seeing his brother in such disarray. But strangely, Alex looked more relaxed than he had in a long time. There was something rather unsettling about his eyes, a gleam of silver fire, and a devil-may-care expression on his face. Henry frowned, wondering what had happened to him, and why he had appeared this morning instead of arriving to take him back home last night. Alex, he said, it was all my fault. I should never have gone without telling you, but I... Alex took him by the shoulders, surveying him critically. Are you all right? Yes. I had a splendid supper last night. I learned to play cribbage with Mr. Craven. I went to bed early. Assured of his well-being, Alex gave him a piercing stare. We're going to have a talk, Henry, about responsibility. The boy nodded dutifully, perceiving that it was going to be a long ride home. My lord, Worthy interjected, on behalf of Mr. Craven and our staff, I would like to say that your brother is an exceptionally well-mannered lad. I have never seen Mr. Craven not to mention our temperamental chef, so charmed by one person. It's a God-given talent. Henry mastered the art of flattery at a young age. Alex glanced at his younger brother, who wore a sheepish smile, and then back at the factotum. Were they? Is Miss Lawson here? No, my lord. Alex wondered if he were lying. Lily might be in Craven's bed right now. He felt a stab of possessive jealousy. Then where might I expect to find her? I would expect Miss Lawson to be here for the next few nights, my lord, either in the card rooms or at the hazard table. Certainly she'll be in attendance at our masked assembly on Saturday. Worthy lifted his brows and peered at him through his round spectacles. Shall I give her a message, my lord? Yes. Tell her... To be prepared for the next round. With that ominous statement, Alex bid the factotum goodbye and strode out of Craven's, Henry trotting close at his heels. When Alex arrived at Rayford Park and strode into the mansion, he was immediately aware of the quiet alarm that permeated the air. Henry was also sensitive to the invisible cloud of gloom. Wonderingly, he looked around the silent house. It feels like someone died. The sounds of subdued sniffling heralded the appearance of Totty Lawson. She crept down the grand staircase, her cherubic face drawn tight with dismay. She looked at Alex as though she suspected he might rush forward and do her bodily harm. My lord, she quavered and burst into tears. She's gone. My darling Penny is gone. Don't blame my poor innocent child. The fault is mine. All rec recriminations should be laid solely at my feet. Oh, dear, oh, dear. A comical mixture of dismay and alarm crossed Alex's features. Mrs. Lawson. He searched his pockets for a handkerchief. He glanced at Henry, who shrugged helplessly. Should I get her some water? Henry asked sotto voce. Tea? 
Totty sobbed. Strong tea with a splash of milk and a touch of sugar, just a touch, mind you. As Henry scurried away, Totty continued her hiccuping soliloquy. Oh, what am I to do? I think I've gone a little mad. How shall I begin to explain? No explanations are necessary. Alex found a handkerchief and offered it to her. He patted her plump back in a clumsily soothing gesture. I'm aware of the situation. Penelope, Zachary, the elopement, all of it. It's too late to assign blame, Mrs. Lawson. Don't distress yourself. By the time I found the note and roused George to follow them, they were long gone. Totty blew her nose daintily. Even now he is trying to locate them. Perhaps there is still time. No. He produced a benign smile. Penelope was far too good for me. I assure you, Viscount Stamford will prove to be a worthier husband. I don't agree at all, Totty said unhappily. Oh, Lord Rayford, if only you had been here last night. I fear your absence may have encouraged them in this terrible folly. Her round blue eyes, swimming with tears, pleaded for an explanation. I was unavoidably detained, Alex replied, rubbing his head ruefully. This has all been Wilhelmina's doing, Totty fretted. He looked at her intently. How so? If she hadn't come here and put ideas into their heads. Suddenly, Alex felt a smile pull at the corners of his mouth. I believe the ideas were already there, he said gently. If we set aside our emotions, Mrs. Lawson, I think we might recognize that Penelope and Stamford are an ideally suited pair. But Stamford is nothing compared to you, Totty burst out impatiently, wiping her eyes. And now, now you are no longer to be our son-in-law. Apparently not. Oh, my... Totty sighed dejectedly. With all my heart, I wish, if only I had a third daughter to offer you. Alex stared at her blankly. Then he began to make an odd choking noise. Afraid he had succumbed to an apoplectic fit, Totty watched in horror as he sank down to the steps, sitting with his head clasped in his hands. His whole frame shook and he breathed in ragged gasps. Gradually, she realized he was laughing. Laughing! Her jaw dropped, her mouth forming a lopsided oval. My lord! God! Alex nearly toppled over. A third! No! Two is quite enough! Sweet Jesus! Lily's worth ten if she's worth anything! Totty regarded him with mounting alarm clearly wondering if the turn of events had unhinged him. Lord Rayford, she said weakly, I don't think anyone would blame you for forgetting yourself. However, I believe I will take my tea in the parlour and allow you some privacy. She hurried away, her plump elbows churning like cogwheels. Thank you, Alex managed to say, struggling to control himself. A few deep breaths, and he was silent, though an open smile remained on his face. He wondered if he was all right. Oh, yes, there was a feeling of lightness inside him, a rampant surge of elation he couldn't describe. It left him a little unsteady, restless, like a schoolboy on holiday. The feeling demanded action. He was rid of Penelope. It was more than just a relief. It was a liberation. He hadn't realized what a burden the engagement had been, an oppressive weight bearing down on him more heavily each day. Now it was gone. He was free. And Penelope was happy. At this moment, probably in the arms of the man she loved, Lily, on the other hand, was completely unaware of what she'd started. Alex was filled with anticipation. He wasn't through with Lily. Oh, he hadn't even begun with her. Alex! Henry stood before him, looking at him closely. 
Perhaps they'll bring tea from the kitchen soon. Mrs. Lawson is in the parlour. Alex, why are you sitting on the steps? Why do you look so happy? And if you weren't here last night, where were you? As I recall, you have two appointments with potential tutors this afternoon. You could use a bath, Henry, as well as a change of clothes. His eyes narrowed in warning. And I'm not happy. I'm considering what to do with Miss Lawson. The older one? Naturally, the older one. What are you thinking of doing? Henry asked. You're not old enough to know. Don't be certain of that, Henry said with a wink and raced up the stairs before Alex could react. Alex swore softly and grinned. He shook his head. Lily Lawson, he murmured. One thing's certain. You'll be too busy with me to spend another night in Craven's bed. Tonight was going just as last night had, dreadfully. Lily lost with grace and managed to preserve an air of confidence so that the men around her wouldn't realise she was drowning right before their eyes. She was dressed in one of the most delectable gowns she owned, a garment of black embroidered net laid over a foundation of nude silk, giving the appearance that she was covered in little more than sheer black lace. Standing at the hazard table with a group of dandies, including Lord Tadworth, Lord Banstead, and Fokka Berenkov, a handsome Russian diplomat, Lily wore a calm, cheerful expression like a mask. Her face felt like a mask, stiff and lifeless enough to peel off like so much paste and paper. Her chances of regaining Nicole were slipping through her fingers. She was hollow inside. If someone stabbed her, she wouldn't even bleed. What is happening? she thought with panic. Her gambling had never been like this. She was aware of Derek's gaze on her as he moved about the room. His disapproval was unspoken, but she was aware of it nonetheless. Had Lily seen anyone else in her position making such disastrous mistakes, she would have advised him to try again some other night, but she didn't have time. There was only now and tomorrow. The thought of five thousand pounds nagged at her like so many sharp, tiny spurs. Fitz, the croupier, watched her actions without comment his eyes not quite meeting hers. Lily knew she was playing too deep, too fast, taking senseless risks. Repeatedly, she tried to catch herself, but it was too late. She was on the typical gambler's slide. Once started, impossible to stop. Recklessly, she flung the three dice on the felt-covered table with a brisk sweep of her hand. Come, let's have a triple. Over and over the cubes rolled, until the numbers were up. One, two, six. Nothing. Her money was almost gone. Well, she said with a shrug, facing Banstead's consoling smile, I believe I'll play on credit tonight. Suddenly, Derek was at her side, his cool voice in her ear. Come have a walk first. I'm playing she said softly. Not without money. He snared her gloved wrist in his hand. Lily excused herself from the hazard table, smiling at the others and promising to return soon. Derek guided her forcibly to Worthy's vacant desk, where they could talk with a measure of privacy. You interfering bastard, Lily said through her teeth. She smiled so that it appeared they were having a pleasant conversation. What do you mean, dragging me away from a game? And don't you dare refuse me credit. I've played here on credit hundreds of times and I've always won. You lost the lucky touch, Derek said flatly. It's gone. She felt as if he'd slapped her. That's not true. There's no such thing as luck. It's numbers, a knowledge of numbers and chance. Call it whatever you want. It's gone. It's not. I'll go back to the table and prove it to you. You'll only lose. Then let me lose, she said with desperate anger. What do you think you're doing? Trying to protect me? 
Is this a right you've recently bestowed on yourself? To hell with you. I have to win five thousand pounds, or I'll lose Nicole for good. And if you lose more tonight? Derek asked coldly. Lily knew there was no need for her to answer. He was well aware of her only choice. To sell her body to the highest bidder. You'll get your bloody money, or your pound of flesh. Whatever appeals to you most. Nothing matters to me but my daughter. Don't you understand? All at once, Derek's accent was pristinely perfect. She doesn't need a whore for a mother. Let fate decide, Lily said tautly. That's your philosophy, isn't it? Derek was stonily silent, his eyes like chips of jade. Then he produced a mocking bow and a smile, setting her free. Suddenly, Lily felt lost, adrift, as she had on that night two years ago, before Derek had allowed her into the club. He was as fascinating and changeable as the tide. But once more, she realized she couldn't lean on him. One small part of her had always hoped that he would be there to help her when she reached the end of her luck. Now that hope was gone for good. She couldn't blame Derek for being what he was. She was on her own, as she had always been. Turning her back on him, she walked away quickly, her skirts whipping around her ankles. As she reached the hazard table, she pasted a smile on her face. Gentlemen, please excuse the interruption. Now, where... She stopped with a gasp, as she saw the new addition to the gathering. Alex lounged at the table with the others. He was dressed in black pantaloons, an embroidered silk waistcoat, and a dull green coat with gold buttons that emphasized his tawny coloring. He gave her a slow, easy smile. Her senses sparked with awareness. He looked different than usual. Even in Alex's best, most impressive tempers, there had always been something a little wooden about him, some part of himself that was always kept in reserve. Now the reserve was gone. It seemed as if he were lit with an inner golden blaze. Lily had seen gamblers wearing that same look on a lucky tear, carelessly risking entire fortunes. Her spirits sank even lower than before. She had known she would eventually have to confront him. But why now? First losing her money, then Derek's desertion. Now this... It was rapidly shaping into one of the worst nights of her life. Wearily, she picked up the gauntlet. Lord Rayford, how unexpected. This isn't your preferred sort of haunt, is it? I prefer to be anywhere you are. A fool returneth to his folly, she quoted softly. You left before our last game was finished. At the moment, I'm concerned with more important things. Alex glanced at the table, where Banstead had just cast the dice. Such as regaining your luck? So, he'd heard she was having a bad night. Tadworth must have told him. Or perhaps Forca, the big-mouthed ox. Lily shrugged indifferently. I don't believe in luck. I do. And I suppose it's on your side tonight, she sneered. Please don't let me stop you from placing a bet, my lord. Fokka and Banstead moved to clear a place for him. Alex didn't take his eyes from Lily. I'll wager ten thousand pounds against a knight with you. He watched as Lily's eyes turned wide and her throat worked silently. The action at the table stopped. What did he say? Tadworth demanded eagerly. What? As the news spread around the crowd at the hazard table, the other occupants of the room became alerted to the goings-on. Rapidly, a multitude formed, all pressing inward, a hundred avid gazes centering on them. Very amusing, Lily managed to say hoarsely. Alex pulled a bank draft from the inner pocket of his coat and dropped it to the table. She stared at the slip of paper in astonishment, then at his face. He smiled slightly, as if he understood the panicked thoughts that whirled through her mind. 
Good God. It was serious. The situation took on a dreamlike haze. Lily felt like an observer rather than a participant. She had to refuse the bet. It was the ultimate gamble, with stakes unacceptably high. If she won, the money would save her daughter. But if she lost, for a moment she tried to imagine it. Turning cold with fright, she gave a tiny shake of her head. Alex's gaze dropped to her trembling lips, and the amused gleam in his eyes dimmed. When he spoke again, his tone was oddly gentle. What if I pledge another five? There were hoots and cheers all around them. It's up to fifteen now, Tadworth called. Men began to drift in from the dining and smoking rooms. Onlookers scattered back and forth to spread the news. Usually, Lily relished being the centre of attention. Her reputation for wildness had been well earned. She had laughed, danced and cavorted, played pranks that were repeated all around London. But this wasn't a joke or prank. This was life or death. She couldn't throw the wager back in his face. She was too desperate for that. She needed help, and there was no one to turn to. There was only a pair of piercing grey eyes that saw through her bravado, her shamming, her fragile defences. Don't do this to me, she wanted to plead. Mutely, she stared at him. Your choice, Miss Lawson, he said quietly. What choice? Her mind buzzed. What damned choice? She had to put her trust in fate. Perhaps this entire bizarre proposition was divine providence. She had to win. She would win, and use the money to buy more time for Nicole. N not with dice, she heard herself say. Our usual game, he asked. It was hard to gather enough breath for a reply. We'll go to one of the card rooms. Three hands? Alex's eyes flickered with satisfaction. He gave a short nod. The wager is accepted, someone cried. There had never been such an uproar at Craven's. The noise of the crowd was a roar in Lily's ears. The men gathered closer in a crushing mob. Lily found herself pinned uncomfortably against the table. Those closest to her tried to withstand the pressure from outside, but the men on the fringe of the gathering were all fighting to reach the table for a good view. Lily half turned in confusion, wincing as the curved edge of the table cut into her side. Stop pushing, I can't breathe! Alex moved swiftly. He reached out and pulled her against him, his arms forming a protective cage around her. Lily gave a muffled laugh, her heart thudding violently. Look what you've started. My God. He spoke softly underneath a din of exclamations. It's all right. She realized she was trembling, though whether it was from shock, fear, or excitement, she didn't know. Before she could ask what he meant, she heard Derek's commanding voice. Here now, Derek was calling loudly. He moved forward, pushing his way through the mass as he spoke. Here now, all fall back. Let Miss Lawson have a little air. Fall back so as the game can start. The crowd loosened a little, the crush easing, as Derek shoved his way to the middle. Alex let go of Lily. Automatically she turned to Derek, her eyes pleading. Derek wore the same implacable expression as usual. He didn't look at Alex, but focused on Lily's small, tense face. Worthy tells me we has a little wager. Three hands of Fantaillon, Lily said shakily. We, we need a card room. No, do it here. Derek's snarl of a smile appeared. More convenient, as all of us can't herd into a card room. Lily was stunned at the betrayal. Not one word of caution or concern. Derek was simply going to let it happen. He was even going to take advantage of the spectacle. If she were drowning, he would have offered her a drink. A flare of anger braced her, gave her strength. As always, 
she said coldly. You're not above a little showmanship. I'm not Derek Craven for nothing, Gypsy. His gaze searched the room for his factotum. Worthy, he called. Bring a new deck. We'll see what the devil's Bible has to say. For the first time in the history of the gambling palace, the action at the hazard table was interrupted. Waiters scurried to bring fresh drinks. Money and markers exchanged hands until the air was filled with a clutter of paper. Voices rose as bets were made and doubled. Lily heard some of the bets with offended horror. Bitterly, she realized that most of the men she had gambled with would like nothing better than to see her lose. It would put her in her place, they thought. It would serve her right for daring to invade the sanctity of the men's club. Disgusting barbarians, the lot of them. Shall I deal? Derek asked. No, Lily said sharply. Worthy is the only man I trust. Touching his forehead with a mocking salute, Derek cleared the way for Worthy. Soberly, the factotum polished his spectacles with a handkerchief and replaced them on his face. He broke the seal on the deck. The crowd settled with an expectant hush. Worthy shuffled expertly, the cards flying and snapping in his small hands. Satisfied that it was thoroughly mixed, he placed the deck on the table and looked at Lily. Cut, please. She reached out and cut it with a trembling hand. Worthy took the top half she'd indicated and placed it beneath the other cards. With a precise gesture, slow enough that everyone could witness, he removed the top card and set it aside. Lily felt comforted by his steadiness. She watched every move he made, certain he was dealing a fair game. Three hands of vingt-et-un, Worthy said. Ace, valued at one or eleven, at player's discretion. He dealt two cards to each of them, one face up, one face down. Lily's card was an eight, Alex's a ten. Worthy spoke quietly. Miss Lawson. Being the player to his immediate left, it was her lot to play first. Lily turned her face down card and bit her lip as she read it. A two. Looking at Worthy, she gestured for another. He placed it next to her original cards. A nine. There was an audible reaction from the gathering. Whistles and exclamations. More money changed hands in the crowd. Lily began to relax, surreptitiously pressing a gloved hand to her sweat-beaded forehead. Her total was nineteen. The odds were in her favour. She watched as Alex turned his card, a seven, bringing his total to seventeen. He signalled for another card. Lily gave a quiet exclamation as Worthy dealt him a jack, which put him well over twenty-one. She'd won the first hand. She grinned as she felt a few impulsive slaps of congratulations on her back and shoulders. Cheeky bastards, I haven't won yet. There were a few chuckles, the patrons welcoming the temporary respite from tension. Worthy moved the cards to a discard pile and dealt a new hand. The crowd settled immediately. Lily's total was eighteen this time. It would be folly to request another card. Stay, she muttered. She frowned as she glanced at Alex's face-up card, which was a king. He turned his card in the hole, and Lily's heart dropped. A nine. Now they'd each won a hand. She looked at Alex, who was watching her with no trace of smugness or worry, nothing but a quiet certainty that bothered her profoundly. How Dare he look so composed when her entire life was poised on the fragile turn of a card. Worthy buried the played-out hands and dealt once more. The room was unnaturally quiet, breaths held tightly. Lily looked at her card, a queen, and turned the second one, a three. She gestured for a third. Worthy dealt her a seven. Her total was twenty. Thank you. God, she grinned at Alex, silently daring him to beat it. She was going to win. 
with relief and joy, she thought of the fifteen thousand pounds. Perhaps that larger sum might even be enough to bribe Giuseppe to relinquish Nicole for good. At the very least, it would buy her time, and she would be able to rehire the detective she had been forced to dismiss for lack of money. She was flushed with triumph as she watched Alex. His first card was a ten. Gently, he flipped over the second. Ace of hearts. His grey eyes lifted to Lily's astonished face. Twenty-one. A natural. There was absolute silence. Derek was the first to speak. Oisted with her own petard, he observed mildly. Then the multitude raised a cry that sounded as if some primal jungle rite were taking place. End of play, game to Lord Rayford, Worthy said, but his pronouncement was lost in the uproar. The guests behaved like a tribe of primitive savages rather than civilised English gentlemen. Spilled liquor and wadded paper covered the carpet. Alex was subjected to crushing handshakes and vigorous blows to his back and arms, while Fokker tried to anoint him by pouring vodka on his head. He ducked to avoid the splash of liquor, then came up in search of Lily. With a muffled sound of denial, she had slipped through the gathering, making her way to one of the massive doorways. Lily! Alex tried to follow, but the tightly packed crowd made it impossible. He swore as she disappeared from sight. Lily fled with bone-shaking, stomach-heaving haste, too terrified to watch where she was going. Suddenly, she slammed into a hard object that knocked the breath from her. She made a sick sound and gasped for air, beginning to collapse to the floor. Derek, who had blocked her mad flight with his own body, seized her and held her upright. He stared at her with eyes like green ice. Let me go, she wheezed. Women has no pride. Trying to cut and run, are you? Chicken-hearted wench. Lily grasped imploringly at his unyielding arms. Derek, I can't do this. I can't. You will. Nothing to it. You'll honour your bet, Gypsy, if I have to drag you to bed myself. And if you leaves, I'll bring you back. Now, go to my apartments and wait for him. Why here? I, I'd rather go to my terrace. You does it here, so I know you hasn't welched. No. She shook her head dumbly, tears ready to fall. No. Suddenly, Derek changed, bewildering her with a tender smile. No. Too late for that, Gypsy. Tis a big lump, but you has to take it. His voice turned quiet and kind, as if he was speaking to a headstrong child. If you don't honour the bet, no place in London would let you play. Not Cravens, not even the lowest gaming hell in Thieves' Kitchen. Why didn't you stop me back there? Lily burst out, her teeth chattering. If you cared anything about me, you wouldn't have let it happen. You should have kept me from getting into this mess. He's going to hurt me, Derek, you don't understand. I understand everything. He won't hurt you. All he wants is a little knock with you, darling, that's all. He astonished her by bending to kiss her forehead. Go on. Go pour a drink in your guts and wait for the jack. He tried to shake her hands from his sleeves, but she clutched tighter. What do I do? She choked, staring at him with huge eyes. Derek's black brows knitted together. Abruptly, his gentleness disappeared, replaced by an insolent smile. Get into bed and lay flat as a flounder. Simple. Now go, and don't ask me which side to turn up. His derisive laughter was the only thing that would have dislodged her. Lily let go of his sleeves. I'll never forgive you. Derek responded by pointing down the hall toward the stairs that led to the private rooms. She gathered the tattered remains of her dignity and squared her shoulders, striding away without looking back. As soon as she was gone, 
Derek's smile vanished. He plunged into the hazard room. Catching Worthy's eye, he mouthed the question, Where is he? Worthy motioned to the edge of the mob, where Rayford was shoving a few unruly patrons aside in an effort to reach one of the exits. Ignoring the raucous congratulations being thrown at him, Alex fought his way through the crowd to the hall. He hesitated as he glanced in the direction of the coffee rooms and libraries, wondering where Lily had gone. Lord Rayford! Alex turned to see Worthy emerge from the riot in the gaming room. Derek Craven appeared at the same time. There was something coarse and hard in his expression that made him look more than ever like Flash Gentry, a thief who had flourished but could never escape his sordid past. Green eyes locked with grey in a challenging stare. There had been no contest between them, and yet there was a definite feeling of violent discord, masculine uneasiness. My lord, Derek said calmly, I just told Miss Lawson she brung it on herself. Worthy dealt straight, he did, and no one can say, Where is she? Alex interrupted. First, I have something to say. What? An odd look crossed Derek's face. He seemed to search for words, as if he wanted to say a great deal but was afraid of betraying himself. Ride her easy, he finally said, his voice laced with cool menace. Nice and easy. What makes you pay for it but good? He made a gesture to his factotum, who waited silently nearby. Worthy will show you to the upstairs room, my lord. Lily is... He paused, and his mouth twisted impatiently. She's waiting there. Convenient, Alex said curtly. Not only will you share your woman, you'll provide the bed as well. Derek gave him a humorless smile. I don't share nothing what's mine. Understand? Yes, I see you does. Alex stared at him in bewilderment. Then you and she aren't? Narrow at once, Derek said in guttural cockney, with a shake of his head. But before, you must have. I only take souls to bed. Derek smiled humorlessly at Alex's blank expression. Lily's rum goods. I wouldn't touch her with these ants. She's too fine for that. Frustration and amazement collided in Alex's chest. Was it possible that the rumours were false, and there had been no affair between them? God help him if he allowed himself to believe something so implausible. But what purpose would they have for lying? It made no sense. Damn it! Was he ever going to find out who or what Lily Lawson was? Craven snapped his fingers at the factotum. Worthy he muttered, and walked away quickly. Stunned, Alex watched Craven's hasty departure. What's going on between those two? Worthy regarded him impassively. Nothing, exactly as Mr. Craven told you. Mr. Craven has always felt it would be prudent to keep his friendship with Miss Lawson platonic. With that, he gestured for Alex to follow him along the twists and turns of the hall. Why? Alex demanded. What's wrong with her? Or is it him? He stopped and grabbed the factotum's lapels, spinning him around. Tell me, or I'll wring it out of you. Gently, Worthy disengaged the fine worsted cloth of his coat from Alex's fists. My personal opinion on the matter, he said quietly, is that he's afraid of falling in love with her. Alex's hands dropped. He felt as if he were hovering on the brink of some momentous disaster. Oh, hell. Worthy looked at him inquiringly. Shall we continue, my lord? Alex nodded without a word. Worthy brought him to an unpretentious door that looked as though it might lead to some cellar storerooms. Instead, it opened to reveal a narrow staircase that spiralled upward. Worthy ascended the remaining steps, and indicated another door. He looked up at Alex, with the same expression Derek had earlier. 
yearning to make a speech, but struggling to suppress it. Let me assure you, my lord, you will not be disturbed. If you require anything, ring for the staff. They have been chosen for their efficiency and discretion. He slipped past Alex and vanished like a shadow. Alex found himself staring at the closed door with a grimace. He remembered Lily's face in the gaming room as she realized she had lost. She'd been devastated. No doubt she expected the worst from him, especially after what she'd done to him. But he wasn't going to hurt her. Suddenly, he was impatient to make her understand that revenge had no part of this. Grasping the doorknob, he turned and pushed. Worthy found Derek in one of the small, seldom-used rooms in the gambling palace. It was decorated with chairs, a desk, and a chaise long, making it a convenient trysting spot or a place where business could be conducted with absolute privacy. Derek stood by a window, nearly hidden by a drape. Although he was aware of Worthy's approach, he remained silent, his fingers tangling restlessly in the thick folds of scarlet velvet. Mr. Craven? Worthy asked hesitantly. Derek spoke as if to himself. Jesus, she was white as chalk, knees knocking fit to make her guts rattle. Not what Rayford expects to find, I'll wager. He gave a harsh laugh. I don't envy the poor bastard. Don't you, sir? Worthy asked quietly. There was nothing but silence. Derek kept his face turned away. There was a peculiar sound to his breathing. After a few moments, he spoke hoarsely, making a careful effort to soften his cockney accent. I'm not good enough for her, but I know what she needs. Someone her own kind. Someone who hasn't lived his life so long in the gutter. I think... I think she could have cared for me. But I hasn't let it happen. I want better for her. He passed a hand over his eyes and gave a bitter, self-mocking laugh. <laughs> if only I was born a gentleman, he whispered harshly. If I was born decent, then I'd be with her now instead of bloody damn Rayford. He swallowed audibly, fighting for self-control. I want a drink. What would you like? Anything. Just be quick about it. He waited until Worthy had left, then leaned his face in the drapes, rubbing the velvet against his cheek. <laughs>